Chapter 16 There was no thrill of victory for Gabe in the winner's circle. A gold trophy, a blanket of roses the color of blood. Cameras whirled, capturing the derby winner, the champion Virginia Colt, with his red and white silk stained with dirt and sweat. The jockey leaned forward over Double's glistening neck to accept his own dozen blooms, his face grim rather than triumphant as he stroked the colt. "'Mr. Slater,' was all he could say when Gabe gripped his hand. "'Ah, Christ, Mr. Slater!' Gabe only nodded. "'He ran a good race, Joey. A derby record.' Joey's eyes, circled by the grime where his goggles had shielded them, registered no pleasure at the news. "'Reno? Pride?' "'I don't know yet. Take your moment, Joey. You and the colt earned it.' Gabe's arms went around the colt's neck, ignoring the sweaty dirt. We'll deal with the rest later. He turned to Jameson, trying to block the cameras aimed at him, the questions hurled. You were closer, Jamie. Could you tell what happened? His face nearly translucent with shock, his eyes glazed with it. Jameson stared down at the roses in his arms. He broke down, Gabe. That sweet colt just broke. He looked up then, a flare of desperation burning through the shock. Double would have taken him. He would have nipped him at the wire. His voice was a plea. I know it. I feel it. It doesn't matter now, does it? But Gabe laid a hand on his shoulder in support. The taste of victory might have been bitter, but he couldn't refuse it. The guards kept the press and the fans at bay. Kelsey could hear the tide of their voices from behind the privacy screen, see the shadows moving on it. There were cheers, there were questions, there were demands. But all that was another world behind the thin white wall between life and death. Here there was only her mother's quiet weeping. Moses! He rocked Naomi, stroking her hair, holding on to her and her grief. Oh, Moses, why? I shouldn't have bet. Boggs stood, tears streaming down his face, pride's saddle clutched to his heaving chest. I shouldn't have. Gently, Kelsey ran her hand over Pride's neck. So soft, she thought, so still. Dirt streaked his coat, a testament to the effort. He should be washed, she thought dimly. He should be washed and brushed and pampered with the apples he loved so much. She lingered over one last caress, then forced herself to rise. Kelsey picked up the dirt-streaked blinders and laid them gently over the saddle. Take his things back to the barn, Boggs. It ain't right, Miss Kelsey. No, it isn't, and her heart was aching with the horrible wrongness of it. But you take care of his things, like always. We need to get my mother away from here. Somebody's got to stay. Somebody's got to see to him. I'm going to stay. Eyes blurred with tears, he stared at her, then nodded. That's fitting. Like a page bearing away his warrior's sword and shield, he turned and left them. Holding on to her own control, Kelsey crouched. Moses, she needs you. Will you take her back to the hotel? There's a lot to handle here, Kelsey. I'll handle what I can. The rest will have to wait. She put a hand on Naomi's back and gently moved it up and down, as if to smooth out the trembles. Mom? Only Moses was aware it was the first time Kelsey had used the term. Go with Moses now. Ravaged by guilt and grief, Naomi rose limply when Moses lifted her to her feet. She looked back down at the colt. Virginia's pride, she thought. Her pride. He was only three, she murmured. Maybe I can't hang on to anything longer than that. Don't. Though she had her own demons to fight, Kelsey gripped Naomi's hand. There are a lot of people out there. You have to get through them. Yes, her eyes went blind. I have to get through them. Kelsey walked her past the screen and winced at the sudden press of bodies and sound. She knew she would remember this all of her life. The thrill of the race, the shock of the fall, the cheers and screams of the crowd that had fallen into sudden, terrible silence, the way the grooms had raced toward the fatal spot and all the confusion and movement of getting both horse and rider from the field. 
How many times would she close her eyes and see the way Pride's legs had buckled at that crazy angle, or hear her mother's soft, breathy weeping? Kelsey? Gabe had rushed from the winner's circle to the stables, holding on to one thin thread of hope. It snapped the moment he saw her face. God damn it! He pulled her against him, held on. They had to put him down. She allowed herself one moment, just one, with her face pressed against his chest. No, he was already gone. Boggs reached him first, but it was already over. I'm sorry, Christ, I'm sorry. Reno? She drew in a steadying breath. They've taken him to the hospital. The paramedics don't think it's serious, but we're waiting for word. She straightened, then brushed the tears from her cheeks. I have to deal with the rest of this now. Not alone. She shook her head. If she let herself lean, she'd crumble. I need to do it. For my mother, for the colt. I'll see you back at the hotel later. I'm not leaving you here. I have Boggs, the rest of the crew. The heat died from his eyes. He stepped back, increasing the distance, nodded briskly. I'll get out of your way. If it turns out you need anything, Jamie will be around. Thank you. It was a nightmare. When Kelsey staggered back to the hotel near midnight, her emotions were like a raw wound. She knew the officials had already spoken with Moses and her mother. They told her. They told her she hadn't just lost a prized colt. It hadn't simply been chance or fate, or Boggs's bad luck. It had been murder. Pride had been injected with a lethal dose of amphetamines, a drug that had overworked his heart, one that, as he'd galloped valiantly around turns, down the stretch, had fed off his own adrenaline and sped greedily through his nervous system until, at the sixteenth pole, that heart had stopped. Now, Three Willows and everyone involved would face questions, speculation, investigation. Had they drugged their horse, misjudging the dose, gambling somehow that the drug wouldn't be found in Pride's saliva? Or had someone else, a competitor, doctored the horse and the odds? Someone who wanted to win so badly he would assassinate the colt and risk the life of the man on his back? She hesitated in front of the door to her mother's suite. What else could be said there? Naomi had Moses to comfort her, to reassure her. She turned to her own room but couldn't face it. Under the fatigue was a ruthless energy that continued to whip at her mind. Riding it, she walked quickly down the hall and knocked on Gabe's door. He wasn't sleeping. He hadn't expected her, not after she'd sent him away, certainly not after he'd gotten news about pride. But she was there, her eyes shadowed, her face so delicately pale he thought he could pass his hand through it. He simply stepped back and let her in. You've heard? Yes, I heard. Sit down, Kelsey, before you collapse. I can't. I'm afraid if I sit still, I'll never get moving again. Someone killed him, Gabe. That's what it comes down to. Someone wanted pride out of the running so badly they murdered him. He crossed the parlor to the wet bar and busied himself opening a bottle of mineral water. My cold one. Yes, I'm sorry I haven't even congratulated you, but... Then she saw his eyes and stopped cold. Do you think I came here to accuse you? Even to ask if you had something to do with it? While his blood raged, his hands were steady, casually pouring sparkling water over ice. It's a logical step. The hell with that! And the hell with you if you think so little of me! I think so little of you! His laugh was quick and harsh. What I think of you and about you, Kelsey, is hardly the point. The facts are your horse is dead, and mine raced me to somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars in just over two minutes. That's a pretty good motive for murder, and you won't be alone in thinking it. So, she shoved away the glass he offered to her, spilling water onto the carpet. Facts and logic, then. You forget an ingredient, Slater. Character. So I did. He set her glass aside and sipped leisurely from his own. Well, mine's black enough. Let me tell you something about yourself, Gabriel Slater, high roller, tough guy. You're a marshmallow about those horses. You're as dazzled by and devoted to them as a twelve-year-old girl dreaming about black beauty. She tossed back her head, delighted to see those carefully controlled eyes widen in shock. Excuse me? You love them. 
You fucking loved them. Did you think it wouldn't get around that you tried to buy Cunningham's filly because you were worried she was being mishandled? The shield dropped down again, but she'd seen behind it and plowed on. You think your crew doesn't talk to ours about how you play with the foals like they were puppies or sit up at night when you've got a sick horse? You're a sucker, Slater. I've got an investment. You've got a love affair. And another thing, she continued, poking a finger into his chest. I don't appreciate you telling me what you think I should think when I know. You wanted to win that race as much as I did, and fixing a race isn't winning. For somebody who has spent his life playing the odds, you should know that. So if you're going to stand here feeling sorry for yourself when you should be feeling sorry for me, I'll just leave you to it. Hold on. He grabbed her arm before she could storm out. You got a fast trigger, darling. Setting his own glass aside, he rubbed his chest. And a hell of a name. You got me, okay? So can we sit down now? You can sit. I still need to walk this off. Not entirely sure if he was embarrassed or amused by her accuracy, he lowered himself to the arm of the sofa. I'm sorry, Kelsey. I know that doesn't cover much, but I'm so goddamn sorry. I'm trying not to think about how bad I feel right now. I'm worried about Naomi. She'll fight back. I guess we all will. She paced by the table, picked up one of the glasses, and soothed her scratchy throat. It was horrible when they told me about the drug. It was like losing him all over again. They're checking the sharps boxes, every needle. But even if they find something, what difference will it make? Pride's dead. If the racing commission finds a needle that killed him, it might lead to who used it. She shook her head. No, I don't think so. I can't believe anyone would be careless enough to toss it into a sharps box, or if they did, to leave fingerprints or any other evidence. Restless, she stuffed her hands in her pockets, then pulled them out again. When I find out who, and I will find out, I want them to suffer. She picked up her drink again, looked down into the glass, and watched the tiny bubbles rise. He raced his heart out, literally raced it out, She shuddered once, then pulled back the grief. Reno dislocated his shoulder, snapped a collarbone, but that's all, thank God. Joy let me know. You'll have him up again in a few weeks, Kelsey. Maybe by the preakness. Shift gears, she ordered herself. Think about tomorrow. You know our cold high water? He could make a decent showing. I had a girl, he murmured. She smiled. We'll have a lot of work to do. I watched them take pride away today, and it hurt. I've never lost anyone I cared about. I didn't realize the first time I did it would be a horse. And I did care. I know. So did you. She walked over and laid a hand on Gabe's cheek. I'm sorry if I was cold when you offered to stay with me. I'd have fallen apart if you had. But I knew I could get through it by myself. I figured you didn't want me around, reminding you I'd won. I'm glad you won. It's the only bright spot in the day. If I could have, I'd have watched you walk into the winner's circle. I'd love to have seen them hand you the trophy. On a quick laugh, she reached into her pocket. God, I forgot. See? She showed him two tickets, one on pride, one on double. I hedged my bets. He stared at the tickets, as touched by them as he would have been by a declaration of undying love. Same money on each horse. I guess they both mattered the same amount to me. He looked up. The color her earlier temper had brought to her cheeks had faded again, leaving her face as pale and delicate as fine glass. The hand in his had toughened with work, but was long and narrow and elegant. She still wore the trim blue silk and slim heels she donned for the race. He lifted a hand and ran it over the hair that was escaping from the intricate French braid. It was the color of wheat struck by afternoon sunlight. The touch and the sudden silence had her pulse jumping. She was tired, she reminded herself, drained. She'd spent hours facing reporters, avoiding them, answering questions, fighting off speculation in what promised to be only the first course of a media-feeding frenzy. So why did she feel so energized? It's late, I should go. She hadn't meant to jerk back, but she found herself in retreat when he rose. I should check on Naomi. She has Moses. Nonetheless, now he smiled slowly, his eyes warming on hers. Nonetheless, he repeated. It's been a long day. The longest. 
the kind that stirs up every emotion and wrings it out to dry. Do you know how arousing it is to watch everything you're feeling on your face? He moved closer but didn't touch her. Nerves, needs, doubts, urges. How could they not be on her face when they were storming through her like gale winds? I'm no good at this, Gabe. You might as well know that up front. No good at what? At... She bumped into a chair, cursed, skirted around it. At this seduction, surrender, satisfaction business, and the timing sucks, he agreed. The timing sucks. He could step back and let her go. He'd suffer, but he could do it. You're going to have to tell me you don't want me right now. You're going to have to say yes or no, Kelsey, right here. I'm trying to, if you just let me think. She jerked back again when he pressed his palms to the wall on either side of her head. You figure it's risky, and you haven't quite figured the odds. The old, familiar recklessness was moving through him now, churning like an engine. Win or lose, he'd let it race. The stakes are high, and it's always safer to fold. Is that what you want, to be safe? Hardly aware she was moving, she shook her head, slowly from side to side. Because her eyes never left his, she saw the quick flare of triumph in them. The hell with the odds. He pulled her against him. Let's gamble. She tossed aside logic and caution. She didn't want them now. She wanted exactly what he was giving her. A hungry mouth, urgent hands. Whatever the risks, she'd already lost herself in the game. Her breath caught in a gasp of shock when he shoved her back to the wall and dragged her jacket from her shoulders. She hadn't expected this hair-trigger urgency from him, from herself, but her own fingers were tearing at his shirt, rending cloth and buttons in a heedless race for that basic feel of skin. Then he was under her hands, the taut muscles, the narrow planes. On a surge of greed, she locked her mouth on his and fought for more. She didn't want soft words, slow hands. Something was erupting inside her, and she wanted it to happen fast, to happen hot. Take me, that thought, only that pounded in her brain, in her blood. She heard her own laugh, husky, breathless, and strange, when his mouth seared a line of fire down her throat, over the shoulder bared by her crumpled blouse. It was the sound of it that snapped whatever thin hold he had on the civilized. With what was nearly a snarl, he grasped her hands and pulled them above her head. She was trembling, but her eyes were almost black with passion and challenge. With her wrists trapped beneath his fingers, he tore her blouse down the center, sending tiny gold buttons flying. Her body quivered like a string rudely plucked, but her gaze never faltered. There was silk beneath the silk, a sheer little fancy that barely covered her breasts before skimming down to disappear beneath her skirt. He watched her face as he skimmed a hand up her leg and found the top of her stocking, the lace-edged hem of the silk. He watched her eyes unfocus as he cupped the fire he'd ignited as he plunged recklessly into it. She cried out, shocked, shattered, bucking frantically against his probing hand like a mustang with the first weight of man on her back. Sensations slapped at her, smothered her, staggered her with heat and light and a grinding, glorious need that clenched its sweaty fist in her stomach. Panicked, pleasured, she shook her head while her body exploded. Her release was like a geyser boiling from deep inside, thundering up closer and closer to the surface, unstoppable. When she was sure she was drained, when even the colors kaleidoscoping behind her eyes began to dim, he drove her up again. His hands, ruthless and rough, tugged at her skirt. His mouth worked eagerly at the silk dipping over her breasts, then beneath until she was caught hot inside it. The flavor of her flesh was exotic, spiced with sweat and soft as water. He could hear her quick, thirsty pants, the dazed whimpers that caught time after time in her throat while her heart plunged desperately under his hand, his mouth. There was the sheer animal pleasure of her nails scraping down his back, of her body straining, shuddering, pumping against his greedy hands. Those hands tangled with hers in a frantic race to yank away his slacks. The instant he was free, he drove himself into her hard, deep, his fingers digging bruises into her hips. Twin moans trembled on the air when he mounted her, dragging her legs up to open her fully. Then his mouth was on hers again, swallowing gasps as they rode each other to the hot, sweaty finish. 
Her head drooped onto his shoulder. Her body, so filled with frenzied energy, went limp as wet paper. If he hadn't been pressed against her with the wall solid at her back, she would have slid bonelessly to the floor. Who won? she managed. With what breath he had left, he laughed. A dead heat! Good Christ, you're amazing! She didn't have the energy to question that. As her mind began to clear, it occurred to her that she just made violent, frantic love standing up, and what was left of her clothes and his were scattered ruined at their feet. This has never happened to me before. Nothing like this has ever happened to me. Good. Realizing they could spend the night leaning against the wall like drunks, he scooped her up. No, I mean... She trailed off, noting hazily that she still wore one strappy high heel. Carelessly, she kicked it off. I mean, ever. When I was married, we just... I mean, never mind. Don't stop there. He carried her into the bedroom. I love comparisons, when they're in my favor. That's the only one I have. Other than Wade, there wasn't anyone other than Wade. He stopped in the process of lowering her to the bed. His eyes focused. There was no one before him? This was her problem in the bedroom, Kelsey thought grimly. She talked too much. So? So. Gabe straightened and kissed her again. Maybe it was a dated male fantasy to imagine yourself the only one. But he decided to eliminate Wade and enjoy it. He dropped her onto the bed from a high enough perch to make her bounce twice before settling. Your ex wasn't just a bastard, he was an idiot. Thanks, I guess. When he continued to look down at her, she started to tug on the strap for camisole, only to discover it was broken. I think you're going to have to lend me a robe or something so I can get back to my room. He was smiling when he climbed onto the bed and covered her. Really, Gabe, I can't walk down the hall wearing this. She felt the wrinkled ruin of silk bunch between them. What's left of this, she corrected. It looks incredible on you. He skimmed his hand up until her breast was snuggled in his palm. But this time I figure I'll get you all the way out of it. This time? Her heart stuttered as he stroked his thumb lazily over her nipple. I couldn't possibly. You couldn't possibly. His brow arched as he lowered his grinning mouth to hers. Want a bit? She'd have lost several times. By the time dawn began to seep through the windows, she was sprawled over him, her body still quivering from the last assault, her mind too numb to sleep. I have to go. I need to get to the track. You need to sleep. Then you need to eat. Then we'll go to the track. Can we get coffee? Her words were beginning to slur as fatigue sneaked through to overpower everything else. Sure, in a little while. He stroked her hair, her back, not to arouse now, but to lull. Turn it off for now, darling. What time is it? He glanced at the clock and lied without compunction. About four, he said, although it was past six. Okay, a couple hours. She felt herself drift down a widening tunnel, light as a feather. Just a quick nap. He shifted her gently, brushing the hair away from her face, spreading the tangled sheet over her. Her face was still pale, the shadows under her eyes like flaws on marble. For a few minutes he watched her sleep, and watching her sleep, he fell in love. Uneasy with the sensation, he backed away from it, and the bed. He reminded himself that great sex, no matter how much affection was involved, was a long way from love. He'd wanted her, now he had her. That didn't mean he had to know precisely what happened next. She needed a friend every bit as much as she needed a lover. Since he intended to be both, he'd better get started on being a friend. Gabe took a shower, and when he came back to dress, she hadn't moved. Without a thought to her sensibilities, he walked into the parlor and picked up her purse. Her wallet, a palm-sized pack of tissues, a leather appointment book, and, he discovered to his amusement, a hoof pick. Her key was tucked inside a little zippered pocket along with a lipstick a small vial of perfume, which he indulged himself by sniffing, and a twenty-dollar bill. Items, he supposed, a woman like Kelsey wanted to keep handy. He slipped her key into his own pocket and left her sleeping alone. His initial stop was Naomi's room. Moses opened the door at the first knock. 
He looked strained and tired, but he offered Gabe a hand and a genuine smile. I didn't get a chance to congratulate you. Your colt ran a beautiful race. He had top competition. It wasn't the way I wanted to win. No. Moses led him inside with a slap on the back. It's a hard one, Gabe, for all of us. Now that we know something about how it happened, well, it's harder yet. There's no more news, I take it. The investigation's rolling, and Three Willows will roll one of its own. In his seamed face, his eyes were hard as onyx. All I know is somebody meant that horse to die. Goddamned waste. Whatever I can do, whatever anyone at Longshot can do, you have only to say the word. I want the answers every bit as much as you do. Gabe glanced toward the bedroom door as it opened. Naomi stepped out. If she'd been a boxer, he might have said she was in fighting trim. None of the frailty that had haunted her the day before showed now. She wore a dark purple suit, as close to mourning as she had available, and a look of grim determination. As Gabe had said, she'd fought back. I'm glad you're here. She crossed to him, put her arms around him, and rested her cheek against his. This is hard on both of us. She drew back, keeping her hands on his shoulders. A lot of the talk's going to circle around you, too. I want a united front. So do I. I hate what happened. I hate it for me, for you, and I hate it for racing. But we're going to deal with it. I've just scheduled a press conference. I'd like you to be there. Where and when? She smiled, then touched his cheek. At noon, at the track. I think it's important that we do it there. We'll be taking Pride home immediately after the autopsy. She paused, took a long breath. We should both be prepared for a lot of press in the coming weeks, and with the preakness, even more speculation. Her eyes hardened. You damn well better win that one, Gabe. I intend to. Satisfied, she nodded. I'm going to give Kelsey another hour or so before I call her room. She took on a lot yesterday. I hate to ask her for more. She's got more. The nerves that trickled down his back struck him as ridiculous. He slipped his hands into his pockets, fingered Kelsey's room key. Kelsey stayed with me last night. She's sleeping now. I'm going to get some things for her out of her room, then make sure she eats. The silence dragged on. Five seconds, ten. Naomi broke it with a sigh. I'm glad you were with her. I'm glad it's you. You might not be when I tell you it's going to stay me. She arched a brow. Are you talking about marriage, Gabe? For the first time in hours, she laughed. Aha! The face pales. Such a man thing. She patted his arm as he continued to stare at her. You'd better get out of here, honey, before I start to ask you more embarrassing questions. If you could have Kelsey here by eleven, we could all go out to the track together. Oh, and get her the navy suit with the coral blouse. Naomi nudged him out of the door, closed it, then rested back against it. Oh, Moses, what a horrendous twenty-four hours this has been. And now, for just a minute, I feel so good. You think she knows he's in love with her? All Kelsey knew was that she was furious with him. Not only had he let her oversleep, but he'd taken off with her key. She was stuck without a decent stitch of clothing in his room. She stepped out of a frigid shower, which had done little to cool her off, and wrapped herself in the hotel robe hanging on the back of the door. With her hair bundled in a towel, she paced from bedroom to parlor and back again. She debated calling Naomi sweet, but shied away from the idea of explaining that she was essentially naked and marooned in Gabe's room. When she heard the parlor door open, she marched in, fire on her tongue. I'd like to know what the hell you think you're... Oh, she and the room service waiter stared at each other with equal parts of distress. I'm sorry, miss. The gentleman said I should come right in and set up breakfast quietly because you were sleeping. Oh, well, that's all right. I'm up. She folded her hands and her dignity. And where is the gentleman? I can't say, miss. I only had my instructions. Would you prefer I come back later? No. She wasn't letting that coffee out of the room. No, this is fine. I'm sorry I startled you. While he sat up, she debated whether to gather up the scattered clothes or to pretend not to notice them. Opting for the latter, she accepted the check, added a tip she hoped would make Gade bleed, and signed it with a flourish. Thank you, miss. Enjoy your breakfast. 
She was pouring her first cup of coffee when Gabe strolled in. So, you're awake. You pig. She gulped the coffee black and hot enough to blister her tongue. Where's my key? Right here. He drew it out of his pocket, then laid her suit over a chair. I think I got everything. You're an organized hotel guest. Cosmetics, toothbrush. By the way, you've got great underwear. I figured this little navy thing went with a suit. He held up a teddy and grinned. Want to put it on? She snatched it out of his hand. You've been pawing through my things. I collected your things. Your mother suggested the suit. My... Kelsey gritted her teeth and prayed for patience. You've been to see her? She's doing fine. More than ready to handle the backlash. She set up a press conference at the track for noon. How's the coffee? He poured some for himself. We're to meet her at eleven in a room and go out together. She suggested the suit, but not whatever baubles you wanted to go with it, so I picked what I liked. She told you what clothes to get for me? Kelsey drew in air, then expelled it slowly. Which means you told her I was here. He sat, then lifted the silver dome from a plate to reveal ham and eggs. I told you you were with me last night. Her gaze flicked up. Is that a problem? No, but... No. Giving up, she pressed a hand to her temple. My head's spinning. Sit down and eat. You'll feel better. When she did, he reached over and closed a hand firmly over hers. We're in this together. Got that? She stared down at their joined hands. He hadn't meant the press conference. Not just the press conference. And they both knew it. Another risk, Kelsey thought. But she lifted her eyes until they were level with his. Yeah, I got it. Chapter 17 You never said you were going to kill the horse? Cunningham mopped his sweaty face. It seemed he spent all his time sweating these days, in front of the cameras with a big sloppy grin on his face, at celebration parties where people thumped him on the back and bought him drinks, in bed, staring up at the dark ceiling, reliving that final stretch of the derby over and over, he wanted to win, but had gratefully settled for second place. Yet the cost had ballooned into more than he'd ever expected to pay. You never said, he repeated, while sweat soaked his shirt and pooled nastily at the base of his spine. Disqualify him, he said, so Sheba would have a chance to place. You wanted the details left up to me, Rich reminded him. He was drinking top-grade Kentucky bourbon now and enjoying the view of D.C. from a lofty hotel suite. He could afford it. He could afford a great many things now. And you got what you wanted. You're freely placed at the Derby. Nobody's going to call you a sucker now, are they? Nobody's going to snicker behind your back. You were just supposed to see the Colt was disqualified. I did, Rich grinned, big time. The Chadwicks lose. Suspicion points at them at my cocky young son. And you, Billy boy, come out smelling like a rose. He chose a candied almond from a bowl. Now let's be honest here, Billy. You don't mind giving Gabe a backhanded slap, do you? After all, he cost you the family farm and a good dose of your dignity five years ago. No, I don't mind taking him down a peg, but... Both of us know that filly of yours didn't have a chance in holy hell of winning that race, Rich continued. Likely with three willows and long shot in the running, she maybe takes third if she's beat all the way to the wire. More likely fourth or fifth. That wasn't good enough, was it? Not with the hole he dug himself, Cunningham thought. No, but... No. Rich crunched down on another almond, his face as earnest as any used car salesman's. You needed an edge, and I supplied it. Now, truth is, I didn't expect her to do better than show, but that girl ran with her heart. She'll breed champs, he said with a wink. That's the bottom line, right? You'll syndicate her now and make yourself a pot of money as long as she'll lift her tail for a handsome stud? It was true, all true, but Cunningham's glands were still in overdrive. If it comes out rich, I'll be ruined. How's it going to come out? Am I going to tell somebody? He grinned again. You haven't been bragging to that pretty little piece in bed, have you? Some men can't keep their mouths shut once they've dipped their wick. 
No. Cunningham swiped a hand over his mouth. I haven't told her anything. Not that he thought she'd notice. Marlow was more interested in spending his money than how he came by it. But people are asking questions, and the press is hounding me. Of course they are, Rich said heartily. All you have to do is shake your head and look sad and reap some free publicity. You can always add a little flourish about how you know Naomi Chadwick and Gabriel Slater and can't imagine either of them would stoop so low. You make sure you link Gabe's name in there. I'd appreciate that. Cunningham licked his lips, inched forward. How'd you do it, Rich? Now, now, Billy boy, that's my little secret. And the less you know, the better, right? You're just a lucky guy who picked up a horse at a claiming race and carried her through to the derby. A preakness is in two weeks. Rich grinned, brows wiggling. That's a greedy friend and dangerous. You know how risky it is to race that horse again. She has another in her. He forgot his guilt and his fears. He forgot the men who had died and the sight of the colt falling at the sixteenth pole. I only need her to show. No can do. Chuckling, Rich wagged a finger in the air. Even if you put her in and she didn't break down, that leg of the triple crown has to run clean. Otherwise, they might start looking at you, Billy boy. Who knows? If they look at you, they might start looking for me. That happens, and well... He rattled the ice in his glass. We wouldn't be friends any more. A lot of money's at stake. You want more money? Bet on the long shot, Colt. I know my boy. He'll put everything he's got into winning. Vindicate himself. Rich's grin turned sour. He poured more bourbon into the melting ice. Always had a tight ass about winning clean. Taught him every trick I know, every fucking one, but he figures he's better than me, see? Too good to salt the game. His eyes narrowed, went hard as he drank. We'll see who comes out on top this time. We'll see. There wasn't any use arguing, not when Rich started pouring with a free hand. What am I supposed to do? You scratch her from Pimlico, Billy. Say she's pulled up lame in a workout and you don't want to risk her. Look disappointed and righteous then put her out to pasture till it's time to choose her a lover. You're right. It hurt, but Cunningham put aside his greed. Better not take the chance. I'm going to syndicate her, get the bitch pregnant next spring, he smiled a little. I might even make a deal with your boy, Rich, to breed her with his derby colt in a few years. Ah, you're talking. He leaned forward and slapped a hand on Cunningham's knee. I've worked out a little bonus, Billy. Bonus? Instantly wary, Cunningham drew back. We had a deal, Rich. I kept my part. No argument there, not a one. But look here, Billy. You raked in a bundle at that race between the purse and the betting window. I've got to figure your take at three, maybe four hundred grand. His smile widened as Cunningham began to sweat again. And with a syndication deal, the foal she's going to drop in, oh, say the next ten years, you'll be sitting real pretty. Couldn't have done it without me, could you? I paid you. You did indeed. But let's tally up the cost here. I had to pay Lipsky. That was your idea. I had nothing to do with that. I'm like a subcontractor, Billy, Rich explained patiently. What I do all leads back to you. You don't want to forget that. Now Lipsky took out that old groom, and I took out Lipsky. Now, we won't get into details about the others on my payroll, but they're necessary expenses, and I have to pass them on. We got ourselves two dead men and a dead horse, and what's standing between them and you is me. He beamed, ticking off murder on his fingers. So, keeping me happy's got to be pretty important to you. It ought to be worth another hundred thousand. A hundred... That's bullshit, Rich. Just plain bullshit. I've got all the expenses. Do you know what it costs to keep a thoroughbred? Even just one fucking horse, plus the entry fees? You don't want to nickel and dime me, Billy boy. You really don't. Rich's smile was as friendly as a death's head. He kept his hand on Cunningham's knee, squeezing, as Rich intended to squeeze his wallet for some time to come. A hundred thousand's a bargain. Take my word. 
I'll give you another week to figure out how to cook your books. You bring it on by here the day before the Preakness, in cash. He sat back, delighted with himself. I've got a hankering to lay down a bed on my boy's cold. Family ties, you know. He was laughing as he dumped more bourbon into his glass. Her own family ties had given Kelsey a splitting headache. She'd expected the trip to Potomac to be difficult, but it had been much more than that. Her father had been furious, as angry as Kelsey had ever seen him. It had hardly mattered that his temper hadn't been directed at her. As Candace had coolly pointed out, she was the cause of the problem. Millicent had made good on her threat. She hadn't been able to break the terms of Kelsey's grandfather's will, but she had altered her own. In Victorian and melodramatic terms, Millicent no longer had a granddaughter. With her car still idling in the drive at Three Willows, Kelsey rested her aching head on the steering wheel. It had been a horrible, horrible scene. Millicent's cold fury as she made the announcement, her father's shock, then his outrage, and Candace, already prepared, aiming little darts of blame toward Kelsey's heart. On a quiet moan of pain, Kelsey straightened and turned off the ignition. She hadn't realized it would hurt so much. She and Millicent had been at odds for so long, it would have made more sense to be relieved. But she wasn't relieved. She was wounded. Wearily, she got out of the car, thinking aspirin at least would take care of her throbbing head. She heard the music, the hard driving beat of vintage stones. Mick and the boys were grinding out their sympathy for the devil. Kelsey followed them around the side of the house. There was a splattered drop cloth over the stones of the patio. A boombox belched out rock and roll from the glass topped table. At an easel, her hair pulled back in a stubby ponytail, an oversized man's shirt hanging to her knees, Naomi fenced with a crimson tipped brush. She might have been wielding a sword, Kelsey thought, dueling with the canvas that had already exploded with color and shape. Her face, turned in profile, was set in stone her eyes spewing smoke. It seemed a very intimate battle, and Kelsey started to back away, but Naomi's head whipped around and those angry eyes pinned her. I'm sorry, Kelsey began, drowned out by the music. Naomi reached over and turned it down to a pulsing throb. I didn't mean to disturb you. It's all right. The passion was fading quickly from her eyes, as if when not facing the canvas she was calm again. I'm just having a private tantrum. She set down her brush, then picked up a cloth to wipe her hands. I haven't painted in a while. It's wonderful. Kelsey stepped closer, studying the streaks of violent color, the still glistening brush strokes. So primal. Exactly. You're upset. Damn it. Kelsey shoved her hands into her pockets. I'm beginning to think I have a sign on my forehead that broadcasts my feelings. You have an expressive face. So had she, Naomi remembered, once. I take it the family meeting didn't go well? It went down the toilet. I've caused a rift between my father and my grandmother. A big one. And, I think, a smaller but no less difficult one between him and Candace. By staying here. By being who I am. She picked up the neglected glass of iced tea Naomi had brought out with her and drank. Millicent has not only cut me out of her will, but out of her mind and heart. As far as she's concerned, I no longer exist. Oh, Kelsey. Naomi laid a hand on her arm. I'm sure she doesn't mean it. Glass clinked against glass as she set the tea down. Are you? Sympathy and concern hardened into fury. Of course she means it. It's just like her. I'm sorry I've caused you this kind of trouble. I caused, Kelsey exploded. This is mine. It's time everyone started to understand that I can think and act and feel for myself. If I didn't want to be here, I wouldn't be. I'm not here to spite them or to placate you. I'm here for me. Naomi took a deep breath. You're right. Absolutely right. If I wanted to be somewhere else, I'd be somewhere else. But I won't be threatened or bribed or guilted into giving up something that's important to me. My family is important to me. Three Willows is important to me. And so are you. Well, Naomi reached for the glass herself, and her hand was unsteady. Thank you. Kelsey resisted, barely, the urge to kick a pot of geraniums. 
It's hardly a matter for gratitude. You're my mother. I care about you. I admire what you've been able to do with your life. Maybe I'm not satisfied about all the years between, but I like who you are. I'm certainly not going to go scrambling back and pretend you don't exist because Millicent would prefer it. To keep herself from buckling into a chair, Naomi braced a hand on the table. You can't imagine, can't possibly imagine, what it's like to hear from a grown daughter that she likes who you are. I love you so much, Kelsey. Her anger skidded to a halt. I know. I didn't know who you would be when I saw you again. All the love I had was for that little girl I'd lost. Then you came here and you gave me a chance. I'm so dazzled by the woman you are, so proud of you. If you left tomorrow and never came back, you'd still have given me more than I ever thought I'd have again. I'm not going anywhere. Leading with her heart, Kelsey stepped forward and opened her arms. I'm exactly where I want to be. With her eyes tightly closed, Naomi absorbed the feel, the scent of her daughter. I want to say I'll make it up to you, that I'll find a way to soften her heart. Don't. It's not for you to worry about. Steadier, she eased back. You can be mad with me. I'm so goddamn mad. Riding on the mood swings, she whirled away to pace. And hurt. I can't believe how much it hurt. For her to think I cared about her money, for her to use it and my feelings against me, to try to control me with them. Control is essential to Millicent. It always has been. She couldn't break my grandfather's trust. I bet that burned her, not having the power to change that. And Dad was so upset. He shouted at her. He's never raised his voice to her. Yes, he has. There was a grim satisfaction in Naomi's smile. It's probably been some time. I'm glad he stood up for you. I wish I could say I was. It was horrible to see them fight that way and to see the distance all this has put between him and Candace, to know, right or wrong, that I'm responsible. Grandmother's so unbending, so unwilling to see someone else's side. And hadn't the same been said about her, Kelsey remembered, and shuddered. Then she has two choices, Naomi put in. She'll bend, or she'll die lonely. I have to believe they'll make up, Kelsey murmured. I have to. I'm not sure Grandmother and I will ever come to terms again. Not after today. She actually used pride against me. She said that you'd probably gotten one of your hoodlum friends, her exact words, by the way, to drug the horse. After all, if you'd killed a man... Appalled, Kelsey trailed off. Why should I stop at the idea of killing a horse? Naomi finished. Why, indeed. I'm sorry... Disgusted with herself, she rubbed her still aching temples. I'm wound up. It doesn't matter. I'm sure she's not the only one who's had the thought. One of the reasons I'm out here, venting, she said, gesturing toward the canvas, is that a rumor circulating that I might have arranged for Pride's death to collect the insurance. Kelsey dropped her hands and balled them into fists. That's hideous. No one who knows you would believe that. It's not an unheard of practice, unfortunately. There's a lot of ugliness in this world, too, Kelsey. The rumor will pass. She picked up her brush again, contemplating. Simple arithmetic will scotch it eventually. Even though he was heavily insured, Pride was worth a good deal more alive, at the track and at stud, than he is dead. But it stirs memories. Mine, others. Calmer, she began to paint again. This was my therapy in prison. More, it was a way to survive, a way to channel emotions. You don't want to bring attention to yourself inside, with anger, grief, with fear, especially not with fear. Can you tell me about it? Kelsey asked quietly. What it was like? For a moment, Naomi continued to paint in silence. She'd wondered when Kelsey would ask, not if. The need to know the answers, to find the solutions, was as much a part of her daughter's makeup as the color of her eyes. So she would paint another picture, with words rather than with her brush. They strip you. She said it quietly, reminding herself it was done, over. Not just your clothes, though that's one of the first humiliations. 
They take everything away from you. Your clothes, your freedom, your rights, your hope. You have only what they give you, the tedious routine of it. You're told when to get up in the morning, when to eat, when to go to bed at night. It doesn't matter what you feel or what you want. Kelsey stepped up beside her. The birds were singing now, celebrating spring. The air was ripe with flowers and paint. You eat what they give you, Naomi continued, and after a while you get used to it. You forget what it's like to go out to a restaurant or just to wake up at night and go down to the kitchen. She let out a little sigh without realizing it. It's easier if you forget. If you keep too much of the outside with you, it'll drive you crazy. Because you know it's not yours anymore. You can see the mountains, flowers, trees, the seasons changing. But they're all outside and really have nothing to do with you. You can't be who you were anymore. And even if you ache for companionship, you don't get too close to anyone. Because people come and go. She changed brushes and began to paint with the energy that was boiling up inside. Some of the women kept calendars, but I didn't. I wasn't going to think about the days passing into weeks, the weeks into months, the months into years. How could I? Some had pictures of their family, their children, and liked to talk about them, or what they would do when they got out. I didn't do that. I couldn't do that. It was simpler for me to focus on the routine. But you were lonely, Kelsey murmured. You must have been so lonely. That's the deepest punishment, the loneliness, and the conflicting lack of privacy. It's not the bars. You think it's going to be the bars closing you in, but it's not. She took a deep breath and made herself continue. If you had free time, you read, or you watched TV. Fashion magazines were big, but I stopped looking at them after the first couple of years. It was too hard to watch the way things were changing, even something as frivolous as hemlines. Did you have visitors? My father, Moses. Nothing I could say would stop either one of them from coming. God knows I wanted to see them, no matter how I suffered after they were gone. I watched my father grow old. I suppose that was the hardest part, watching the years pass on his face. That was my calendar, my father's face. The last year was the hardest. I was coming up for parole, and it looked as though I'd get it. Knowing freedom was almost within reach, and yet being afraid to be cut off from the world you'd lived in for so long, that was hard. How would you know what to do now and when to do it? The days dragged, giving you too much time to think, to hope again, to sweat out those last months. Then they let you put on civilian clothes. My father brought me a new suit gray pinstripes, very lawyerish. My hands shook so badly I couldn't button the blouse. The sun hurt my eyes when I walked out. It wasn't as if they'd kept us in a hole. It was a decent prison with decent people in charge, at least for the most part. But the sun was different that day, stronger, brighter. I couldn't see anything through it, and then I saw too much. She changed brushes again, her eyes focused on her work. Do you really want to hear the rest of this? Go on, Kelsey murmured. Finish. I saw my father. How frail and old he was. The new Cadillac, blindingly white, he drove me home in. I know he spoke to me, and I to him, but I can't remember any of it. Only that everything seemed to move too fast, and the roads were so crowded. And I was afraid, afraid they would take me back, afraid they wouldn't. We stopped and ate at a restaurant. Linen napkins, wine, flowers on the table. He had to order for me, as if I were a child. I couldn't remember what I liked. And I started to cry, and he cried. So we sat and wept on the white linen cloth because I couldn't remember what it was like to sit in a restaurant and order a meal. I slept most of the rest of the drive, exhausted from freedom. Then I woke up and he was turning through the gates. I could see that the trees had grown. The dogwoods that had been saplings, the ones I'd planted myself, were adult trees that had bloomed year after year without me. New paint in the living room, a vase that hadn't been there before. Every little change terrified me. I didn't go down to the barn, not for days, until Moses came to the house and bullied me into it. 
There was a foal I'd helped birth. Now he was sixteen hands high, and at stud. New equipment, new men. Knew everything. I stayed in the house for a week after that. Slept with the light on and my door open. At first I couldn't stand for a door to be closed. But after a while it got better. I had to learn to drive again. I was terrified, but I did it. The first time I went out alone, I drove to your school. I watched the baby I'd left behind as a young girl, learning to flirt with boys. I made myself accept that you'd learn to live without me, and I tried to start over. Naomi set her brush down and stepped back. It's done. Kelsey wasn't certain of that. The painting might have been finished, but not the emotion behind it. Nor, as far as she was concerned, was the story done. It wasn't a matter of clearing Naomi's name. A man had been killed, and a woman had paid the price. But she wanted to see that the pieces fit. Still, it was a shock to find Charles Rooney's name in the phone book. The private investigator whose evidence had weighed most heavily in Naomi's trial still had an office in Virginia. Alexandria now. The discreet ad in the yellow pages declared Rooney Investigative Services handled criminal, domestic, and custody, licensed and bonded and confidential. The first consultation was free. Perhaps, she thought, she'd take advantage of that. Miss Kelsey? When Gertie hurried into the kitchen, Kelsey quickly slapped the phone book closed. You startled me. Sorry, that policeman's here again. Her homely face expressed simple and loyal annoyance. Says he's got some more questions. I'll see him. Naomi's down at the barn. No need to bother her. You want me to make coffee? Kelsey hesitated only a moment. No, Gertie, let's get him in and out. Sooner the better, Gertie muttered under her breath. Rossi stood when Kelsey entered the sitting room. He had to admire the way she wore jeans, though he'd been equally impressed with the clip from the press conference and the way she and her mother had looked, trim and blonde in their silk suits. Miss Biden, I appreciate the time. I don't have much of it, Lieutenant, but I'm willing to stretch it if you have news for us. I wish I did. He had nothing but frustration. No unaccounted for prints in Lipsky's motel room. No witnesses, no trail. I'd like to offer my sympathies for your loss at the Derby. I'm not much of a horse lover, but even cops watch that race. It was a terrible thing. Yes, it was. My mother's devastated. She looked sturdy enough at the press conference. With a frigid nod, Kelsey sat and gestured for Rossi to join her. Did you expect her to fall apart publicly? Actually, no. But I did find it interesting that Slater sat in on it. We're neighbors, Lieutenant, and friends. Gabe is also an owner, and the fact that his colt won under such tragic circumstances made it difficult for all of us. We asked him there to show our support, and he accepted to show his. You'll excuse me, Miss Biden, but from what I've seen in the press, you and Mr. Slater seem to be more than friends. The Biden jeans swam to the surface, adding a cool, arrogant tilt to her head. Is that an official statement, Lieutenant? Just an observation. It's natural enough. You're both attractive people with mutual interests. She didn't rise to the bait, but he hadn't expected her to. I was hoping you could help me out with the details of what happened to Churchill Downs. I thought you weren't interested in horses, Lieutenant. Murder interests me, even in horses. He waited a beat. Particularly if it ties in with a homicide case I want to close. You think what happened to Pride is tied in with old Mick's murder? How? Lipsky's dead. Exactly. From what I'm told, it's not easy to get to a derby entrant. No, it's not. The security is tight. We have guards. Her brow furrowed. It was Gabe's colt Lipsky was after, not ours. And I was under the impression Lipsky's death was considered a suicide. You think it was murder? There's debate on that, was all he would say. I'd like to snip any loose ends. If you could tell me who had official access to the colt before the race? I would, of course. My mother, Moses, Boggs, Reno. She blew out a breath. The official who checks identification, the handlers at the gate, the outrider, the one who ponied him onto the track. Uh, that was Carl Tripper. The other members of the crew? She ticked off names. The guards? Well, yes, I suppose. 
and unofficially? She shook her head, but her mind was working. You'd have to be very slick to get through security on Derby Day, Lieutenant. It may look like a free-for-all on television, but the horses are closely watched. The drug. It's hard to tell when it was given to the horse. That's part of the problem, she took a steadying breath. It was still hard to talk about. Pride had traces of digitalis and epinephrine in his bloodstream. It killed him, overworked his heart. He was edgy, but he usually is before a race. Moses keeps him that way. Now why would that be? Some horses run better when they're wired up. Others need to be soothed and calmed. Pride ran best wired. How do you go about that? A lot of it comes from the horse. They know when they're going to race. They're not fed as much. They're prepped differently. There's atmosphere. And you might hold them back at the workout when they're itchy to have their head. No chemicals? Her face went very still. No drugs, Lieutenant. We don't doctor our horses with anything that isn't approved and necessary for their health. What someone gave pride pumped up his heart rate, his adrenaline. The race, the strain of driving him hard for more than a mile, killed him which was precisely what the colt's autopsy report had told him. Shouldn't the jockey have known something was wrong? Her jaw tightened. She wouldn't permit anyone to blame Reno, not after what he'd been through. She'd seen for herself the way he'd suffered, the way he'd continued to suffer. Pride ran because that's what he was born to do, what he'd been trained to do since he took his first steps. He didn't falter. He didn't fight Reno. You have only to look at the tape to see he was putting everything he had into winning that race and killed himself trying. Reno was lucky he wasn't killed as well. Rossi studied his notebook. He'd watched the tape of the race over and over, slowing the speed, freeze-framing. Finally, he nodded. I've got to agree with that. If he'd had gone onto the track instead of the infield, I don't know how he'd have escaped being trampled. And the way he went down, I figured a broken neck. So did I. As it is, he won't be up for another month, at the earliest. That should do it for now. I'm going to want to talk to some of the names you gave me, check out their perspective. I appreciate your interest, Lieutenant. I'd rather you didn't question my mother unless it's vital. It was her horse, Miss Biden. I think you understand what I'm saying. She rose, ready to defend. You're perfectly aware of the background here, and how difficult it is for my mother to undergo police interrogation. A few questions amounts to the same thing for her. And whether you can understand it or not, she's grieving. You can ask me anything you like, or you can go to the racing commission. I can't make any promises, but there's no need to disturb her at this time. Thank you. She started to walk him to the door. Lieutenant, you weren't involved in my mother's case, were you? No, I was at the police academy back then. Green as iceberg lettuce. I was curious who was in charge. That would have been Captain Tipton, Jim Tipton, retired now. I served under him when he was a lieutenant, and after he made captain. A good cop. I'm sure he was. Thank you, lieutenant. Thank you, Miss Biden. Rossi walked back to the car, nibbling on the seed of an idea. Kelsey Biden had something on her mind, he mused. It wouldn't hurt to do a little digging back himself. Chapter 18 Why do I get the feeling the only place I'm going to get you in bed is in a hotel? Hmm. Kelsey twirled her bouquet of black-eyed Susans, part of the centerpiece Gabe had stolen for her from their last Preakness party. I suppose things have been a little hectic, and you have been busy giving interviews. I'm going to give more of them tomorrow. That's what I like, a confident man. They strolled across the lobby to the elevators. And Double is being housed in Stall 40, the base of Secretariat, affirmed Seattle Slough. Are you superstitious, Slater? Damn right I am. He stepped into the elevator and tugged her in behind him. His mouth was hot on hers before the doors whispered shut. The button, she managed, crushing flowers as she pawed her way under his shirt. You forgot to push the button. He groped, swore, and managed to press the right floor. I didn't think I was ever going to get you alone. Two weeks is two weeks too long, Kelsey. I know. She let out a breathless laugh when his teeth scraped her neck. Naomi needed me, and there's hardly been time to think with the investigation and trying to get the colt ready for tomorrow. I wanted to be with you. The doors opened, and she jerked back. 
Her cocktail dress was a great deal more than off the shoulder. She tugged it back into place, amazed that she'd lose control in an elevator, and grateful that the hall beyond was empty. You don't know whether to be pleased with yourself or embarrassed. She fluffed her hair back into place. Stop reading my mind, she ordered, and caught the doors before they shut again. Your room or mine. It was as simple as that, she realized. They'd both been waiting all evening for the chance to pick up where they'd left off in Kentucky. Mine, she decided. This time you can wake up in the morning without any decent clothes to wear. Is that a promise to rip them off me? She swiped her key card through the slot and tried to come up with a suitable answer. Even as the light beeped from red to green, the phone began to ring. Hold that thought, she told him, and dashed to answer. Hello? She tossed the crushed flowers onto a coffee table, tugged off one earring, then passed the phone to the unadorned lobe. Her fingers went still as they closed over the second sapphire cluster. Wade? How did you know I was here? Very carefully, very deliberately, she removed her other earring and set it down on the table. I see. I didn't realize you kept in touch with Candace. Of course. That's cozy, isn't it? Yes, I'm being sarcastic. Her eyes flashed to Gabe, then dropped. Without a word, he crossed to the minibar, opened a bottle of Chardonnay, and poured her a glass. Wade, you didn't call at... She checked her watch. 11.15 to make small talk, and I really have no intention of discussing my mother with you. So if that's all... Miserably, she accepted the glass from Gabe. Of course that wasn't all. It was never all with Wade. Do you want my blessing? No, I'm not going to be gracious, and this is as civilized as it gets. She thought about swallowing her venom, but instead let it spew as his oh-so-reasonable voice nattered in her ear. Does the lucky bride know that you have a habit of boffing your associates on business trips? Yes, I'm real good at holding a grudge. You bastard, you oily, self-centered jerk! How dare you call me up on your wedding eve to soothe your conscience? How's this? No, I don't forgive you. No, I refuse to share in the blame. That's right, Wade. I'm as rigid and unforgiving as ever. But I have stopped wishing you die a long, painful, and ugly death. Now I just want you to get hit by a truck while you're crossing the street. If you want absolution, find a priest. She hung up, slamming the receiver hard enough to strike a whining ring. "'Well,' Gabe murmured into the silence, "'that's telling him.' He toasted her with a can of Coke. "'Does he make a habit of calling you?' "'Every couple of months.' She kicked the table, then ripped her shoes off her aching toes and heaved them across the room. "'To chat, if you can believe that. "'We can't be married, but why can't we be friends? "'I'll tell you why, because nobody cheats on me. "'Nobody.' "'I'll keep that in mind.' Gabe watched her, wondering if he should let her cool down or if he should just scoop her off to bed and help her expel some of that energy. He's getting married tomorrow. He thought I should hear it straight from him, so he called Candace. They still belong to the same club, you know. She gulped down wine, found she didn't have the taste for it. She told him where I was. She told him, as if he had some unbreakable right to know, as if I give a damn about him getting married. Do you? Gabe reached out to keep the glass she'd slammed down from tipping over onto the rug. No. She needed something to throw, anything, and settled on the complimentary travel guide. I care that he can call me out of the blue and make me feel, even for an instant, that it was my fault he was with another woman. I care that, when he does, I think back and remember how perfect it was supposed to be. A nice young couple from good families, having their splashy society wedding, the romantic two-week honeymoon in the Caribbean, the charming little row house in Georgetown, the right friends, the right clubs, the right parties. And I hate when I look back and realize I never loved him. Her voice broke, and she fisted her hands at her temples. I didn't even love him. How could I have married him, Gabe? How could I have, when I didn't even feel a fraction for him what I feel for you? His eyes flashed, then the light narrowed down to a pinpoint of heat. Be careful, Kelsey. I don't cheat, but that doesn't mean I play fair. I don't give a damn that you're upset. If you say too much, I'll hold you to it. I don't know what I'm saying. 
unnerved, trembling, she dropped her hands. I only know that when I listened to him just now, I realized I'd married him because everyone said he was right for me, and because it seemed like the next natural step. I wanted it to work. I tried to make it work. But how could it? He never once made me feel the way you do. Her voice dropped to a whisper. No one's ever made me feel the way you do. He set down his drink, suddenly aware that his fingers had pressed dents in the can. Everyone will tell you I'm wrong for you. I don't care. I hate country clubs. I'm not going to take you to spring balls. I'm not asking you to. I could get the urge tomorrow and put everything I've got on one spin of the wheel. Her hands relaxed at her sides. She could almost see him doing it. I think the wheel's already spinning, Slater. Maybe you're not enough of a gambler to put it on the line. You don't know what you feel for me. Clawed by his own emotions, he grabbed her, nearly lifting her off the floor. You're working on it. Christ, I can almost see the gears turning in that head of yours. But you don't know. I want you. Her heart was lodged in her throat, pounding. I've never wanted anyone the way I want you. I'll make you give me more. And once I've got hold, Kelsey, you won't shake me loose. If you were smart, you'd take a good look at what you're getting into with me and you'd run. She started to shake her head, but he swept her up. Too late. For you, too, she murmured and shifted just enough so that her lips could reach his throat. I'm not running away, Gabe. I'm running after. And she knew what to expect now, what to anticipate, what to yearn for. Heat and speed and frenzy. She wanted the ache, knowing he could soothe it away, then incite it again until every pulse throbbed like a wound. And she reveled in knowing it was the same for him, that breathless, burning need, the panic, the thrill that they brought to each other from the first greedy touch. Tumbling over the bed, groping, gasping, they fought with buttons and snaps until clothes scattered like fallen leaves. The quest was for flesh, the taste of it, the feel and scent that was a prelude to that most basic of desires. He traced his hands over her, the firm, silky-skinned breasts, the narrow ribcage and hips. In the dark he could see her with his fingertips, every inch, every curve and muscle. Like a blind man seeking texture and shape, he explored the body he already knew. She was everything he'd ever wanted, ever fought for, ever gambled for, and she was quivering beneath him, ready, eager, amazingly his. Her body surged up, agile, quick. When their positions were reversed, she straddled him. In one fluid move, she imprisoned him inside those hot, wet walls, arching back to take him hard to the hilt. Her hands groped for, then grasped his, their fingers tightly interlacing as she rocked them both toward madness. His last thought was that it was indeed too late, much too late for both of them. Morning dawned dreary. Heavy clouds thickened the sky and the air, muting all the color to a gunmetal gray. Occasionally rain pricked its way through the layers and fell in sharp darts that stung and chilled. Men and machines raked the track, turned it up anew, sleeked it with furrows. Pimlico drained well, and its groomsmen attended it as carefully, as tenderly, as a man might tend a much-loved horse. Rain didn't deter the crowds or the press. By post-time for the first race, the stands were full. Brightly colored umbrellas seemed to float like balloons on a gray sea. Inside the clubhouse, people stayed dry, feeding on crabs and beer while they watched the action on monitors. The weather had Kelsey opting for jeans and boots rather than the linen dress she'd expected to wear. It gave her an excuse to linger at the barn and weave black-eyed Susans through Justice's blonde mane to decorate him for his regal task of ponying high water to the track. And in her opinion, there was nothing like a rainy day to make you stop and think. Six months earlier, she hadn't known Naomi existed. She'd taken no more than a passing glance at the world she was now a part of. She'd been drifting, haunted by a failed marriage and what she had begun to see as her own failed sexuality. Her job had amused her, nearly satisfied her, yet she'd been thinking of moving on. There was always another job, another course to take, another trip to plan. She liked to tell herself she'd made all those restless lateral moves to stimulate her mind. But in reality, she'd done so simply to fill holes, 
holes she hadn't wanted to acknowledge, holes she certainly hadn't understood. She had considered carefully whether she was doing the same now, using Naomi, the farm, even Gabe, to plug those cracks in her life. Would she, as her family seemed to think, become disenchanted, dissatisfied with the routine, and move on yet again? Or could she trust the feelings that were blooming inside her, the growing attachment to her mother, a simple, almost quiet evolution from anger and suspicion to affection and respect? Why not just accept that she'd found, and perhaps begun to earn, a place on the farm? And Gabe, wasn't it possible to relax and enjoy what was happening between them? She'd had no doubts the night before when they tumbled into bed. No doubts when she'd turned lazily to him at dawn and made slow, languid love. Perhaps it was that inflexible sense of values, her own unwavering perception of right and wrong. How could she allow Naomi to depend on her when she couldn't be certain how long she'd stay? How could she take a lover and glory in lovemaking when neither of them had so much as whispered a word about love? Maybe she was too rigid. If she couldn't take pleasure in the moment without questioning every motive, what did that say about her own makeup? And was she sulking just a little because her ex-husband was being married, perhaps had already taken those vows a second time, while she braided flowers into a gilding's mane? It was time to push that aside once and for all, she warned herself. Time to look forward. She wasn't drifting now. She had a purpose and questions that needed to be answered. She'd deal with them logically, starting at a twenty-year-old route. First thing Monday morning, she promised herself, she would make that call to Charles Rooney. The rain had stopped again when they walked to the paddock. Watery sunlight sneaked through the breaks in the clouds and fell on dripping eaves. Gutters rang musically and turned the ground to mud. Kelsey sneaked a look at Boggs. He seemed old, more frail than he had two weeks before. She knew he'd been assigned as High Water's groom as much for his skill as to help heal the wounds. The rain's a plus, she said, hoping to lift the shadows from his eyes. High Water likes a wet track, and so she remembered to double. He's a good colt. Absently, Boggs patted his neck, steady and kind. Maybe he'll surprise us all today. Last word, he was five to one. Boggs shrugged. He'd never paid much heed to the odds. He ain't run much this year, so haven't seen what he can do. Still, he's finished in the money more times than not. You move if he's asked. But he's no pride. Boggs didn't have to say it. Kelsey understood. Then I'll ask him. Kelsey went to the colt head and held his bridle so that she could look in his eyes. They seemed so wise to her, and as Boggs had said, kind. You'll run, won't you, boy? You'll run as hard and as fast as you can, and that's enough for anyone. You're not going to ask him to win? Naomi laid a hand on Kelsey's shoulder, a small gesture that still touched both of them. No, sometimes the winning isn't as important as the trying. She spotted Reno standing to the side, his arm in a sling, his face haunted and pale. I'll meet you in the box in a minute. Kelsey crossed to him and took his free hand. I was hoping I'd see you. Couldn't stay away. He'd wanted to. The last thing he'd wanted was to stand on the sidelines and watch. I figured to stay home, maybe catch the race on the tube, but I found myself in the car driving out here. We'll have you up again soon, Reno. A spasm crossed his face. He looked away from her, away from the horses, away from the track. I don't know if I have the heart for it. That cold deserved better. So did you, she said quietly. I've spent most of my life dreaming about a derby win. You can ride dozens of horses, cross dozens of wires, but the derby's the one. That's gone now. There's another derby next year, she reminded him. There's always another derby. I don't know if I want another chance. His face tightened when he saw a figure over her shoulder. Good luck today, he said, and hurried away. Rossi noted the jockey's quick retreat and filed it. Despite the lack of welcome on Kelsey's face, he walked to her. Miserable day. It seemed to be clearing up until a moment ago. He smiled, acknowledged the thrust. I was hoping for a few tips while I was wandering around. You're unlikely to get any, Lieutenant. 
She began walking, resigned to the fact that he fell into step beside her. You look like what you are, a cop. An occupational hazard. I don't claim to know a lot about horses, Miss Biden, but that one of yours seemed a little on the small side. He is, just over fourteen hands. But I don't think you're here to talk horses. You're wrong. Horses are right at the center of this. He offered her his bag of peanuts, then cracked another for himself when she declined. I've been doing some research. There are a lot of ways to kill a horse, Miss Biden, some of which are on the gruesome side. I'm aware of that. Much too aware now, she thought. It had been Matt who'd told her when she depressed for answers. Told her of electrocution, putting a horse in standing water, then killing him with live battery cables. A cruel and clever murder, sometimes overlooked. Unless a vet spotted burn marks in the nostrils. Worse, she thought, was suffocating them with ping pong balls thrust up the nose. They were impossible for a horse to expel, causing a slow, hideous death. Your derby colt, Rossi continued. He wasn't just killed. He was killed in full view of millions of people. Risky. It's my belief that when someone takes a risk, a particularly unnecessary one, it's because he's anxious to make a point. Who'd want to slap down your mother in public, Miss Biden? I have no idea. But she stopped. The statement shifted the suspicion from Naomi and instead made her a victim. Is that what you think this is about? It's an avenue worth exploring. She had the colt insured heavily, but there's no cash flow problem at Three Willows, and in the long term that colt would have generated a lot more. Your mother appears to be a sensible businesswoman. Now there's Slater. He had nothing to do with it. That's an emotional response, and precisely what he'd expected. Backing off that a minute, he reaped the reward. You always want to look at who benefits from murder, Miss Biden, any kind of murder. The problem with that is it puts a cloud over him and his derby win. So I asked myself, would it be worth it to him? He had a good chance of winning anyway, so would it be worth it to him to stack the deck in so obvious a way? He doesn't strike me as an obvious man. An emotional response, Lieutenant? An observation, Miss Biden. He's not the only one who benefited. There's his trainer, his jockey. They both got a piece of the pie, and there's anyone who bet. She gave a short laugh, looking around at the crowds. That certainly narrows the field. More than you think. He scanned the crowd as well, enjoying himself. If it ties in with my two homicides, it narrows it a lot more than you think. Who did Lipsky trust enough? Or who was he afraid enough of to let get close enough to kill him? Someone he worked with, worked for? There was a lot more than two horses in that race, Miss Biden, and a lot more riding on the derby than a blanket of flowers. She stopped, then turned to study his face. Why are you telling me all of this? You're new to the game. You might see a lot more than people think. He paused to crack open another nut. And you're involved. Your relationship with your mother isn't making everyone happy. So he'd been prying into her personal life as well. She should have expected it. That's family business, Lieutenant, and has nothing to do with murder. I could quote you statistics that would show you family business leads to murder more often than any other kind. I'm just asking you to keep your eyes open. They're open, Lieutenant. She stood her ground, unwilling to have him walk into view of the boxes. There was no point in upsetting Naomi moments before the race. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to join my mother. Good luck, he called out and chose another nut. He had a feeling Kelsey Biden would be much harder to crack. Kelsey stepped into the box just as the horses were being loaded into the gate. I was afraid you wouldn't make it. Ran into someone, Kelsey muttered and glanced from her mother to Gabe. It was like him, she thought, to be here, to stand with them when this was so completely his moment. She took his hand and gave it a quick squeeze. Side bets later. You still owe me from the first one. Double or nothing, then. It's apropos. She studied the field through her binoculars. Your horse by two lengths. The track's sloppy, but I'll say he runs it in a minute fifty-eight tops. Our colt takes third in two and twelve. He lifted a brow. That's a hard bit for a man to turn down, since there's no way to lose. The starting gun fired. From the first plunge, Double and his rider took the lead. 
It was as if, Kelsey thought, they both knew they had something to prove. This was a champion, bursting from the pack in a heartbeat, with no need to feel the bat on his back to pour it on. By the first turn, he was a half-length in the lead, with the Arkansas Colt and the Kentucky Roan fighting for second. Again, Kelsey lost herself in the grandeur of it. With her binoculars in place, she urged the horses on, not seeing, as she'd been afraid she would, an overlapping image of pride going down. There was only the mud-splattered athletes, riders and ridden, thundering around the oval. There was rain in the air, another misty, steady drizzle that blurred her vision and soaked her skin. A full length now, and moving out, his red wrapping smeared brown, his rider balanced like a toy in the irons. She heard herself laughing at the glory of it. Then, like an arrow from a bow, high water shot up on the outside. Kelsey's breath caught at the suddenness of the move. He was gaining, digging in, kicking up turf, fighting, she thought, dazed for honor. Down the stretch double-lengthened his lead. The crowd roared for him, a flood of sound that overwhelmed everything else. Then for high water, the five-to-one shot that streaked into third and kept gaining during that heart-stopping final three-sixteenths. My God, look at him! My God, Mom, just look at him! I am. Tears mixed with the rain running down Naomi's face. She wrapped her arm tight around Kelsey's waist as they finished five, seven, two. Double had the black-eyed Susans, but high water had edged out Arkansas for second. He did it! Kelsey let her binoculars drop. The little guy did it! She hugged Naomi first, laughing out the victory. Nobody believed it! None of us believed it! She whirled and with a whoop launched herself into Gabe's arms. Congratulations! What was the time? What was his time? Gabe held up the stopwatch, amused when Kelsey snatched it from him. A minute, fifty-seven and a quarter. She laughed again, rain dripping from her hair onto her face. Gabriel Slater, you've just won the second jewel in the Triple Crown. What are you going to do now? And I know you're not going to Disney World. I'm going to Belmont. He lifted her high, spun her around once, then kissed her. We're going to Belmont. Inside the clubhouse, Rich Slater toasted the image of his son and Kelsey on the monitor, then downed the aged scotch. A handsome couple, he thought. A very handsome couple they made, much as he and Naomi would have done if she hadn't turned her icy nose up at him. But there were other matters to contemplate, other matters to celebrate. He'd put ten of the hundred thousand he'd bled out of Cunningham on Double's nose. He was quite satisfied with the profits. For now. I hope you don't mind. Kelsey opened the champagne with a cheery pop. She'd already had several glasses in her mother's suite, but the night was young. I'm going to finish the entire bottle, and I may get considerably drunk. Gabe sat, crossing his feet at the ankles. He'd been fantasizing about a long, hot, very steamy shower for two, but he could wait. It might be interesting to see how many more inhibitions Kelsey let fly after a bottle of Dom. Just because I don't drink doesn't mean I wouldn't enjoy watching you indulge yourself. I'm going to. She poured, then watched the bubbles froth recklessly over the lip of the flute. You know, I've never really been drunk. I've been close, but I always pulled myself back. She took a long swallow, waved her hand. Breeding. Don't want to get too loose at the club. People will talk. Don't want to get too loose at a party. Other people will talk. This time she waved the bottle. Bidens do not solicit gossip. What do they solicit? Respect, admiration, and above all, discretion. She closed one eye to narrow her vision and poured more wine. To hell with that. Let them talk. We won. Isn't it incredible? Yes, it is. He smiled at her. She was barefoot now, and her hair had dried in a glorious tangle of pale gold. Everyone was so down before, trying not to be, but it was so hard. I saw Reno in the paddock, and it just broke my heart. She drank again, sighed, and decided she liked the way champagne made the room circle. Glass in hand, she executed two slow pirouettes to help it along. Do that again. He wanted the pleasure of watching the way her hair flowed out, settled, flowed out, settled. With a giddy laugh, she obliged him. 
See, those lessons were good for something. Taught me discipline, too, mental and physical. You know, you could break bricks on this body. I'm sure I can find more interesting things to do with it. She laughed again, knowing he could, would. We were talking about the race. I hope it made Reno feel better. You could see how happy Naomi and Moses were, even Boggs. Poor old Boggs, blaming himself because he bet on pride. It had nothing to do with it. People are always looking for ways to tie things together, like Rossi. Rossi? Hmm. She poured another glass, then absently began to unbutton her shirt. It was getting warmer by the swallow. He was there at the race. I talked to him, or he talked to me. He seems to be there every time you turn around, watching, working out his theories. Why should anyone want to hurt Naomi or make people wonder? Gabe adjusted his focus. Her shirt was open to the first sweet curve of breast, but he wanted to concentrate on her words. Is that what he thinks? Who knows? She gave a careless shrug. I don't think he really tells you what he thinks. If you follow me, she said after a moment. He just says things to sort of plant them in your mind and drive you crazy. But at least he doesn't seem to be looking at Naomi as some sort of horse assassin. She smiled winningly. He's still got one eye on you, Slater. I never doubted it. But only one eye. She closed one of her own to demonstrate. He doesn't think you're obvious. Quite a compliment coming from that source. He decided he could concentrate on Kelsey's emerging flesh after all. You've got a couple more buttons there, darling. I'm getting them. I've never stripped for a man before. Let me be the first. She chuckled and with her eyes half closed, fumbled open the snap of her jeans. It irritated me seeing him there. Rossi, I mean. It started me thinking back over the derby. All the things that happened. Watching the horses come back through the mist after morning workout. The smells, the sounds, the nerves. Boggs hanging up Pride's wrappings and talking about his last bet. How he thought he saw your father. What? The blood Kelsey's careless striptease had been heating froze like a river of ice. What did you say about my father? Oh, Boggs thought he saw him at Churchill Downs. He thought it was bad luck. But I don't suppose he was there, or he'd have let you know. Kelsey. Gabe rose, took her glass out of her hand, and set it aside. What did Boggs say about the old man? Nothing much. She blew out a long breath. Her head was spinning, a lovely feeling. But Gabe's eyes were so intense they burned through the fog. Just that he thought he'd seen him around the shed row? He had her arms now. When? Sometime that morning, but he wasn't sure. He said he only got a glimpse, and his eyes aren't good any more. She shook her head, trying fruitlessly to clear it. What difference does it make? None, Gabe said, gentling his hold. Or all, all the difference in the world. I just wondered. The past has a way of squeezing the throat. She lifted a hand to his face. We shouldn't let it. We have now. Yes, we do. It could wait, Gabe told himself. Odds were it was nothing, but whatever it was, he would deal with it when they returned home. Let's see. He cupped her chin, studied her flushed face and blinking eyes. Darling, you're going to have one hell of a headache come morning. Well, then, she hooked her arms around his neck. In one lithe leap, she encircled his waist, legs locked. Then we'd better make it worth it, right? It's the least I can do. Let's go into the shower. He lowered his head and nipped at her bare shoulder. I'll show you what I have in mind. Chapter 19 She thought about telling Gabe. Certainly it wasn't a matter of dependence to tell a man you were so intimately involved with about your intentions. It wouldn't have been weak to ask him to come with her, to lend a little moral support when she faced her past. But she hadn't told him, because, intellect aside, it felt dependent, it felt weak, and it was, when you scraped away all of the excess, her problem. In any case, he hardly had a minute he could call his own. It wasn't every year there was a viable contender for the Triple Crown who had two jewels already in place. His hands were full with the press, his mind full of tensions and possibilities, 
and his days full overseeing the interim three weeks of training before the Belmont Stakes. She didn't want to distract him from the goal, a goal, she'd begun to realize, that meant a great deal more to him than money and prestige. To Gabe, the triple crown would be proof that he had taken something and not only made it his own, but made it extraordinary. Underlying that, she didn't want him to toss her own advice back in her face. It wasn't wise to let the past strangle you. But she couldn't break free of it, not completely. The longer she knew Naomi, the more she grew to care for her, the less Kelsey could believe that her mother had coldly killed a man, or hotly for that matter. There was no disputing the fact that Naomi had pulled the trigger, that she had ended a life. Not only did Naomi admit it, not only had a jury convicted her, but there had been a witness. Kelsey decided she couldn't lay the past to rest until she'd spoken with Charles Rooney. She enjoyed the drive. It was difficult not to appreciate, no matter how crowded the highway, the green banks and bursting blooms of full spring. She had the top down and Chopin soaring. The better, she decided, to keep her mind off what she was about to do. She hadn't lied, precisely, in giving Rooney's secretary the name Kelsey Monroe when she'd made the appointment. It was merely a precaution, a way to be certain Rooney didn't immediately connect her with Naomi. A bending of those stiff codes of right and wrong, she thought, She'd always been amused by and disdainful of people who considered white lies acceptable or convenient, and here she was, using that same slippery rope to climb to her own ends. Evaluate later, she told herself. Nor had she been completely truthful when she'd made excuses to take the afternoon off. Errands and appointments had simply been evasions. She knew Naomi assumed she was going to meet the family, and she'd let Naomi think just that. Whatever the outcome of the afternoon, Kelsey doubted she'd pass it along to her mother. For the first time since they'd lost pride, Naomi seemed relaxed again. No one expected Highwater to repeat his Preakness performance in the grueling mile and a half at Belmont. The point had been made, the victory won. Now they could reap the rewards. And she could steal a few hours and dig into the muck of the past. She'd already mapped out her route in and through the city. Though she wasn't very familiar with Alexandria, she found the building easily enough and slipped into an empty spot in the underground garage. Nerves pressed on her, irritating her with damp hands and a skittish stomach. She took her time, deliberately setting the brake, locking the car, tucking her keys into the zippered compartment of her purse. What could be worse, she asked herself, what could be worse than knowing your mother killed a man? Whatever Charles Rooney told her couldn't be much of a shock. It was only that she, somehow, wanted it to come together tidily in her mind. Then, once and for all, she would be able to accept the woman Naomi had become and stop dwelling on the woman she had been. The elevator took her to the fifth floor, up from the echoing concrete of the garage to the hushed, carpeted hallways. Glass doors and windows etched with names flanked both sides. Inside them people worked, with all appearance of industry, at word processors and telephones. It made her shudder. How would it feel to be on display all through working hours to anyone who happened to wander down the hall? How would it feel to be trapped behind that glass with spring rioting outside? Struck by her own thoughts, she shook her head. It hadn't been so very long ago that she'd been inside, and just as much on display as the exhibits she'd taken her little tour groups to see in the museum. How completely a few short months had changed her outlook and her desires. Rooney Investigation Services took up the south corner of the building. It was not, as she had assumed, a small operation, nor did it convey that vaguely seamy atmosphere so often created in television and movie portrayals of detective agencies. No wry in the file cabinets here, she decided, as she entered the glass doors into soft background music and the scent of gardenias. The romantic fragrance wafted from the waxy blooms tumbling out of the jardiniers on either side of a pastel sectional sofa. There were prints of Monet's floating water lilies on the walls and a reproduction Queen Anne coffee table fanned with glossy copies of southern homes. The woman seated at the circular ebony workstation in the center of the room was as polished as the furnishings. She glanced up from her monitor and aimed a professional but surprisingly warm smile at Kelsey. "'May I help you?' "'I have an appointment with Mr. Rooney.' "'Miss Monroe?' 
Yes, you are a few minutes early. If you just take a seat, I'll see if Mr. Rooney is ready to see you. Kelsey sat next to the gardenias, picked up a magazine, and for the next ten minutes pretended to be absorbed in the fussy decor of an antebellum mansion outside of Raleigh. All the while her nerves and her conscience pricked at her. She shouldn't have come. She certainly shouldn't have given a name she no longer used or wanted. She had no business poking fingers in Naomi's affairs. She should get up and tell the stunning and efficient receptionist that she'd made a mistake. Surely she wouldn't be the first person to make a panicked dash from a detective's office. And even if she were, what did it matter? She should be back at the bar and working with honor, not sitting here smelling gardenias and staring at a picture of somebody's overly decorated living room. But she didn't get up, not until the receptionist called her name again and offered to show her in. There were several doors on either side of the inner corridor. No glass here, Kelsey noted. Whatever went on inside those rooms was private. Discretion would be an integral part of the business. And because it was, why did she expect Charles Rooney to tell her anything even after twenty-three years? Because she had the right, she told herself, and straightened her shoulders, because she was Naomi Chadwick's daughter. Mr. Rooney, Ms. Monroe to see you. The receptionist opened one half of the double oak doors, scooted Kelsey inside, then retreated. It was a simple room, furnished more like a den than an office, with glassy-eyed big game fish mounted on the walls, models of ships lining shelves. The man who rose from behind the desk might have been everyone's favorite uncle, slightly paunchy, slightly bald, round-faced, and narrow-shouldered. His tie was slightly askew, as if he'd recently tugged against the restriction. He had a quiet, friendly voice, meant to put the most nervous client at ease. "'I'm sorry I kept you waiting, Ms. Monroe. Would you like some coffee?' He gestured toward a Krupp's coffee maker on the table behind him. I keep a pot in here to keep the juices flowing. No, thank you, nothing, but you go ahead. She made herself sit, using the time he gave her while pouring his own mug to study him and his milieu. Such an ordinary man, she thought, in an ordinary place. How could he have had such a devastating influence on so many lives? Now, Miss Monroe, you indicated you needed some help with the custody case. He seated himself, idly stirring his spoon around and around in the mug. Already a fresh legal pad was waiting for his notes. You're divorced? Yes. And the child, who at this time has primary custody? She drew in a long breath. Now that she was in the door, it was time for the truth. I am the child, Mr. Rooney. With her hands clutching her bag, she kept her eyes on his. Monroe was my married name. I don't use it any more, as I've taken back my maiden name. It's Biden. I'm Kelsey Biden. She knew the instant it clicked. His hand hesitated, his rhythmic stirring skipped a beat. His pupils widened so that for a moment his eyes seemed black instead of green. I see. You'd expect me to remember that name and that case. Of course I do. You look remarkably like your mother. I should have recognized you. I hadn't thought of that. You'd have seen her quite a lot back then. You had her under surveillance. He didn't miss the faint distaste in her tone. It's part of the job. This particular job took a sharp turn. My father hired you, Mr. Rooney? A Miss Biden, a Kelsey. It's difficult for me not to think of you as Kelsey, he said, measuring her and his own heart rate as he spoke. Custody suits are never pleasant. You were, fortunately, young enough not to be involved in the more difficult aspects. I was hired, as I'm sure you know, to document your mother's lifestyle in order to strengthen your father's case for full custody. And what did you discover about her lifestyle? That isn't something I feel free to discuss. A great deal of its public record, Mr. Rooney. I can't believe you're bound by client confidentiality after all this time. Hoping to influence him, she leaned forward, let some of the emotion she was feeling leak into her voice. I need to know. I'm not a child who needs to be protected from those difficult aspects any longer. You must understand that I feel I have a right to know exactly what happened. How, he wondered, had he looked at that face and not seen, looked into those eyes and not known this was Naomi's child. I sympathize, but there's very little I can tell you. 
You followed her. You took pictures, notes, you made reports. You knew her, Mr. Rooney, and you knew Alec Bradley. Knew them? He inclined his head. I never exchanged a word with Naomi Chadwick or Alec Bradley. She wasn't about to be put off with so shallow a technicality. You saw them together at parties, at the track, at the club. You saw them together that night when he came to the house. You were technically trespassing when you took the pictures that convicted her. He hadn't forgotten it. He hadn't forgotten any of it. I walked a thin line, agreed, and perhaps I crossed it in my zeal to do my job. He offered a small smile while his memory swarmed through his mind. With today's technology, I could accomplish the same thing without the question of trespass. He paused, took a moment to lift his mug. But the line still gets crossed, Kelsey. It's crossed every day. You formed an opinion of her. I imagine part of your job would be to remain objective. But it would be impossible not to form an opinion of someone when you're monitoring her life. He began to stir his coffee again, even though the heaping spoonful of sugar he'd added had long since dissolved. It was over twenty years ago. You remember her, Mr. Rooney. You wouldn't have forgotten her or anything that happened. She was a beautiful woman, he said slowly. A vibrant woman who got in over her head. With Alec Bradley. Annoyed with himself, Rooney set the spoon aside, staining his blotter. With him, yes. In the public record you spoke of, Naomi Chadwick was arrested for the murder of Alec Bradley and convicted. And your photo of the shooting helped convict her. It did. He remembered, vividly, hoisting himself up into the tree, his camera bumping against his chest, his heart pounding. You could say I was in the right place at the right time. She called it self-defense. She claimed that Alec Bradley threatened her, intended to rape her. I'm aware of her defense. The evidence didn't support it. But you were there. You must have seen if she was afraid, if he seemed threatening. He folded his hands on the edge of the desk, like a man about to recite a well-rehearsed prayer. I saw her let him into the house. They had a drink together. They argued. I can't now, as I couldn't then, testify to what was said between them. They went upstairs. She went up, Kelsey corrected. He followed her. Yes, as far as I could tell. I took a chance and used the tree, thinking they would go to her bedroom. Because he'd been in there before? Kelsey asked. No, not that I had observed. But this was only the third night I had gone on to the property, and the first that I knew the rest of the household was absent. He kept his hands linked, his eyes calm and level on hers. Several minutes passed. I nearly climbed down again. But then they came into the bedroom. She entered first. It appeared that they were still arguing. He remembered the look on Naomi's face, the way it had filled his viewfinder with beauty, with anger, with disdain. And yes, he remembered, with fear. Her back was to me for a short time. He cleared his throat. Then she spun around. When she came back into view, she had a gun. I could see them both, framed in the window. He put his hands up, backed away, and she fired. The chill ran through Kelsey like a blade. And then? And then, Kelsey, I froze. I'm not proud of it, but I was young. I'd never seen... I froze, he repeated. I watched her go to where he'd fallen and lean over. And I watched her go to the phone... I got out of there and sat in my car until I heard the sirens. You didn't call the police? No, uh, not immediately. It was foolish of me. It could have cost me my license. But I did go to them, took in the film, made my statement. He loosened his hands, abruptly aware that his fingers were aching from the pressure. I did my job. And all you saw was a beautiful, vibrant woman who got in over her head and shot a man? I wish I could tell you different. Your mother served her time. It's over. Not for me, Kelsey rose. What if I hired you, Mr. Rooney, right now, today? I want you to go back 23 years, take another look at the case. I want to know all there is to know about Alec Bradley. Fear sprinted up his spine, stiffening it. Let it rest, Kelsey. Nothing can be solved, and certainly nothing can be changed by picking at old wounds. Do you think your mother will thank you for making her relive all of that? Maybe not. 
but I intend to go back, step by step, until I understand. Will you help me? He studied her, but it was another woman he saw, a woman sitting pale and composed in a crowded courtroom. Composed, he remembered, except for the eyes, those desperate eyes. No, I won't. I'm going to ask you to think this through. Consider the consequences. I have thought it through, Mr. Rooney, and I keep coming back to one conclusion. My mother was telling the truth. I'm going to prove it, with or without your help. Thank you for your time. He sat where he was long after the door closed behind her, long after he'd willed his hands to stop trembling. When he was steady, he picked up the phone and dialed. Her next stop was the university. The long wait in her father's cramped office calmed her considerably. It was always a bomb to be surrounded by books, the scents and sounds of academia. That was why it always lured her back, she supposed. In this world, learning was the primary goal, and every question had an answer. Philip entered, chalk dust on his fingertips. Kelsey, what a wonderful way to lift my day. I'd have been here sooner, but my seminar ran over a bit. I didn't mind waiting. I was hoping you'd have a few minutes free. I have the next hour, which he'd been planning to use to prepare for his final lecture of the day, but that could wait. If you could spare the rest of the afternoon, I'll treat you to an early dinner when I'm finished. Not tonight, thanks. I still have another stop to make. Dad, I need to talk to you. I don't want you to worry about your grandmother. I'll deal with that. No, I'm not worried about that. It's not important. Of course it is. He took her by the shoulders, his hands moving up and down her arms. I won't tolerate this kind of a breach, nor her using your heritage against you. Furious all over again, he turned to pace the narrow confines of his office, as he would while contemplating a thesis. Your grandmother is an admirable woman, Kelsey, and a formidable one. Her blind side is the family and her tendency to confuse her own set of standards with love. You don't have to explain her to me or excuse her. I know that, in her way, she loves me. It's just that her way hasn't always been easy. Had never been easy, Kelsey corrected. I also know she isn't used to being crossed. This time she'll either come to accept what I'm doing with my life, or she won't. I can't let it influence me. He paused, picked up a smooth glass paperweight from his desk. I don't want you to be at odds. Neither do I. If you and I went to see her, together, no. Sighing, he took off his glasses, polishing the lenses out of habit rather than need. Kelsey, she's no longer young. She's your family. Oh, she thought, the buttons loved ones push. I'm sorry I can't compromise on this. I know you've been shoved right into the middle of it, and I'm sorry for that, too. She can't have what she wants, Dad. And if we're honest... I've never been what she wanted. Kelsey, I'm Naomi's daughter, and she's always resented it. I can only hope that in time she'll come to accept that I'm just as much your daughter. Carefully he folded his glasses and set them on his cluttered desk beside a time-worn copy of King Lear. She loves you, Kelsey. It's the circumstances she's fighting. I am the circumstances, she said quietly. I'm the motive, the reason, the child two people wanted long after they didn't want each other. There's no getting past that. It's ridiculous to blame yourself. Not blame, that's the wrong word. But do I feel a certain sense of responsibility? Yes, I do, she said, when he shook his head. To you and to her. That's why I'm here. I need you to tell me what happened. Suddenly weary, he sat rubbing his fingers over his forehead. We've done this, Kelsey. You gave me an outline, a sketch. You fell in love with someone. Despite some family disapproval on your side, you married her. You had a child with her. Somewhere along the line, things went wrong between you. She moved over to his side, hating to hurt, needing the truth. I'm not asking you to explain all of that. But you knew the woman you married. You had feelings for her. If you were willing to fight her for the child, to go to court, to hire lawyers and detectives, there had to be a reason, a strong one. I want to know what it was. I wanted you, he said simply. I wanted you with me. Selfishly, perhaps. 
not altogether reasonably. You were the best part of us. I didn't believe growing up in the atmosphere your mother thrived in was right for you, was best for you. Had he been wrong, he asked himself. Had he been wrong? How many times had he asked himself that one question, even after everything that had happened had borne him out? Your grandmother and I discussed it at great length, Philip continued. She was violently opposed to Naomi having primary custody of you. In the end, I agreed with her. It wasn't an easy decision, but it was one I believed in. Part of it was selfishness, yes, I can't deny it. He looked up at her, at the woman, and remembered the child. I didn't want to give you up, to become a weekend father who would eventually be replaced by the next man in Naomi's life. And the way she lived during those months after the separation seemed deliberately designed to challenge me. Her attorneys must have advised her to behave discreetly, so she did precisely the opposite. She courted the press, incited gossip. I detested the idea of hiring a detective, but the documentation was needed. I left that matter up to the attorneys. You didn't hire Rooney directly? No, I... How do you know his name? I've just come from his office. Kelsey. He reached out and gripped her hand. What is the purpose of this? What do you hope to gain? Answers. One answer in particular. She tightened her fingers on his. I'll ask you. Do you believe Naomi murdered Alec Bradley? There isn't any doubt that she killed him, Kelsey said tersely. But murder? Did she murder him? Was the woman you knew, the woman you loved, capable of murder? He hesitated, feeling his daughter's fingers threaded through his. I don't know he said at last. I wish with all my heart that I did. Kelsey's final meeting of the day was with her mother's lawyers. She'd gleaned little more there, coming up hard against the unassailable wall of attorney-client privilege. She left the plush offices dissatisfied and determined. There was always another avenue, she reminded herself. Every problem had a solution. All you needed were the factors, the formula, and the patience to see it through. A pity, she thought, that she'd always done so much better in philosophy and the arts than in math and science. If she was discouraged, it was because she was tired. Too tired, she had to admit, to face Naomi with made-up tales of how she'd spent her afternoon. She drove through the gates of Longshot instead. If Gabe wasn't home, she'd go on to Three Willows and make some excuse. A headache, perhaps, and retreat to her room. Another white lie, Kelsey? she asked herself grimly. If she kept it up much longer, she'd not only become good at it, she'd accept it as normal behavior. She started toward the house, but instead of knocking, she simply sat down on the front steps and watched the evening bloom. There would be sunlight for another hour or two, she mused. She wondered if the whippoorwill that sang outside the window of her room had a mate nearby. The call would come simultaneously with dusk. Sweet, liquid longing. The flowers were thriving here, bursting through their bed of mulch to color and scent the air. Dainty primroses, sassy pansies, a trellis that would soon be covered with the spicy perfume of sweet peas. Lilac bushes were heavy with blooms and fragrance, their petals littering the grass with deep purple. Such a quiet spot, such a lovely spot for a man of such energy and passion. She heard the door open behind her, then his footsteps, in a move that was as natural as the flowers blooming beside the deck, she leaned against him when he sat and draped an arm around her. I saw your car. Who planted the flowers? I did. It's my land. My father gardens. In Georgetown I had a lovely little courtyard in the back. So naturally I took a course in horticulture and landscape design. It was quite a showplace when I got done with it but it never looked quite as lovely, quite as intimate as my father's. There are some things you can't get out of books. I plan what appeals to me. If I had it to do over, that's just how I'd approach it. I've been thinking about a rock garden out there. He gestured toward the slope of the hill. Why don't you do it with me? She smiled, turning her face into his throat, where the skin was warm and welcoming. I'd head straight for the library. I couldn't stop myself. So we'd argue about logic and whim, then raid the nursery. 
He tipped a finger under her chin to lift her face to his. What's troubling you, Kelsey? She could tell him, she realized. Of course she could. There was nothing she couldn't tell him. I started something today, and I know I'm not going to stop. Everyone's told me I should let it alone, but I can't. I won't. She took a deep breath and eased back until they were no longer touching. Do you believe my mother murdered Alec Bradley? No. She blinked, shook her head. Just no? Without hesitation, without qualification? You asked, I answered. He leaned over to snap off a spray of freesia and handed it to her. Isn't it more important what you believe? She shook her head again, then dropped it into her hands. You can say no, simply no, when you didn't even know her. Not really. Not really? She lifted her head again. What does that mean? I knew of her. I'd seen her around. He angled his head and toyed with the ends of her hair. I've been a track rat a long time, Kelsey. I remember seeing her at Charlestown, Laurel, here and there. You'd have been a child. Not the way you mean, but it's true. I didn't know her, didn't form a solid impression. But I know her now. And? She needed specifics, he thought. She always would. He wasn't certain he could give them to her. And I made my living reading people, faces, intonations, gestures. Gamblers, psychics, cops, shrinks. We all have that skill in common or we don't last long. Naomi pulled the trigger, but she didn't commit murder. With her eyes closed, she leaned against his body again. The flower he'd given her wafted out a delicate scent. I believe that, Gabe. Part of me is afraid I do simply because I don't want to accept that my mother could have done what she was convicted of. But that doesn't dilute the belief. I went to see the detective today, the one who testified against her. His voice remained light. She wondered how she could have so often missed the steel beneath it. It didn't occur to you to ask me to go with you? It did. I wanted to do it alone. She shrugged. It didn't accomplish much. He wouldn't tell me anything I didn't already know. And he wouldn't, when I tried to hire him, help me find out more about Alec Bradley. What do you want to know? Anything. Everything. My mother's only part of this. She moved away. What kind of a man was he? Where did he come from? What did he want? Naomi says he became abusive, tried to rape her. What triggered it? Have you asked her? I don't want to do that unless I have to. She'll close up, Gabe. She'd tell me what she knew, but it could bring whatever progress we've made to a dead stop. I don't want to risk that. She wasn't the only one who knew him. Kelsey had already considered that and rejected it. I can't start asking questions around the track, pumping the other owners or crews. Whatever I'd learn wouldn't be worth the talk it would generate. What's your option? I have the name of the officer who investigated my mother's case. He's retired now, lives in Reston. You've been doing your homework. I've always been a good student. I'm going to go see him. Gabe took her hand and pulled her to her feet. We're going to go see him. She smiled. Okay. Chapter 20 Been a while, Roscoe. Tipton slapped hands with Rossi. How come you don't have my old job yet? I'm working on it, Captain. Well, take a seat, and we'll work on these brews. Tipton eased himself into the porch rocker. He had a small eaglow cooler beside it, chilling a six-pack of bud. How's the wife? Rossi accepted the can Tipton offered and popped it. Which one? Oh, yeah, forgot. You're a two-time loser. With a chuckle, Tipton smacked his can against Rossi's and guzzled down. Divorce is almost part of the job, isn't it? I got lucky. How's Mrs. Tipton? Sassy as ever. Very simple, very basic affection colored his grainy voice. Two weeks after I retire, she gets a job. Amused, Tipton shook his head. Tells me it's busy work. Now that the kids are grown, hell, we both know it's to keep her from killing me with a blunt instrument. So I got me my hobby shop in the back, and she's selling shoes down at the mall. He smiled, drank again. I got lucky, Roscoe. 
Not every woman can live with a cop, active or retired. Tell me about it. Two wives and two divorces in twelve years had taught Rossi that particular lesson too well. You're looking good, Captain. It was true. Tipton had put on a little weight in his three years off the force, but it agreed with him. The few pounds had filled out some of the lines the job had dug into his face. He looked relaxed and at peace in a work shirt and jeans. An Oriole's cap covered what was left of wiry hair that was a mix of ginger and gray. A lot of people don't take to retirement, Tipton commented. Make some old. Me, I'm loving it. I got my workshop. Built this chair, you know. Really? Rossi tucked his tongue in his cheek as he examined the rickety rocker. The fact that Tipton had painted it a dazzling blue didn't disguise the way it listed to the left. It must be rewarding. Oh, it is. I've got three grandchildren now, too, and time to enjoy them. The wife and I are talking about taking a cruise this fall, up to St. Lawrence, foliage. Sounds like you've got it all, Captain. Damn right. And if he had much more, Tipton was sure he'd run screaming into the night. A long, peaceful retirement's a man's reward for a job well done. No one can argue about the job well done. Rossi sipped at the beer. He preferred imported, but knew better than to say so. I don't guess you pay much attention to what's going on now, but you might have read about a case I'm working on. Oh, I glance at the headlines now and again. Poured over them, greedy for any glimpse of murder and mayhem. The groom who was murdered at Charlestown back in March? Stabbed. Trampled on top of it. You closed that, Tipton remembered. Another groom, wasn't it? Lipsky? Suicide? That one's open. Rossi leaned back and watched a trio of starlings fluttering around an obviously homemade bird feeder on the front lawn. An orange striped cat sat below, eyeing them patiently. On the porch, he thought, they were just two men, passing the time with shop talk. No note, no predisposition to suicide, and the method doesn't fit. Here's how it shakes down. He explained, as precisely as a written report, the events from Lipsky's firing to his death. We've got a picture here of a man with a quick fuse, a violent one who knows his way around horses, not a man who makes friends or rises in his chosen profession, one who's had a few scrapes with the law, battery, assault, D&D, a picture of a man who'd run, not who'd pour himself a cocktail of gin and horse poison. Tipton chewed on that a while, but he could probably get his hands on it. He could. Someone else could. He was after Slater's horse. Now, could be that was personal. He was pissed about being fired, so he goes for the payback. The old man catches him at it. He panics. Now he's got a dead man on his hands. Why didn't he run, Captain? Why does he hunker down in a motel, not an hour from Charlestown? Because he's waiting for somebody. Somebody to tell him what to do next. And somebody poured him one hell of a drink. There were no prints on the gin bottle. It was wiped clean. That particular angle had Tipton smiling. Small mistakes, he thought. He had always been fond of small mistakes. He watched his old cat waiting for one of the starlings to make one and understood precisely. And you've got an open case of homicide. Have you taken a good look at this later? Oh, I've looked at him. An interesting man. Lots of currents. Did some time. Four. Illegal gambling. If it had been a couple of months earlier, he'd have ended up in juvie instead of a cell. Absently, Rossi tapped his fingers on the arm of his chair. He's been clean since, so far as the record shows. Grew up mostly on the streets. Mother died when he was a kid. The father slid his way out of trouble. Had some arrests. Fraud, forgery, passing bad checks, mostly con games. Pounded on a working girl in Taos a few years ago. But nothing sticks. Slater slipped out of the system at about 14, tripped up and served his time, then kept his nose clean. I can't say he wouldn't have done Lipsky, but he'd have been more direct about it. Who else have you got? Nobody who clicks. Did you catch the derby on TV, Captain? Roscoe, there's only one sport. That's baseball. He tipped his cap. I did hear something about a horse breaking its leg. The horse was drugged, Captain. 
overdosed, and it was Slater's ride that won the race. Well, Tipton mused over the last swallow of beer. Where are you circling to, Roscoe? I'm not sure about that, but it's a big circle. It goes back twenty-three years. Naomi Chadwick, Captain. What can you tell me about her? Funny. Tipton set the empty can under his shoe, then crushed it flat. That's the second time I've heard that name today. The daughter called me this morning. He glanced at his watch. She should be here soon. Kelsey Biden's coming here. She wants to talk to me about her mother. Tipton leaned back in the rocker, enjoying the way it creaked. That does take me back. You should have stayed on the farm, Kelsey muttered. There's barely a week until Belmont. Jamie can handle things without me. Gabe smiled as he negotiated a turn. In fact, he prefers it. I don't feel right about taking you away from work now. I could have done this alone. Kelsey. With patience, Gabe picked up her hand, kissed it. Shut up. I can't. I'm too nervous. This is the man who arrested my mother, who questioned her, put her in jail. Now I'm going to ask him to help me prove he made a mistake. And I lied to Naomi, again. I told her we were going for a drive. We are driving. That's not the point, she snapped. I'm deceiving her, and Moses, everyone. And for what? So I can satisfy this idiotic need to assure myself I don't spring from a line of murderers. Is that what this is about? No. She rubbed a hand over her eyes. I don't know. Some of it. Heredity's a scary thing. As soon as she'd said it, she winced. I don't mean to imply that heredity's the only factor in the makeup of character. Environment... She trailed off, defeated. I lose on both counts, he murmured. I wondered when you'd add it up. That's not what I'm doing. That's not what I've done. She hissed out of breath and cursed herself. I don't know what I'm doing. It has nothing to do with you or the way I feel about you. Let's backtrack a minute. It had been a gamble, a foolish one, to hope this moment would never come. If he was going to lose, he intended to lose big. You have doubts about yourself because of your family history. Don't, he said when she started to interrupt. Let's lay the cards down. You have doubts about me because of mine. He was driving fast now, laying on the curves on the back roads, letting speed eat up some of the tension. That's not true, Gabe. I couldn't have slept with you if I'd had doubts. Yes, you could. It's easy to ignore logic and doubts in the heat of the moment. And we're good in bed. We're better than good in bed. But sooner or later, logic clicks in again. I've got bad blood, Kelsey, and there's no draining it out. His eyes stayed on the road, though he was very aware that hers were on his face, studying, considering. Where you come from always stays with you. You can clean it up, dress it up, but it's always underneath. I've seen things and done things that would shake that moral code of yours right down to the foundation. I don't cheat, and I don't lean on the bottle. But that's about all I can say I haven't done. The simple facts are I wanted what Cunningham had, and I found a way to get it. I wanted you in bed, and I would have done whatever it took to get you there. I see. Now she stared straight ahead. The speed didn't frighten her, but he did. Is it just sex? He didn't answer for a moment. They both watched the road twist ahead. No, I wish to Christ it was. She closed her eyes on a quiet, shuddering sigh. Pull over, she murmured. When he ignored her, she straightened in her seat. Pull over, Slater, she said firmly, and stop the damn car. The tires screeched when he slapped a foot on the brakes and jerked the wheel to the shoulder where gravel spat. If you think I'm letting you get out here, you're a goddamn idiot. I'll take you into Reston or I'll take you back home. I've no intention of getting out here. Fine, that's fine. You'd better understand I have no intention of letting you go, not here, not anywhere. I gave you your chance to run. She'd never seen him so completely unnerved. No, you didn't. He snatched her lapels and jerked her around in her seat. It's all the chance you're getting. Fuck your right and wrong, Kelsey, and your country club upbringing and anything else that's in my way. You're not walking out on me without a fight. Her own temper began to rumble. 
Fine. Since you're going to take that insulting Neanderthal attitude, it hardly seems appropriate for me to tell you that I'm in love with you. His hands went limp. For an instant, every muscle in his body went numb. Her eyes were on his, sulky, signaling fight in progress. But he was already down for the count. You don't know what you are. She hit him. Both gasped in surprise when her fist jabbed just under his heart. I'm not tolerating that. She snacked his hands aside. I'm not tolerating that attitude. I'm sick to death of people I care about, assuming I don't know my own mind or heart. I know it very well. And though at this particular moment it galls me, I'm in love with you. Now start this damn car and let's get this over with. He couldn't have driven a tricycle. Give me a minute. She huffed out a breath, crossed her legs, and folded her arms. Fine, take your time. It'll give me the opportunity to plan several ways to make you suffer. Come here. She jabbed out and connected with her elbow when he reached for her. Hands off. Okay. I just imagined I'd be touching you when I told you I love you. Not particularly mollified, but thoughtful, she turned her head a fraction. Have you been imagining it for long? A while. I thought it would pass, like a virus. He held up both hands when she jerked around. Are you going to hit me again? I might. Damned if she was going to laugh, no matter how much his eyes tempted her. A virus? Yeah, only there's this thing about viruses I'd forgotten. They don't go away. They just sneak into some corner of your system and kick back in when your defenses are down. He took her hand, fisted it in his, and brought it to his lips. I've been trying to get used to this one. And how are you doing? Better now. He lowered his brow to hers. Christ, what timing. We should be home alone. It doesn't matter. She tilted her head so that her lips brushed his. We'll make up for it when we are. When he deepened the kiss, she sank into it. How can everything be such a mess and this be so right? Luck of the draw. He eased back and looked into her eyes. We'll make sure it stays right. This is enough for now. Gently, she lifted a hand to his cheek. This is better than enough. The first thing Tipton noticed when the couple climbed out of the fancy foreign car in his driveway was that they were lovers. The man did no more than lay a hand on the woman's shoulder. She did no more than glance up, smile, but Tipton pegged it. The second thing he noticed was that the woman was almost a dead ringer for Naomi, or the Naomi he had put behind bars. Oh, there were subtle differences, and his trained eye nailed them as well. The daughter's mouth was softer, a tad more generous. The cheekbones were slightly less prominent, the walk more fluid. Naomi's gait had been an energetic, even a nervous scissoring of legs, one that had drawn the eye of every male within a mile of her. But all in all, he was glad Kelsey Biden had called first. It would have been a shock to have glanced up and seen her strolling up his walk like the ghost of the woman he'd never forgotten. Captain Tipton? Her smile was fleeting as her gaze shifted. Lieutenant Rossi, I wasn't expecting to see you here. Small world, isn't it? Irritating her only amused him, and he helped himself to another beer. He wasn't on duty, after all. Why don't I make the introductions? Kelsey Biden and Gabriel Slater, my former commanding officer, Captain James Tipton. Roscoe here was always one for procedure. Tipton grinned as Kelsey lifted a brow at the nickname. Sit down, have a beer. Mr. Slater doesn't drink, Rossi put in. Oh, well, I think the wife brewed up some iced tea. Why don't you go in, in Roscoe, and pour our company a couple of glasses? That would be nice. Pleased to put Rossi in the position of serving, Kelsey made herself comfortable on the top step. I appreciate your taking the time to see us, Captain. No problem. I got nothing but time. How's your mother getting on? Very well. You remember her, then? I'm not likely to forget. But he shifted tactics, preferring to get a lay of the land. Roscoe tells me congratulations are in order, Mr. Slater. You've got a horse that might cop the triple crown. Not that I know a lot about it. Baseball's my game. Gabe knew something about tactics as well. 
My money's on the birds this year. They got a solid pitching rotation and an infield so tight you can barely squeeze a mosquito through it. They do. Delighted, Tipton slapped his knee. By sweet Jesus, they do. You see them tromp the jays last night, goddamn Canadians. Gabe grinned, slipped out a cigar. I caught the last couple of innings. He offered one to Tipton, lit it for him. That last triple took fifty out of my assistant trainer's pocket and put it into mine. Tipton puffed. I'm not a betting man myself. Gabe flicked on his lighter at the tip of his own cigar, watched Tipton over the flame. I am. He blew out smoke, nodded when Rossi came back with two tall glasses. Thanks. Roscoe's a football fan. I never could educate him into the thinking man sport. I'm beginning to develop an interest in the sport of kings. Rossi took his seat again. I'll have my eye on the Belmont, Mr. Slater. A lot of us will. Now, the lady didn't come here to talk sports. Tipton offered Kelsey a friendly smile. You're here about murder. What can you tell me about Alec Bradley, Captain? He pursed his lips. She'd surprised him. He'd been sure she would focus on her mother. Intrigued, he shifted gears and turned back the clock. Alec Bradley, 32, formerly of Palm Beach. He'd been married once to a woman, oh, 15 years a senior. She paid him off with a nice settlement in the divorce. Apparently, he'd worked his way through most of it by the time he met your mother. What did he do? Charmed the ladies. Tipton shrugged. Sponged off acquaintances. Played the horses when he could. He owned his own tuxedo. Tipton paused for a sip of beer. He was killed in it. You didn't like him, Kelsey commented. To amuse himself and to help align his thoughts with his words, Tipton blew three smoke rings. He was dead when I met him, but no. From what the investigation turned up on him, he wasn't the kind of man I'd ask home for dinner. He made dallying with married women, rich married women, a profession. They'd pay him off with money and presents, introductions to other restless married women. If they didn't pay him enough, he'd use blackmail. In my day, we called them gigolos. I don't know what you call them now. Slime, Gabe said pleasantly, and earned an approving nod from the captain. Slater had taste, he decided, in women and cigars. That says it well enough. The man had a way about him. Fancy manners, fancy education, a family line that went back to some puffed-up English earl. And he had that way with women, married women who couldn't afford scandal. My mother was separated, Captain. And in the middle of a custody suit, she couldn't afford the carryings-on with Bradley to come out if she wanted to win it. But she saw him publicly. Socially, Tipton agreed. It didn't seem to bother her that people assumed they were lovers. No one could prove it. He tapped cigar ashes into the crushed can of Bud. There were rumors about Bradley sniffing expensive white powder up his nose. No one proved that either, till he was dead. Drugs. Kelsey paled, but continued. My mother said nothing about drugs. I didn't read anything about them in the newspaper reports. No drugs at Three Willows. Tipton sighed. Her eyes, so much like her mother's, were taking him back. The place was clean. Your mother was clean. Bradley had a mixture of alcohol and cocaine in his system when he died. If that's true, he could have been irrational, violent, just as my mother said. There weren't any signs of struggle. The lace of your mother's nightgown was torn. He touched a hand to his chest. She had a couple of bruises. Nothing she couldn't have done herself. If she did that herself, why didn't she knock over a few tables, break some lamps? Smart girl, he thought. I asked myself, and her, that same question. And what did she say? The first time we were sitting downstairs, they were still taking pictures in the bedroom. She'd put on a big robe over her nightgown, as if she'd been cold, Tipton remembered, as if she'd been shivering under that heavy quilted material. When I asked her, she snapped right back. Maybe I didn't think of it. He smiled, shook his head. Pissed at me is what she was. Those were the kind of answers she gave until her lawyer shut her up. The second time I asked her was in the interrogation room. She was smoking, one cigarette after the other, practically eating them whole. 
When I asked her again, she said she wished she'd thought of it. She wished she had, because then someone might believe her. He set his beer aside and sighed deeply. And you know, Miss Biden, the thing was, just like I told Rusko here before you drove up, I did believe her. Kelsey unfolded legs she could no longer feel and forced herself to stand. You believed her? You believed she was telling the truth, but you sent her to prison? I believed her, Tipton repeated, and his eyes narrowed, focused. Cop's eyes. But the evidence was against her. I spent a lot of sleepless nights looking for something to weigh on the other side. All I had was my gut. I did my job, Miss Biden. I arrested her, I booked her. I presented the evidence at her trial. That's what I had to do. Is that how you live with it? Kelsey held her fists at her sides. You knew she was telling the truth. I believed, Tipton corrected. That's a long way from knowing. Well, Roscoe, that took me back a few. Tipton watched the Jaguar back out of the drive, then set his chair to creaking again. How many times do you see real gray eyes? No green in them, no blue, just smoke. You don't forget eyes like that. Naomi Chadwick got to you, Captain. That doesn't mean she was telling the truth. Oh, she got to me. I was a happily married man, Roscoe. Never once caught any action on the side. But I thought about Naomi Chadwick. Did I believe her because she played some elemental tune on my libido? He sighed, shrugged, and crushed his second can of beer. I don't know. I was never sure. The DA was pushing for an arrest. He wanted that trial. And the evidence was there, so I did my job. Rossi studied his second bud. What did you think of Charles Rooney? A P.I.? He was a hot dogger. There were plenty of fancy names on his client list back then, mostly divorce cases. I leaned on him, and he stuck to his story. He had the film, he had his reports, and the Biden's lawyers backed him up. He witnessed a murder and didn't report it. We pressed that button, claimed he was shaken up. A guy thinks he's going to snap pictures of a bout of hot sex, gets murder instead. Allegedly, he was still sitting in his car when the black and whites arrived. He logged the time down to the minute. Then waited three days to bring in the film. Tipton wiggled his wiry eyebrows. How deep are you digging here, Roscoe? As deep as it takes. He set the half-full beer on the porch between his feet and leaned forward, hands on knees. Twenty-three years ago, you've got a dead horse in a race, drugs, a suicide, and a murder. Now we've got a murder, a suspicious death with the earmarks of suicide, a dead horse in a race, and drugs. Does the pendulum swing like that, Captain, or does it get a shove? You're a good cop, Roscoe. Like a veteran fire horse tipped and quivered at the sound of the bell. How many of the players are around on this swing? That's what we need to find out. Maybe you could take some time out from your workshop and give me a hand with the research. Tipton's smile was slow and settled comfortably on his round face. I could probably work it into my schedule. That's what I'd hoped you'd say. The jockey who hanged himself. Benedict Morales, Benny. Maybe you could flesh him out for me. Kelsey straightened in her seat when Gabe drove through the gates at Longshot. Gabe, I should just go home. I'm not good company. No, you're not. He braked, turned off the ignition. And I figure you might as well have your explosion here rather than at Three Willows where you'd have to explain it to Naomi. I'm just so angry. She bounded out of the car and slammed the door. He believed her, but he sent her to prison. Cops don't send you to prison, darling. Juries do. Believe me, I've been there. The point is she spent ten years behind bars. Isn't that the point? The point, he said, taking her arm and steering her into the house, is that that part's done. You can't change it. How much are you willing to risk to turn back the clock and prove it was a mistake? Stunned, she stared at him. Risk? What's the matter with you? The risk doesn't count. It doesn't matter. What happened to her was wrong. It has to be put right. Black and white. There was a twist in her gut, one quick churn. And if it is? Then it is, he said simply. But don't overlook the gray areas, Kelsey. 
Not everything you find out if you go on with this is going to fit neatly into one column or the other. She stepped back from him, and the distance was much wider than the simple movement. You want me to stop. I want you to be prepared. Four? Deliberately he closed the distance, cupping her stiff shoulders in his hands. Not everyone you care about is perfect, and not everyone who matters to you is going to thank you for sweeping away two decades' worth of dust. She shrugged irritably in a fruitless attempt to dislodge his hands. I'm aware that Naomi wasn't, isn't, a saint. I don't expect perfection, Slater, or look for it, but I want the truth. Fine, as long as you can handle it when you get it. No use trying to shake me off, he said, and smiled when she shoved at his hands. The first truth you're going to have to swallow is that you're stuck with the cards you've been dealt. You and I are going to play out this hand. I'm not trying to shake you off. I just need to think about what to do next. I can help you with that, he urged her closer, those clever hands slipping down her back, cruising up again. You're going to relax, take a swim. I don't have a suit with me. Darling, I'm counting on that. He was kissing her now in a way that always turned her mind to fluff. After, I'm going to talk you into trying out some of those culinary skills you once bragged about. Relaxing seemed like an excellent idea. With a little murmur of pleasure, she turned her head to ease his access to her neck. You want me to cook for you? I do. Then I want to take you upstairs and seduce you. What are you doing now? This is just a preview. Tomorrow, when you're relaxed and your mind's clear, we'll start thinking again. It sounds sensible. He nipped his way back up to her mouth. It wasn't particularly fair, he knew, to keep certain ideas to himself. But he wanted to clear the tension out of her face and to celebrate the fact that they'd found each other. For one night, he wanted them both to concentrate on only that. Let's be sensible. He stepped back, sliding his hands down her arms until they were linked with hers. I love you. Her heart took one long, slow turn in her breast. How can I argue with that? Chapter 21 In the rosy light of dawn, Moses watched the mares lead their babies to water. He knew the pecking order as well as they. Big Bess, with an arrogant swish of her tail, was first, always. Then Carmen, the hard-headed red, followed by True Heart, and so on down the line until shy, self-effacing Sonny. The foals scampered with them, frisky and secure. Unaware, Moses thought, that in a few short weeks they would be weaned and separated from Mama in the next step toward their destinies. Some would be trained for the track. Some would be sold at yearling auctions. One might show a different promise and be culled out as a jumper or for the show ring. Moses wasn't much on show horses himself. It seemed as shallow to his mind as beauty pageants. Some would be gelded, others bred. And one, maybe one, would show the mark of a true champion. There was always another derby, he told himself, always another chance for that win. Maybe that one, the little chestnut with the blaze, the one with the cocky tilt to his head. Naomi had named him Tomorrow's Arrogance because of it. He had the lines, the breeding, and time would tell if he had the heart. In his own breast, Moses's heart was heavy. He'd put too much on the line at the derby. He knew better. Both sides of his heritage warned against testing the gods. Yet he had tested them, putting all of his hopes, all of his heart, into one two-minute race. And the cost had been staggering. "'They're beautiful, aren't they?' Kelsey murmured from behind him. "'It's hard to believe that in another year they'll be ready for the saddle.' Moses tucked his hands into his front pockets and kept his eyes on the folds. "'So you decided to show up?' I'm sorry, I'm a little late. A little late today, half a day yesterday, and the day before that. There were some things I had to take care of. Things? He turned to her, knowing he was about to take out some of his frustration on her, certain she deserved it. Only one thing comes first for anybody who works here, and that's the horses. He strode off toward the barn, with Kelsey trotting guiltily after him. I'm sorry, Moses, really, it was unavoidable. Her heels dug in when he stopped abruptly in front of her and swung about. Listen, little girl, this isn't one of your playgrounds. You don't get to call time here and tie your shoe. What you do is you pull your weight all day, every day, 
because if you don't, someone else has to pick up the slack. That's not the way I run things. Just what were you doing yesterday when you should have been with your horse, when you should have been taking your orders from the yearling manager? I was... Kelsey all but sawed at her tongue. It was personal business. From now on, you get your hair fluffed and your nails painted on your own time. I'm not wasting mine. You've got stalls to muck. But I... I need to work with honor. She's already on the lunge. You can cool her off when she's done. Now get a shovel. He strode away, disappearing inside his office. Grooms and stable hands, who'd stopped to listen, immediately got back to work. Everyone enjoyed a public flogging, but no one liked to get caught watching one. "'Well, you've been accepted.' Naomi stepped up to Kelsey and ran a comforting hand up and down her spine. "'He wouldn't have spoken to you that way unless he considered you part of the team.' "'He might have slapped me down privately,' Kelsey muttered. "'And God damn it, I wasn't getting my hair done. Look at these!' Incensed, she fanned out her fingers, the nails short, clipped, unpolished. "'Does it look like I've had a manicure recently? I'm not here to play. Just because I needed a few hours off—' She stopped, swore again. "'It was important to me. Sometimes we can forget there's anything else going on in the world that doesn't happen right here. You're under no obligation to throw yourself into this.' "'The fact is, most owners aren't nearly so involved with the day-to-day work. "'If you'd rather... "'You don't think I can handle it.' "'Color bloomed and rode high on Kelsey's cheeks. "'You don't think I can see it through.' "'I'm not saying that, Kelsey. "'Aren't you? "'Why should this be any different? "'I've always moved from job to job, interest to interest. "'Why should anyone believe that I can stick, "'that this means any more than writing ad copy "'or explaining impressionist art to tour groups?' If I can give up on everything else, why shouldn't I give up on this? She tossed back her hair. Because it is different. Because everything's different. Turning on her heel, she stalked to the barn. Naomi only sighed. It was, she realized, a surefire way to forget your own troubles when two people you loved dumped their own at your feet. Gauging temperaments, she decided that Kelsey could use some time wielding a pitchfork to cool off, so she started with Moses. He was at his desk, barking on the phone to Reno's agent. No, I'm not putting him up at Belmont. He's not ready, and Corelli rode high water to place in the Preakness. He knows the colt, and he deserves a ride. Yeah, that's final. He slammed the phone down, cutting off the voice yammering through the receiver. I'm not putting up a spook jockey with a bum shoulder. I agree with you. Ready to placate, she sat on the corner of his desk. And so does Reno. He knows he's not ready. In a gesture she hoped would serve as truce, she covered his hand with hers. Weren't you a little rough on Kelsey out there? His face closed, and Moses drew his hand away. Are you here as her owner or as her mother? I'm here, Moses, she said, and left it at that. I know she's taken some time off recently, just as I know that something's troubling her. Just, she continued quietly, as I know something's troubling you. Let's stick with one issue, Naomi. He pushed back from the desk. She's been slacking off, so maybe the bloom's faded. Puzzled, she studied his face. Not just annoyed, she realized, but worried. And maybe she just had some loose ends to tie up. We can't forget the fact that she's had to make a lot of adjustments in a very short time. I thought you were happy, even impressed with her work up until now. Up until now, he agreed. I've been anything but happy and impressed the last few days. She needed a shot and I gave her one. Maybe you've forgotten that's one of the things I do around here, if you want her treated differently. I didn't say that. Annoyance snapped into her voice. But I know you, Moses. You don't slap someone down like that in public for a couple of infractions. So who's decided to treat her differently? He turned so that they faced each other with the desk between them. As far as I see it, that's a girl who's gotten pretty much everything she wants her whole life. She's spoiled, she's reckless, and she's used to coming and going as she pleases. Just like I was. He acknowledged that with a nod. Some. But you finished what you started, Naomi. Maybe this is the first time she's found something worth finishing. And maybe she's getting bored and is going to pack her bags. Do you think I don't know what it's going to do to you if she turns away now? The chill had Naomi hugging her arms. You're the one who told me she wasn't going to do that. Maybe I was wrong. 
Maybe I was just so damn happy to see you smile all the way again. Everything seemed to be moving in the right direction, and then... Disgusted, he dropped back into the chair, scrubbed his hands over his face. God damn it, she got in my way at the wrong time. What is it, Moses? She reached for him again. This time he gripped her hand. The gods laugh, Naomi, especially when you forget that they can step in at any time and snatch away what you want most. I've had my heart broke before. He looked up at her again, smiled a little. You did it first, but it's been a while. I'd forgotten how much it hurts. Pride, she murmured. You let me do all the grieving over him. Miserable, he looked down at the joined hands. I missed something, Naomi. I had myself so revved up about winning that I had to be careless, even for a minute. It cost too much. You can grieve, Moses, but you can't take the blame. That was my horse, Naomi. His eyes cut back to hers. Your name might be on the papers, but he was mine. And I lost him. I wasn't looking in the right place at the right time. I didn't sense what I should have sensed. Even now I go back over that day. I go back and back and back, and I can't see it. It had to be under my nose. He wrapped a fist against the desk. Under my fucking nose. There was, she knew, only one way to handle him in a mood like this. Okay, White Tree, it was all your fault. You were in charge. I pay you to train my horses, to know them, to understand them, and to guide them from birth to death. I also pay you to oversee the men, to hire and fire, and to decide which team works for which horse for which race. It looks as though I've also been paying you to foretell the future. She cocked her head. Since that's the case, I don't know whether to fire you or give you a raise. I'm serious about this. So am I. She rose and skirted the desk to knead his knotted shoulders. I want to know what happened, Moses. I want to know who did it, and I want them to pay. What I don't want and can't afford is to have you, someone I love and depend on, losing heart. We've got less than eleven months to the first Saturday in May. Yeah. He blew out a stream of breath. I guess I should go apologize to that girl of yours. Leave it. She can take a lump. He smiled again. She wanted to give me a few. Christ, she's got your eyes. I don't have a lot of regrets about things I haven't done, Naomi. In fact, I can count the big ones on one hand. I've never made a pilgrimage to Israel, never walked in the footsteps of my ancestors on either side, and I never made a child with you. Her hands stopped, and he reached back and gripped them hard. I'm sorry. No. She lowered her head so that her cheek rested on his hair. Don't be. Why are there so seldom second chances on the big ones, Moses? Rich was thinking the same thing. Second chances were as rare as hen's teeth. It was a lucky man who could snare one. Rich Slater was a lucky man. He put two grand on the trifecta at Laurel and moseyed back to the bar. Mostly trifectas were a sucker's game, but he was on a roll. Sticking with the ponies, he thought. The hell with cards, fuck point spreads. The horses were his babies now. He ordered another bourbon, his new sentimental drink of choice, then drew out a five-dollar cigar. The lighter that flared under it caused his brows to rise. Rich puffed the cigar into life, then swiveled to smile affably at his son. Well, now, just like old times. Bring my boy here one of the same, he ordered the bartender. Gabe merely held up a finger. Coffee, black. Shit. Rich drew the word out to three syllables. Don't be such a pussy boy. I'm buying. Coffee, Gabe repeated, then studied his father. He knew the signs. Flushed cheeks, bright eyes, big toothy smile. Rich Slater was not only half drunk, he had money in his pocket. I thought you had trouble coming out from Chicago. Got that all straightened out. Don't you worry about me, Gabe. Everybody knows old Rich Slater's good for his markers. Oh? Gabe lifted a brow. I thought the trouble had something to do with dealing from the bottom of the deck. Was that what he'd told the boy, Rich wondered, and searched back through his soggy memory. Well, it didn't matter. Just a difference of opinion, that's all. All tidied up now. This here's my race. 
He gestured toward the monitor. Number three, he muttered. Yeah, number three. Gabe glanced up at the screen just as the gate sprang open. I've heard you've been playing the track again. Come on, baby, hug that rail. Where'd you hear that? Here and there, somebody spotted you at Churchill Downs on Derby Day. Rich continued to watch the race, urging his horse on with little jerks of his body. His mind was working, though, picking carefully through the minefield Gabe was setting for him. He's got it! He's got it! Now come on, wire! Ha, son of a bitch, I can pick him. Pleased that the first horse on his ticket had come in a winner, he signaled for another drink. I got the touch, Gabe. I've always had the touch. What kind of touch did you have in Kentucky last month? Kentucky? The broad, amiable grin only widened. I haven't been down in Kentucky for, oh, five, six years or more. Should have stuck with the horses, though, that's the truth. I saw you myself the morning of the race. Not by a flicker did Rich show reaction. His eyes stayed on his son's. I don't think so, buddy boy. I've got me a nice set of rooms outside Baltimore. All the action I need is within an easy drive. Pimlico, Laurel, Charlestown. Now, maybe you're thinking of Pimlico, the Preakness. I was there, sure was, he winked. Have some money down on your colt, too. You didn't let me down. Maybe, seeing as I'm rolling hot, I'll take a trip up to Belmont. Think you can cop the whole crown, do you, Gabe? You do. We'll have ourselves a real celebration. There was trouble at the Derby. I know about that. Shocked I was, too, sitting in my room watching it on TV. Crying shame to see a horse go down that way. He shook his head sadly over his drink. Damn shame. But then it didn't hurt you any, did it? Somebody helped that horse go down. Lips pursed around his cigar, Rich nodded. Now, I heard about that, too. Nasty business. Christ knows it happens. He reached for the beer nuts, popped two into his mouth. Gabe noticed he was wearing a ring on his pinky, little diamonds shaped into a dollar sign. Oh, not as much as it used to, Rich went on. Harder to get away with pumping a horse up with chemicals these days. He puffed out smoke, amusing himself by stringing Gabe along. Now, back in the days when your granddaddy and me used to play the ponies, there were plenty of tricks. Didn't have so many tests then, so many fucking rules on the horses and the jocks. But that was forty years ago and more. He sighed reminiscently. Too bad you never got to know your granddaddy, Gabe. Too bad he got a bullet in the brain over a difference of opinion. That's the truth, Rich said with no sarcasm. He was a man who'd loved his daddy. It's like I always try to teach you, son. Sometimes cheating's just part of the game. It's a matter of skill and timing. And sometimes it's a matter of murder. A horse, a man. One's not so different from the other to some people. Some horses I've locked better than some men. I remember another race in Lexington. I was just a kid. Gabe picked up his cooling coffee, watching his father over the rim. But I remember you were nervous. It wasn't that hot. The bluegrass stakes is in the spring. But you were sweating a lot. You had me work in the stands, looking for loose change, panhandling. Horse broke down that day, too. Happens. He turned back to the monitor. Despite the chill from the air conditioning, the back of his neck was damp. I've seen it happen plenty in my day. It was a Chadwick horse then, too. No shit. Well, that's bad luck. Hey, can't you see I'm dry here? Rich slapped a hand on the bar. A jockey hanged himself over it. As I recall, we didn't stick around long after that race. A few days, that's all. That was funny, too, because our room was paid up. Itchy feet, I've always had them. You were flush after that. The money didn't last long, it never did, but you had a nice fat roll when we headed out. I must have bet some winners that day. You're on a roll now, too, aren't you? New suit, gold watch, diamond ring. He picked up Rich's hand. Manicure. You got a point here, boy. Braced against the stench of bourbon, Gabe leaned closer. His voice was low, icily controlled. You'd better hope I don't find out you were in Kentucky on the first Saturday in May. 
You don't want to threaten me, Gabe. Oh, yes, I do. With fear and rage circling through his system, Rich picked up his fresh drink. You want to back off is what you want to do. You want to let things lie and get your mind on that horse you're running next week. Keep your mind on that and on that pretty blonde filly you're banging. In a flash, Gabe had a hand wrapped around the knot of his father's new silk tie. The bartender hustled over. We don't want any trouble here. No trouble, Rich grinned into Gabe's face. No trouble at all. Just family discussion. That's a prime piece you're putting it to, son. Blue blood. I bet a thoroughbred like that's got plenty of kick and lots of endurance. Maybe it's time she met your dear old daddy. Gabe's hand ached with the pressure of making a fist. The fist ached to connect. Yet no matter how repugnant, there was no escaping the fact that the man was his father. Keep away from her, Gabe said quietly. Or I'll kill you. We both know you haven't got the guts for that. But we'll make a deal. You keep out of my business, I keep out of yours. Rich smoothed down his tie when Gabe allowed him to jerk free. Otherwise, I might just have me a nice long talk with your pretty lady. I bet we'd have lots to talk about. Keep away from what's mine. Gabe took out a bill and put it on the counter beside the coffee he'd barely tasted. Keep far away from what's mine. Kids! Rich beamed a fresh smile at the nervous bartender when Gabe strode away. They just never learn respect. He picked up his drink, tried to ignore the fact that his hand was unsteady. Sometimes you just gotta pound it into them, he muttered. Nursing his drink, he turned back to the monitor and waited for his horse to come in. It was nearly dusk when Kelsey walked out of the barn for the last time. She'd put in a back-breaking twelve hours, hauling manure and straw, scrubbing down concrete, polishing tack. Now every muscle in her body was weeping. All she wanted was a blissfully hot bath and oblivion. Want a beer? Moses sat on a barrel, two cold bottles dangling from his fingers. He'd been waiting for her. No, she gave him a nod as frosty as the bruise. Thanks. Kelsey, he held the bottle up. I couldn't find my peace pipe. Reluctant, she gave in and accepted one. She'd have preferred a gallon of water, but the beer washed away the taste of dirt and sweat just as well. Moses narrowed his eyes at the purpling bruise on her upper arm. What happened there? Pacer take a bite? That's right, so? You're not going to be able to stay pissed off at me for long. I'm too charming. Kelsey drank again. No, you're not. Works with your mother, he grumbled. Listen, I think you screwed up, and I let you know it. Now I'm telling you you've done a good job, and not just today, for the most part. For the most part. That's right. You learn fast, and you don't make the same mistake twice, but you still need somebody looking over your shoulder. You've got a temperament problem. But we're used to that around here, between the horses and your mother. My... Her jaw dropped. My mother? She can be a mule when it suits her. Not that she flies off the handle much now, the way she did when she was younger. I'm sorry about that sometimes. He looked down at his boots. Damn sorry about that. It's not that they broke her, but they changed her. Toughened her, I guess, so she learned how to pull in. I came down on you today more because of her than because of the job. I don't understand. If you turn away from her now, it'll kill her. She wouldn't want me to say it, but I'm saying it. There's nothing that means more to me in this world than Naomi. I don't want to see her hurt again. I'm not turning away. I'm not trying to hurt her. That may be a lot for you to take on faith, but I wish you would. I wish you could. You know, I figure anybody who can purge a horse and not run for cover has got to be trusted. See you in the morning. Sure. She started away, then looked over her shoulder. It's a pretty evening. It is that. Women like to walk in the moonlight. I've heard that. There should be plenty of it in a couple of hours. Satisfied, Kelsey continued toward the house. She'd done her job all around, she decided. Now she was going to let Gertie stuff her with anything available in the kitchen, then soak out all the aches in a marathon bath. 
An hour later, she was dozing amid a swirl of bubbles and scent. Her world had smoothed out again. She was in the middle of a lazy yawn when the door opened. Gabe! Flustered, she scooted up, spewing froth dangerously close to the rim of the tub. What are you doing? Gertie told me I'd find you up here. He hooked his thumbs in his belt loops and simply enjoyed the view. I was going to get you and bring you home with me, but it doesn't look like you're dressed for the ride. I often bathe naked. It's a habit of mine. How about I wash your back? and any other hard-to-reach places. I can handle it. She pushed her hair out of her eyes and struggled not to give in to the urge to cross her arms over her bubble-bedecked breasts. Listen, why don't you wait downstairs until I'm finished? He considered, then shook his head and began unbuttoning his shirt. Nope, I'm coming in. You are not! We're in my mother's house, for God's sake. She's not here. That's not the point. Hurriedly, she scooped her bangs out of her eyes. Keep that shirt on, Slater. Grease downstairs, she hissed. She'll have to stay there. There isn't room in that tub for the three of us. He tossed his shirt aside and sat down to pry off his boots. It's not a joke. It's just not appropriate. I need you, Kelsey. Her protest turned into a sigh. She could see it now, the tension in the set of his shoulders. It was all but coming off him in waves. Damn it, she murmured. Lock the door. I already did. His jeans joined hers on the floor. Then he was easing himself into the steamy water behind her. His arms encircled her waist. He buried his face in her hair. God. He drew in her scent, wallowed in her texture while he fought off the fury that had roiled inside him since the confrontation with his father. He needed it to go away, just for an hour. She could do that for him. She could do anything for him. Gabe, tell me what's wrong. Shh. He slicked his hands up to the slippery curve of her breasts, skimmed wet fingertips over her nipples. Just let me touch you. I only need to touch you. He drowned her in tenderness. He'd never been so gentle before, so patient, so careful. With her leaning against him, he did only what he'd said he'd needed. Only touched her, fingers sliding along a long thigh, skimming down from knee to calf, flowing up again to dip inside her so that the heat melted her bones. Shuddering, she tried to turn to face him, but he pressed her back. Not yet. His mouth danced over her glistening shoulder along the nape of her neck, where falling tendrils curled damply. So she surrendered more completely than she had before, letting his hands take her where he chose. Water lapped, bubbles dissolved. Each time she climaxed, felt her body tighten, tremble, explode. She was sure it was the last. Yet he slowly, patiently, quietly built a new fire. She could float on the smoke of it, drift, deaf to her own throaty moans. When at last he shifted her, letting water spill carelessly over the rim, over the tiles, she sank back through the clouds of smoke into the flames. Chapter 22 That horse was not going to win. Rich helped himself to Cunningham's scotch. After all, a man shouldn't get himself hung up on one kind of liquor, or one kind of woman, or one kind of game. The boy had never understood that, he thought, as he downed a double and poured another. He had never been able to teach that little son of a bitch anything. Well, he was going to teach him now, good and proper. There would be no triple crown this year, no indeed. He was going to see to that. He'd come to do a job, and if it turned out it had the benefit of a little personal revenge, so much the better. He settled into Cunningham's easy chair, propped his shiny new Gucci loafers on the footstool, and smiled. This was a life for him, all right, lord of the manor. A fine house in the country, a couple of spiffy cars in the garage, a hungry woman in bed. He was going to have it, too. Once he tied up this last loose end, he was taking his winnings out to Vegas. They knew him in Vegas. Yes, sir, they knew good old Richie Slater in that town. He'd be a high roller, penthouse suite at Caesars, a top-heavy babe hanging on his arm. When he'd cleaned up there, he'd buy himself a house. Maybe right in Nevada, come to that. One of those fancy digs with cactus and palm trees and a pool in the backyard. Then when the urge struck him or the level got low in his billfold, 
he'd just slip on into town and clean up again. He sat there, dreaming a bit about a wheel that always spun to his tune and cards that fell like angels into his hand. What the hell are you doing? Flushed and breathless, Cunningham stood in the doorway. Rather than the commanding tone he'd hoped for, his voice came out in a squeak. Hey there, belly boy. All finished talking with your partners? Word is you're syndicating that filly for a million flat. That's my business. The deal was nearly set, and nothing, nothing, he promised himself, was going to interfere. There was a loan to pay off, and it was nearing deadline. You got your money, Slater. You and I are done. Lips puckered, Rich contemplated his last swallow of scotch. Now nah, that's downright unfriendly, Billy. What are you doing in my house? Can an old pal drop by for a visit? He grinned guilelessly. That pretty little bedwarmer of yours was a lot more welcoming when she let me in. On her way out shopping, she said, down to Neiman Marcus. Needless markup, that is. Get it? He chuckled at his own wit. Marla, Cunningham said with what dignity he could muster, is my wife. No shit. After slapping himself on the knee, Rich rose to pour another drink. Caught yourself a ball and chain with first-class tits, did you? Well, congratulations, Billy boy. You're a bigger fool than anybody could have guessed. If he wasn't a fool now, Cunningham thought, he'd certainly been one when he'd slid back into a deal with Rich Slater. But now, and from now on, everything was legitimate. The syndication deal, which Cunningham had just shaken hands on down at his barn, was every bit as big as Rich had heard. So it was time, way past the time, to cut old ties. All of them. I'm going to ask you to leave Rich. We're square, you and me, and it isn't smart for us to be seen together. Nobody here but you and me. Rich winked and settled back in the chair again. Oh, he knew what Cunningham was thinking. Yes, indeed, he did. Billy Boy figured he didn't need good old Rich any more. Now, don't you worry. I'm not here to squeeze you for more money. You just rest easy on that. It pacified him a little. What is it, then? A favor, that's all. Just a favor between old friends and former business associates. There's a horse that needs to be taken care of, Bill. He lifted his glass, enjoying the way the sun burst through the window and struck the facets. I don't want any part of it. What you want and what you've got are two different things. He shifted his eyes from his glass to Cunningham. I'm going to take out my son's coat, Billy, and you're going to help me. You're crazy. Shaken, Cunningham swiped the sweat beating on his upper lip. You're crazy, Rich, and I don't want anything to do with it. Let's talk about that, Rich said and smiled. Kelsey's suitcases were neatly packed and lined up next to Gabe's by the bedroom door. They would leave for New York at 7 a.m. sharp. Six hours from now, she thought as she gazed up through the skylight over the bed. She sighed, shifted, and snuggled up against Gabe. It struck her, amazed her as it always did, to find him there. Warm, solid, hers. That body. She skimmed her fingers down his chest, up again. Long and hard and tireless. The face that could make her toes curl every time he looked at her. And that was only the shell. A terrific shell, she mused, tracing his jaw with her fingertip. But what was inside it was equally impressive. The strength, the kindness, the courage. He'd already beaten the odds time and time again, overcoming a birthright of misery and meanness to make it on his own. Right now, sleeping in his place of honor in the barn was a horse who had the same kind of strength and courage. Together they were going to make history. "'It's no use,' she murmured, nuzzling her lips against his throat. Mm. Automatically he stroked a hand down her back. He'd been enjoying the lazy caress of her fingertips for some time. I can't sleep. I'm too revved. Well, then. Always willing to accommodate, he rolled her over so that she was stretched on top of him. Enjoy yourself. She chuckled, wiggling away. That's not what I meant. Kneeling, she looked down at him, letting herself linger over the long silhouette. Not that it isn't a tempting offer. Leaning down, she gave him a smacking kiss. I'll take you up on it when I get back. He made a grab but she was already scrambling off the bed. Get back from where? I need to walk. 
I want to look in on double. She tugged jeans over naked legs and hips, made his mouth water. Darling, it's one o'clock in the morning. I know. Her head popped out of the opening of a baggy T-shirt. In a little over eight hours, we'll be at Belmont. So who can sleep? Tossing back her hair, she pulled on boots. He could have, but it seemed a moot point. I'll come with you. You don't have to. I won't be long. He sat up, raked a hand through his hair. I'll come with you. Okay, catch up with me. She dashed out the door and down the stairs. It was a perfect June night, warm, just a little breezy, star shattered. She heard the long, double-toned hoot of an owl, smelled roses and night-blooming jasmine. Moonlight showered on the outbuildings, lending them a timeless fairy tale aura. Perhaps this was her fairy tale, she thought, her personal happily ever after. It was true that tragedy had brought her here, opened the door to her future, but fairy tales were rife with tragedy. Orphans and spellbound princes, betrayals and sacrifices, evil intent and lost loves. But right always triumphed. Maybe that was why the analogy appealed to her. If this was her fairy tale, she would see that right triumphed. She wouldn't give up on finding the truth. She would see Captain Tipton again, and Charles Rooney. She would talk to Gertie, to Moses, and yes, to Naomi. To anyone who had even the smallest role in the events leading to Alec Bradley's death, she would convince Naomi to allow her lawyers to speak freely. But for now, for the next week, there was only the Belmont, and she was part of it. With a quiet laugh, Kelsey lifted her face toward the sky. She had a place in the grandeur and the grit, the sweat and the seduction of racing's finest hour. In a week's time, she promised herself, she would watch Gabe and his spectacular colt accept the last jewel in the crown. A barn cat dashed across the path, his long, sleek form a gray bullet that shot her heart to her throat. Chuckling at herself, she rubbed a hand there as if to ease it back into her chest again. The stable door opened with a thin squeak. The smells came first, old friends rushing at her through the dark. Horse, leather, liniment, manure— Rather than turn on the lights and disturb those sleeping, she groped along the wall from memory and found a flashlight. Its beam cut a narrow swath. Her boot heels clicked after it. From the second stall, a pair of eyes gleamed goblin-like from the shadows. Her breath caught. The beam bubbled. Fairy tales indeed, she thought, and was grateful Gabe wasn't with her to see how she jumped at a couple of barn cats. She smiled when she saw the cot pulled in front of Double's box. The security system aside, a warrior like this merited a personal guard. Well, she wouldn't disturb the groom, she promised herself. Just one quick peek over the cot and into the box, and she'd leave them both sleeping. But the cot, she saw with some surprise, was empty. Alarmed, she shone her light into the box. Double was there, fully awake, staring back at her. Sorry, fella, I guess I'm jumpy. Did your friend here go off for a smoke or a call of nature? Are you all packed? She laughed and reached for the box door. It wasn't latched, was open fully three inches. Oh, God! A movement behind her had her swinging about, flashlight gripped like a weapon. The blood thundered in her ears as she zigzagged the beam and cursed the cats who hunted at night. But a cat, however quick and clever, hadn't unlatched and opened the stall door. Her one clear thought was to protect, to defend. Kelsey shoved the door open and rushed to the colt's side, even as she pivoted to shine her light into the corners of the box, the blood in her ears exploded. She was aware of one vivid flash of pain, the high, alarmed whinny from the colt, then nothing. While the figure dashed from the box, breath harsh and panicked, the colt danced, lethal hooves arching over Kelsey's unconscious form. Halfway between the house and the barn, Gabe balanced two mugs of tea, it appeared to him that they were going to be up most of the night, but the herbal brew Kelsey preferred was a better idea than coffee at this hour, particularly if he could coax her back into bed and channel her nervous energy into a more intimate arena. They hadn't been wasting much time on sleep in any case, he thought, not since the night he joined her in the tub. It had been tricky to convince her to move in with him for a few days. He'd shamelessly used the race as a reason for it, his need for some moral support. It worked, he reminded himself, grinning as he sipped from his mug. 
he intended for it to continue working, stage by stage, until it was a permanent condition. But he'd calculated that a woman still raw from a divorce needed to be eased into the idea of a second marriage. The biggest surprise was that he hadn't needed to be eased into the idea at all. It had simply appeared, full-blown in his mind, or maybe in his heart. He'd never given a great deal of thought to the traditional boundaries of marriage, wife, family. With an upbringing like his, the idea of it was absurd, even destructive. But not with Kelsey. With her he wanted the promise, the future, the chance. Together they would share all of this. He skimmed his gaze over the outbuildings, the hills, the fences. Together they would make more. And maybe, while they were doing it, they could help each other bury the past. The shrill, frenzied cry of the colt split the quiet. Both mugs shattered on the gravel as Gabe lunged forward. With Kelsey's name bursting from his lips, he dragged at the barn door, slapped the lights. Ice-edged panic chased him between the boxes, sliced nastily into his spine. She was sprawled on the straw, face down, the colt backed into the rear of the box, eyes rolling as he pawed his bedding. The world upended, draining the blood from Gabe's head out through the soles of his feet. He moved like lightning, shielding her with his own body as he gathered her up. He took a blow to the shoulder, unfelt as he lifted her. Her face was corpse-white, her body limp as rags. Ignoring the flailings of the colt, he laid her on the cot. His fingers trembled as he pressed them to the pulse at her throat. Please, baby, please. It was there, that quick flutter of life. He kept his fingers pressed to it, as if by removing them that life beat would drain away, and buried his face in her hair. There was only panic and relief, panic and relief, a bright and giddy pendulum swinging inside him. He stayed as he was, his fingers at her throat, his face in her hair, one arm cradling her. Gabe! Jesus Christ, Gabe! The frightened voice of his trainer snapped him back. He lifted his head and watched the somehow dreamlike movements of Jameson stepping into the box to calm the colt. Easy, boy. Easy now. Jameson dragged the colt's head down, using his voice and his hands to soothe. Settle down. But his eyes were anything but calm when they focused on Gabe. What happened here? Where's Kip? He's supposed to be bunking outside the box. I don't know where the hell he is, but you're going to find him. Find him and the fucking night watchman. Forcing himself to move slowly, Gabe ran his hands over Kelsey, checking for broken bones. He located the knot at the back of her head. His fingers lingered there, gentle as a kiss, while his eyes sliced back to Jameson and burned. Call a doctor and the cops now. She's hurt. Jameson continued to stroke the quivering colt. How bad? I don't know. Call, goddammit. As if in answer, Kelsey stirred under his hand and moaned. Kelsey. He had to yank himself back from snatching her up. Kelsey, take it slow. Gabe. Her eyes fluttered open, but her vision swam, touching off nausea. God, she closed them again, struggling to breathe evenly. Don't try to move yet. I'm not, believe me. She concentrated on moving air in and out of her lungs. When it seemed she had that down, she cautiously opened her eyes again. This time she brought his face into focus. There was murder in his eyes, she thought dimly, then remembered. The colt! Someone was in with the colt! It's all right, he's all right. Gabe cursed viciously when she winced in pain. I'm going to take you up to the house now. I'm going to take care of you. Somebody was in there. The groom was gone. The door was open. But I couldn't see who it was. Did they hurt him? No. Gabe glanced at Jameson, who was sliding the box door closed. Make the calls, Jamie. I want Lieutenant Rossi. I want Gunner, too. See that he gets out here and checks the colt over. He looks fine, Jameson began, but was already nodding. His eyes were bloodshot and strained. I'll get him here, Gabe. Take her on up. Do what you can do for her. I'll sit up myself with the colt tonight. I want two men on him. Gabe lifted Kelsey as carefully as a man handling spun glass. No less than two at any time. Is that understood? It is. And find Kip. I want to talk to him. All right. With a heavy heart, Jameson watched Gabe carry Kelsey outside. He turned to the colt, rubbed his weary eyes, then went to make the calls. I'm all right, really. But Kelsey kept her eyes closed on the trip from barn to house. Just a headache. Be quiet, Gabe told her, fighting to keep his voice light. Just rest. 
His jaw tightened as his boots crunched over bits of the shattered mugs. If he hadn't stopped to make the goddamn tea, if he'd been with her. Are you sure Double's all right? I didn't have a chance to see. Will you stop worrying about the fucking horse? It exploded out of him and unlocked the gates. Do you think I give a damn about that horse right now? I'd have killed him myself if he'd have hurt you. Gabe, shut up, goddammit. His face a mask of rage, he shoved the door open. She cringed, chiefly because his shouting caused her head to swim. There's no need to yell. You're entitled to be upset, but upset. He laid her down on the couch in the living room. The way his muscles were beginning to tremble, he wasn't certain he could carry her up the stairs. Is that what you think I am, upset? A little out of sorts, maybe, because someone knocked you senseless? Yeah, that's right, I'm upset. He fisted his hand and worked off a fraction of the emotions boiling inside him by ramming it into the wall. The words she'd been about to speak slid soundlessly down Kelsey's throat. She stared from the dent in the wall to his battered knuckles. I guess I'm upset because I found you unconscious in a stall with a panicked horse who might have trampled you to death at any minute. She hadn't thought of that, and the image it presented made her stomach lurch. She began to tremble. Gabe, don't. I was a little upset because I thought for a minute, the longest minute of my life, that you were already dead. The tears began to spill over. One, then two, then a stream. I guess upset was the wrong word. Christ! Abruptly hollowed out, he rubbed his hands over his face. But it didn't help. He went to her then, gathering her close, holding her when she curled into a ball on his lap. Christ, Kelsey, I lost my mind. He kissed her gently now, drying her cheeks with his lips. I'm sorry. Let me get you some ice. No, don't go. Just don't go. Okay. Let me see if you're hurt anywhere else. It's just my head. He must have been behind me. It was stupid to rush in that way, but I wasn't thinking. I saw the cot was empty, then that the stall door was open. All I could think of was what had nearly happened to him before. What happened to pride? Next time, think what would happen to me. He tipped her face up. I couldn't handle losing you. She took his hand, pressed his torn knuckles to her lips. I guess... We could both use some ice. Yeah. But they stayed where they were until Rossi knocked on the door. An hour later, Gabe walked back from the barn again, this time with Rossi at his side. You've got a hole in your security, Mr. Slater. I'm aware of that. A hole big enough, he thought, for someone to slip through when the night watchman made his hourly outside rounds. Someone could have come in from the outside, somebody who knows your setup here. You've got a lot of land, a lot of ways in and out. Rossi scanned through the dark. He didn't envy Gabe that. He much preferred his tidy apartment, the claustrophobia and comfort of the city. I like taking the easy way, he continued, and looking at the inside. Gabe was looking at the inside as well, at every hand he'd inherited from Cunningham, at every man and woman who had been hired on or fired in the ensuing five years. You've already got a list of everyone who works for me, "'Do whatever you have to do with it.' "'I intend to. "'I've arranged to have two men with the colt at all times. "'I'd be one of them myself, "'but I'm not willing to leave Kelsey any longer than necessary. "'I can't blame you for that.' "'Rossi paused. "'It was a pretty night, what was left of it. "'He might as well enjoy the breeze. "'She's toughing this out pretty well. "'I'd say she's taking her knock on the head "'better than your groom's taking his. "'Could be her head's harder.' They'd found Kip groaning back to consciousness in the empty box adjoining doubles. We didn't have any trouble shipping him off to the hospital. She'll be fine. Curious, Rossi brushed a shard of china with the toe of his shoe. I was carrying a couple of mugs when I heard the horse, Gabe explained. Guess I dropped them. Hmm. Like I said, she'll be fine. You're favoring your right shoulder. Instinctively, Gabe straightened it. It's nothing. The colt caught me. If it hadn't been his shoulder, it might have been Kelsey. Her head, her face. The thought roiled in his stomach. You've done a background check on me, haven't you, Rossi? Standard procedure. Then you know a little something about my father. Enough to know he wouldn't win any Daddy of the Year awards. He's in town. Has been for several weeks. Gabe spoke without inflection. 
he might have been discussing the weather. I'd say I was one of his first stops. I brushed him off with some money. Not nearly as much as he wanted. That tends to make him surly. He knows his way around the track, around the shed row. You think your father would try to hit you this way? He hates my guts, Gabe said simply. He'd hit at me any way he could, especially if he could make a profit at it. I thought I saw him at Churchill Downs during Derby Week. So did one of the grooms at Three Willows. I tracked him down at Laurel a couple of days ago. He denied it. Gabe reached for a cigar he didn't have. He's lying. Understanding the gesture, Rossi took out a pack of cigarettes, offered one. I'll check it out. You do that, Lieutenant. Gabe's eyes glowed steady in the flare of the match. And keep this in mind while you do. The odds are he knew Lipsky. Rich Slater's a man who likes to cheat. Winning the game's more fun for him that way. And he's been winning. He's flashing money around. I'll see if I can find out where he came by it. There was another race when I was a kid. A horse from this farm was running against a horse from Three Willows. Gabe drew smoke into his lungs, watched it drift away on the breeze when he exhaled. The Three Willows colt stumbled, shattered his legs, and had to put him down. My father flashed some money after that race, too. That would have been in Lexington, spring of 73. Gabe eyed Rossi through a cloud of smoke. That's right. That's exactly right. Funny you didn't mention this before. He didn't hurt Kelsey before. Excuse me. Matt Gunner strode up to them. His hair was still in sleep tufts. The coat's fine, Gabe. Good, I appreciate your coming out. That's no problem. Matt glanced toward the house. Kelsey? She's resting. The doctor advised a trip to the hospital, but she won't budge. I'd like to look in on her when she's up to it. Sure. He said his good nights, then turned back to Rossi. You'd better find him before I do. You don't have any proof your father was involved in any of this. Gabe tossed down the cigarette, crushed it out. I don't need to prove anything. Kelsey heard him coming up the steps and gingerly shifted to a sitting position. The pills the doctor had given her had smoothed the edges, but she wasn't taking any chances. Double, she said the minute Gabe came into the room. Matt gave him a thumbs up, and he had personally discarded the colt's night feed bag and replaced it. She sighed, relaxed. Thank God, I've been sitting here thinking of all the possibilities. You're supposed to be resting. He sat on the bed, careful not to shake the mattress. You've got shadows under your eyes again. Gently, he traced them with his thumb. Why do I always find that so sexy? Machismo looking for vulnerability. She smiled. Come to bed. Maybe we can both get a couple of hours sleep before we have to leave. I want you to stay here, Kelsey. Not here, he corrected, at Three Willows. You're not up to the trip, and it would be safer and smarter for you to stay with Gertie. Rossi can arrange for a couple of men. Gabe! She framed his face, touched her lips to his, then spoke softly. No way in hell. Listen to me. I could, she agreed. I could listen to you, and you could listen to me, and we could bat this ball back and forth until morning. I'd still go. So why don't we just pretend we've argued and discussed? You're being selfish. He pushed himself off the bed and began to undress. You don't want to miss the race, so it doesn't matter that I won't be able to concentrate or enjoy it myself. Slowly she ran her tongue over her teeth. That was a good one. And guilt usually works with me, but not this time. You'll worry whether I'm there or not. And I'm going to be there for you, Gabe, all the way. Goddamn mule. That won't work either, though name-calling is an acceptable stage in a good fight. I could counter that by calling you an overprotective ass, but I'll refrain because I'm a lady. So, her breath caught on a hiss. Oh, God, what did you do to your back? He twisted his head, but could get only a marginal glimpse at the dark, spreading bruise on his shoulder. Took a kick. When? It wasn't there before. She trailed off, realizing just when and just how he'd come by it. Now I will call you an ass. What kind of numb-headed heroics is this? The doctor was just here. He could have treated it. It wasn't heroics, numb-headed or otherwise. I was distracted. Cautiously, he rotated his shoulder. 
The sting wasn't so bad, but the throb went deep and had teeth. Just need some liniment. Jerk! He started to snap back, then sighed, defeated. I love you, too. Slipping into bed, he cradled her against him. What are you doing? Getting some sleep? I'm supposed to check on you every couple of hours. We don't have much more than that anyway. A liniment? Later, I just want to hold you. Content with that, she brushed his hair from his brow. Gabe, I'm going with you. I know. Go to sleep. Chapter 23 No one would let her work. For her first two days in New York, Kelsey was all but barred from the track, outnumbered and outflanked by everyone from Gabe down to the scruffiest stable boy. It seemed the trip itself was to be her only victory. With too much time on her hands and too much of it spent alone, she decided she had two options. She could go quietly mad, or she could treat the enforced inactivity as a short vacation. The vacation seemed healthier. She made use of the hotel facilities, swimming each morning to keep the muscles she developed over the past few months in shape. She shopped, began a love-hate relationship with the Nautilus equipment in the health club, and generally fought off boredom. It helped that Gabe had decided to give a pre-race party, using the hotel ballroom on the evening before the Belmont. It gave Kelsey the opportunity to plot out the details, talk strategy with the florist and the hotel caterer. Gabe, after one look at the yards of lists, took the coward's route and left the entire matter in her hands. Nothing could have pleased her more. She spent hours with the hotel manager, the concierge, the chef, debating and dissecting what could and couldn't be done. As Gabe had put no ceiling on the budget, she had already decided there was nothing that couldn't be done and set about convincing the staff. I'd have been smarter handing you a pitchfork and letting you clean out the stalls all week. Gabe grabbed a quick cup of coffee and watched Kelsey pour over the final menu for the evening. You'd have gotten more rest. Stop fussing. You're the one who started this. I thought a party would be a good idea. He moved over to stand behind her, rubbing her shoulders as she muttered over her papers. A little food, some music, an open bar. I didn't realize I'd be backing a David O. Selznick production. He narrowed his eyes. How much champagne is that? Go away! But she rolled her shoulders under his hands. You're not going to drink it anyway. You gave me carte blanche, Slater, and I'm using it. Just be in your tuxedo by eight. More like Captain Bly than Selznick, he muttered. Now you sound like the caterer. Go meet your reporters. I'm sick of reporters. You're just jealous because they put double on the cover of Sports Illustrated instead of you. I got the spread and people, he reminded her, and entertained himself by nibbling on her ear. This is a great spot right here, he murmured, nipping his way up her left lobe. I could be temperamental and miss the interview. The quick, delicious shivers distracted her. Gabe took advantage and had the first two buttons of her blouse undone before she shook herself free. Stop that! I have an appointment in fifteen minutes. I'll work fast. I mean it! Breathless, she squirmed away, scrambled out of the chair. I'm getting my hair done. He grinned. Just now it was tumbling out of the bright cloth-covered elastic. He'd done that. I like your hair exactly the way it is. Keep your distance, Slater. The rest of my day is booked, minute by minute, and I didn't schedule any time for you to chase me around the desk. Adjust. This may be just a party for you. As ridiculous as it was, she scooted so that the desk was between them. But putting it together has kept me sane all week. I have an emotional investment. So do I. He put his palms down on the desk, leaned forward. Come here. Absolutely not! I've got something for you. Oh, please. She'd have rolled her eyes if she dared take them off him. That's very lame. He straightened, cocked a brow. A present. He took a small velvet box out of his pocket. Now, aren't you ashamed? A present? Despite the instant flare of pleasure, she eyed it warily. Is this a trick? Open it. I was going to give it to you after the race, but I thought it would be better luck for you to have it before. It lured her. She came around the desk to take it from him, then lifted her mouth to his for a kiss. Thank you. You haven't opened it yet. For the thought first. 
Her breath sighed out when she snapped the top open. The horse glowed against the black velvet, caught forever in mid-gallop, airborne and magnificent. The pin was fashioned of ruby jade, carved so intricately, so delicately that she almost expected to feel the bunch and flow of muscles as she ran a fingertip over it. The diamond eye glistened with triumph. It's beautiful. It's perfect. She looked up at him. So are you. That was my line. He slipped his arms around her waist, bringing her closer. You're welcome, he said as his mouth closed over hers. Of course she was late. Kelsey dashed into the beauty salon, babbling apologies. She was checking her watch anxiously by the time the manicurist was trying to do something elegant with her neglected nails. Honey, why don't we go for some tips? No, I'll just break them off. Her hair was bundled in huge foam rollers, her face coated with a pale green cream she'd somehow allowed herself to be talked into, and time was ticking away. Just shape up what's there and slap on some clear polish. Don't you want something a little snazzier? Kelsey stole a peek at the manicurist's lethally long, carmine-slicked nails. No, I'll stick with subtlety. With a shake of her head, the woman dunked Kelsey's right hand in warm water. Whatever you say, honey. It's Kelsey, isn't it? A woman at the next station smiled at her. I'm Janet Gardner, Overlook Farms, Kentucky. Oh, yes, Mrs. Gardner. Kelsey decided not to say she hadn't recognized the woman, not with the flame-colored hair coated with glistening blue cream and her face plastered with shocking pink. It's nice to see you again. A face left without the scalpel, they tell me. Janet laughed as she tapped a finger to the drying pink mask. We'll see about that. Yours? Oh, something about relaxing. Apparently I looked harried. Who doesn't by the Belmont? My Hank and I are going to sleep for two weeks when we get back home. We promised ourselves. Kelsey remembered Hank now, the stringy man she'd danced with the night before. He'd had sun-scored cheeks, a pencil-thin mustache, and a voice as rich as molasses. He'd wanted to teach her to tango. Give your husband my best. He's a terrific dancer. Oh, that's my Hank, Janet chuckled and preened. All the ladies want to turn around the floor with him. He likes to tell people I married him for his feet. Obliging the manicurist, Janet slipped off an emerald ring that could have doubled for a paperweight. I saw your mother today at the track. It's hard to believe we've been making the rounds together for... Well, that would be telling. You've known Naomi a long time? Since I married into this horse race, of course, she was born into it. Much more interested in gossiping than in the fashion magazine she'd been thumbing through with her free hand, Janet set it aside. Her eyes brightened with curiosity. You were, too. Belatedly. Oh, I think it's more that you came back to it belatedly. I remember seeing you at the track when you were in diapers. Really? Oh, goodness, yes. Naomi was prouder of you than any wall full of blue ribbons. We used to call you Naomi's Thoroughbred, but you wouldn't remember that. Naomi's Thoroughbred. The idea both pleased and saddened her. No, I don't. I met your father once or twice. Poor dear, he always looks so lost. He was a librarian. My father is the head of the English department at Georgetown University. Oh, yes, Janet bubbled on, oblivious of the stiffness in Kelsey's voice. Obligingly, she dunked her fingers in the soaking bowl for her own manicure. I knew it had something to do with books. Naomi doted on him. We all thought it was a shame things didn't work out. But then it happens all the time, doesn't it? According to the statistics, Hank and all the lucky ones, 28 years this September. Congratulations. Since there was no escape, Kelsey tried a shift in topic. You have children? Three, two boys and a girl. Adidi's married now and has two little girls of her own. If she'd had a hand free, Janet would have gone straight for the pictures in her wallet. My boys tell me they're still looking. Of course, my youngest is barely twenty. He's studying structural engineering. Not that I know anything about that. She went on about her children at some length until Kelsey relaxed into the rhythm. But there's something special between a mother and daughter, Janet said cagily, veering back. 
don't you think? I mean, even after all these years of separation, you and Naomi look so sweet together. To tell you the truth, it's been so long a lot of people forget she even had a daughter, if they knew in the first place. Janet held up one hand, examined the first coat of mauve polish. Yes, dear, that's very nice. When she shifted her attention back to Kelsey, her voice took on a confidential air. I hope you won't be offended if I tell you that most of us who knew Naomi and the situation were rooting for her. I mean, the idea of taking a child from its mother just seems unnatural. Well aware that both manicurists had their ears pricked, Kelsey kept her voice cool. I'm sure Naomi appreciated it. Not that it did any good. I'm sorry to say, she was her own worst enemy during that trying time. I've always thought it was anger at your father that made her behave so recklessly, and the social scene was a bit wilder back then. Still, Alec Bradley, she clucked her tongue. Naomi should have known better than to flirt in that direction. Oh, as if she'd just remembered the outcome of that flirtation, Janet blinked and squirmed. Oh, dear, I'm sorry, that would be a sore point. The idea of a shooting death and a decade in prison being termed a sore point might have amused Kelsey under different circumstances, but she backtracked to the one statement that had caught her attention. Did you know Alec Bradley? Oh, yes. Most of us back then at least knew of him. He was drop-dead gorgeous, as my Didi would say, tall, dark, and handsome, with a smile that could melt a woman's heart. He knew it, too. Believe me, he knew it, and he used it. He even fluttered around me a bit. But I ain't put a stop to that. She giggled girlishly. I admit I was a little flattered, even knowing his reputation. What reputation was that? Well, dear, eagerly she scooted forward in her chair. His family would barely acknowledge him. They may have had some financial reversals, but the blood was still blue. And there was that scandal with his first wife. She hunkered still closer, assuming the gossip position. He had a taste for older women, you know, wealthy older women. Everyone knew his first wife settled on him generously in the divorce to save face. Not that it helped, really, because everyone knew he'd been, well, servicing the fillies, shall we say. So he was a womanizer. Oh, a champion. And the buzz was he charged for the service. He... women paid him for sex? Another giggle, slightly embarrassed. Janet preferred cagey euphemisms. I don't know if it was quite that blunt, but it was common knowledge that he could be bought as an escort. There are a lot of single women, even in racing. Unmarried, divorced, between husbands, Alec could be hired to fill the gap. A handsome arm to hold for a party at the track. He was, as I said, quite charming, and he tended to bet heavily and badly. When she smiled, pink flakes cracked from her face and drifted onto her black and gold bib like colorful dandruff. Now, no one thought it was a business deal between him and your mother, dear. A woman like Naomi could have had any man she wanted. Still could. Alec seemed quite besotted with her, though he did continue to indulge in the side flirtations. Naomi wasn't one to put up with that sort of nonsense. They argued heatedly about that, and she gave him the boot. This time, Janet's flustering was quite genuine. That is, I mean... You were there that night? Not interested in evasions or a sudden attack of conscience, Kelsey pressed. The night he died? Yes, I was. Janet moistened her lips, surprised and a bit unnerved by Kelsey's direct question. Hank and I were in Virginia on business. A number of racing people were at the country club for a party. There now, looks like I'm done. She held up her hands. And speaking of parties, I'm so looking forward to tonight. That handsome young man of yours has us all on the edge of our seats. They argued? Kelsey ignored the squawk of protest from her manicurist when she shot out a hand and gripped Janet's arm. That night, they argued? Yes, dear. Sorry now that she'd let her yen for gossip sink her over her head. Janet spoke kindly. Several of us were questioned about it after the difficulties. They argued quite audibly, and Naomi told him in blunt terms that their relationship was finished. 
They had both been drinking, perhaps a little more than was wise. Words flew. Naomi dashed a glass of champagne in his face and walked out. It was the last I saw of her for a very long time. In the bright clown mask, Janet's eyes softened. I was fond of Naomi. I still am. The man wasn't worth it, dear. He simply wasn't worth one minute of her time. I think the real crime is she didn't realize it until it was too late. For the rest of the afternoon, Kelsey struggled to put the conversation in the back of her mind. She wanted to take it out again to examine each and every word separately. It made a difference, didn't it? Somehow it made a difference that Alec Bradley had been for hire. But however it altered the puzzle she so badly wanted to piece together, there was too much interference to concentrate. Whatever her mood, she had no intention of spoiling Gabe's moment or her mother's contentment. She dressed early and left Gabe a note in the center of the bed for him to meet her in the ballroom at precisely eight. Final details required her attention. Whether the caterer, the florist, and the hotel staff agreed or not, it was to be perfect, and as she stood in the center of the huge, chandelier-lit room, it was. The red and white colors of Longshot predominated. In tablecloths, candles, flowers. To honor the three jewels in the triple crown, Banks of red roses, sunny black-eyed Susans, and white carnations spilled from tables, tumbled from baskets. Black-suited waiters were lined up for inspection, while the catering staff put the finishing touches on three enormous buffet tables. But her inspiration, her pièce de résistance, and her biggest headache had been the gambling. Oversized play money was available for purchase, and all for charity, but the details had kept her racing for days with the bureaucracy. Naomi's thoroughbred had nipped all opposition at the wire. Now she could stand and study the roulette wheels, the dice and blackjack tables, and know she was presenting Gabe with the party of the season, and one, she thought, that would suit him like a second skin. While the orchestra tuned up, she walked over and gave the wheel a reckless spin. I'll take red. With a laugh, she turned around and smiled at Gabe. You're on time. You're beautiful. He didn't cross to her, not yet. He just wanted to look. She wore glimmering white, a column that shimmered from the curve of her breasts to her ankles. His gift was pinned at her heart. Her hair was a tumble of curls, scooped back with glittering clips, falling over bare shoulders. Diamond and ruby drops dripped from her ears. Really incredibly beautiful. Your colors? She held out her hands to his. What do you think? I think you astonish me. Still holding her at arm's length, he scanned the room. What have you done here? Besides driving every merchant and city official within fifty miles insane, I've given you a casino for the night. Slater's. And the proceeds? There's a shelter for abused women and children in D.C. His eyes darkened, then lowered to their joined hands. You humble me, Kelsey. I love you, Gabe. Moved, he lifted her hands to his lips. What spin of the wheel brought you to me? The luckiest one of your life. She glanced down, smiled at the silver ball nestled in its slot. Red, she murmured. You win again. You know, Gabe, this isn't just for you. No. No. She inched closer, slipping her arms around his neck. I want to watch you work here tonight. I have a feeling I'm going to find it very arousing. And she did. Hours later, when the room was crowded with people, the buffet tables decimated, the dance floor spinning with couples, she stood at Gabe's shoulder and studied his technique. She'd thought she'd understood blackjack, a simple card game of luck and logic where you tried to get as close as possible to twenty-one. If you went over, you lost— but she couldn't for the life of her understand why Gabe held and won on a measly fifteen one hand and hit and won on sixteen the next. It's just numbers, he told her. Nothing but numbers, darling. That's exactly what she'd thought, until she'd seen him play. There's no way you can possibly remember all the numbers, the combinations. He only smiled, tapped his cards, and added a four to his seventeen for twenty-one. Here. He pushed a stack of red and white chips at her. You play for a while. All right, I will. She took the seat he'd vacated, then glanced up when Naomi sat down beside her. 
I've just lost a bundle at craps. I'm giving this game ten minutes before I nag Moses into dancing with me. She tucked a sweep of golden hair behind her ear, then crossed her legs. After pushing out some chips, she scanned the room. Quite a party. Your daughter's amazing. I know. Naomi's brow furrowed as she studied her cards. Hit me, she instructed, then huffed out a breath. Busted. It's all for a good cause. Losing should warm your heart. Nibbling her lip, Kelsey contemplated her eight and five. Okay, I'll take one. An eight! Another eight! I won! She was chuckling as she raked in her chips until she caught Naomi's narrowed eye. Well, winning warms the heart, too. Dance with my mother, Gabe, and I'll see how much of your money I can lose. How can I turn down an offer like that? He held out a hand, curling his fingers around Naomi's. You look wonderful tonight, he said, when they matched steps on the dance floor. How would you know? You haven't looked at anyone but Kelsey. He said nothing for a moment. I don't seem to have a smooth answer to that. Tilting her head back, she studied him carefully. I'd be disappointed if you did. I like watching what she feels for you rush into her face, and I like knowing what you feel for her causes you to miss a step. In an odd way, you've both been so structured. You trip each other up. But you're worried. Not about what's between the two of you, about everything else. She glanced back to where Kelsey sat laughing at the blackjack table, shoving more chips forward. I know she tried to brush off what happened the other night, but it terrifies me. His eyes went cool, deceptively so. It should never have happened. I should have been with her. No, it should never have happened, Naomi agreed, but she was still looking at her daughter, not at Gabe. I think she should stay at Three Willows, or better yet, go back to her father until this is settled. He'd thought the same, but hearing it didn't make it easier. Even if she agreed to that, we don't know how long it'll take to settle any of it. Any of it? He cursed himself, another misstep. As far as Naomi knew, there was only the current trouble over the horses. Who broke through my security and what they intended to do? On the other hand, it might be over tomorrow, after the race is run. I'm going to count on that. I couldn't stand for anything to happen to her, Gabe. I hate the idea that she's been touched by any of the ugliness. Just the kind of sordid business Millicent always claimed was part and parcel of racing. She shook her head back, her eyes flashing. But it's not. It's not what it's about. Not what we're about. But when it happens, it's all people remember. Are you worried about Millicent Biden's opinion? Hell no! The old defiance came back. But I won't let her be right, and I'll be damned if I let her smirk over another blot on my honor. So I want this over, for Kelsey, for you, and for myself. The room was cool and dark when Kelsey woke. She shifted lazily while images from the night before flowed through her mind. Color and light, voices, music, the dizzying spin of the wheel, the lightning toss of dice. She'd lost half of Gabe's winnings at cards. He'd doubled them back at craps. Most of all, she remembered how he'd looked, dark and dangerous in evening clothes, those mouth-watering and unreadable blue eyes following the spin of the wheel, the fall of the cards then the way they would suddenly lock on hers and stop her breath. And when they'd been alone, when the evening and the noise and the crowds had been behind them, he'd lowered her to the bed. Those clever hands had played her then, teasing out moans, tempting out darker and darker needs. He had done things to her, done things for her she'd never imagined allowing, much less demanding. Now waking, her body felt soft and tender, bruised and cherished. Eyes closed, she skimmed her hand over the sheet, wanting him. Groggy, she pushed herself up in bed and found herself alone. He wasn't getting away that easily, she told herself. Still half-dreaming, she crawled out of bed. She stumbled out into the parlor of the suite, belting her robe. She grimaced as the light through the open drapes blinded her. Shielding her eyes, she braced a hand on the door jamb. God, what time is it? Just past ten. Naomi poured a cup of coffee from the pot on the room service tray. Your timing's good, Kelsey. Breakfast just arrived. Breakfast? Ten? She squinted through her splayed fingers. Gabe? Oh, at the track since dawn. But 
Fully awake now, she dropped her hand. That jerk! He promised he wouldn't go without me this morning, of all mornings. Hmm. Naomi poured a second cup for her daughter. According to him, you were an ill-disposed lump who told him to go away when he suggested it was time to get up. I did not. She took a sip of coffee. Did I? He's probably making it up. He probably wanted you to get a little rest. He's my lover, not my keeper. Then she flushed. However unusual the relationship, Naomi was still her mother. She cleared her throat and sat down. What are you doing here? I thought you'd be at the track. It's not a big race for us. A mile and a half. She shrugged and spread blackberry jam on a triangle of toast. We'd just like to see Highwater hold his own. I guess we could get lucky since the Arkansas colt is scratched. Scratched? When? What happened? Oh, he pulled up lame in yesterday's workout. A sprained foreleg. I guess I forgot to tell you. Pouting, Kelsey bit into a slice of bacon. I feel like I'm outside the party with my face pressed against the window while everyone else eats the cake. I'm sorry, honey. You'll just have to tolerate all of us being worried about you. When I think of what could have happened... She sighed, spread more jam. All right, all right, we won't get into it. I know that butt-out look on your face. I've seen it in the mirror often enough. It didn't mean butt-out, Kelsey said with a smile. It meant don't worry. It goes with the territory, even for a come-from-behind mother. So eat your breakfast. I have instructions to see that you do. Gabe again. I imagine you know he loves you. Yes, I do. Do you know he's besotted? This time the smile crept into Kelsey's face. Do you think so? Naomi only laughed. Never mind, you already know it. It's thrilling, isn't it? And terrifying to have a man tangled up over you that way? Yes, and twice as thrilling and terrifying when you're just as tangled up over him. I know it might seem soon to be this involved with someone after the divorce, but... Kelsey, not only am I not in a position to criticize, but I'm going to point out that you and your ex-husband were separated for two years. Still, Kelsey shook her head, I'm second-guessing myself because it doesn't seem right. It only feels right. She toyed with her breakfast, hoping she wasn't choosing the wrong moment. When you separated from Dad, did you still love him? I'm sorry. She lifted her eyes. Someone said something to me yesterday that made me wonder. If you'd rather not answer, I understand. I told you once that whatever you asked, I'd try to answer. But this one was hard. It wrenched at an old wound in the heart, an almost forgotten one. Yes, I still loved him. I loved him for a long, long time after it was foolish to do so. And because I did, I was angry. With him, with myself, and determined to prove it didn't matter. Is that why you... Threw myself into parties, Naomi continued. Enjoyed fanning gossip about myself and other men. Courted small scandals. Yes, at least partly. I wasn't about to admit I'd failed. I wanted Philip to suffer, to have sleepless nights thinking about me reveling in my freedom. And because I undoubtedly succeeded in that, I drove him further and further away, until what I wanted most was impossible for me to have. You wanted him back. Desperately. I was vain enough to think I could have him on my own terms, and my terms only. And Alec Bradley? She saw Naomi flinch and forced herself to finish. Was he someone you used to make Dad suffer? Naomi switched from coffee to water. He was a kind of final gauntlet flung, a man with as sterling and blooded a pedigree as Phillips, but with a faintly unsavory reputation. Kelsey's stomach nodded. She had to know, and to know she had to ask. Did you hire him? The discomfort in Naomi's eyes vanished. Hire him, she repeated, blank. I've heard that he put certain skills on the market. She gulped at her coffee, so to speak. The last reaction Kelsey had expected was laughter, but it came now, rich and delighted, across the table. Christ, what a thought! What a thought! The very last thing I wanted from Alec was stud service. Her amusement fled. The very last thing. I'm sorry, that was a stupid question. I didn't mean it precisely as it sounded. I was thinking more of public displays than private ones. 
No, I didn't hire him, though I did lend him money a time or two. He was always in between deals, you see, she said dryly, always in the midst of a little cash flow problem. It might be vanity again, coming back to color memory, but as I recall, he pursued me. Not that I evaded, she added, and chose a single raspberry from a bowl. I wanted the attention. I needed it, and he was very charming. Even when you knew differently, he could make you believe you were the only woman in the room. I was certainly aware of his reputation, of the fact that he could be bought. That added to the appeal, I suppose, the fact that he was with me, charming me, hoping to conquer me, because he couldn't help himself, did wonders for my ego. And a great deal of it, she remembered, had been simple ego. In the end, he refused to accept, or wasn't able to accept, that I didn't choose to be conquered. And that's what killed him. But rape isn't about sex. No. She'd once thought it was, or had wanted to believe it was, because sex was easier. He wanted to hurt me, to humiliate me. I've never really understood why he seemed so desperate that night. There wasn't passion in his eyes. There wasn't lust. I think I could have fought them, have outmaneuvered them. It was the desperation in his eyes that made me reach for the gun. Naomi shuddered once, then cleared out her clogged lungs with a long, quiet breath. I'd forgotten that. I'm sorry I made you remember. Though she promised herself she would think everything through later, Kelsey covered Naomi's hand with hers. Let it go. We'll both let it go. This is a day to look forward, not back. Why don't you come check out the outfit I bought for the race? If I don't get into it soon, we'll miss the first post. Chapter 24 Reno wore a slate gray suit and maroon tie. His soft Italian boots shone like mirrors. The pencil slim woman on his arm was a head taller than he and kept her artfully painted face tilted toward the cameras. He knew it was a pathetic cliche, the short man proving his masculinity by latching on to tall, stunning women. He didn't give a damn. Right now he needed something to prove his manhood, his worth, his cojones. The sling on his arm precisely matched the silk of his tie. They were, he knew, the only silks he'd be wearing that day. He smiled and preened for the cameras, as eager for the attention as the woman posed with him. Beneath the bravado, the quick, sassy answers about his next ride, his next season, he was a whirlwind of nerves and misery. He watched the jockeys stride to the paddock, knew what each and every one of them was feeling, thinking— the concentration, the little mental games to keep the adrenaline up. Only one would win, but others would prove their mettle with the ride. Some would come back, another race, another year. Others would fade, gain weight, lose interest, take a fall. They might choose to headline in the sticks, preferring second-rate wins to first-rate losses. The great ones would stay on one circuit, getting rich, drawing their own following, avoiding or overcoming the broken bones and bad spills. The middling ones would move from track to track, following trainers, harassing agents, disappearing perhaps to resurface as a groom or valet, or as an assistant trainer on some tiny farm in the boondocks. But none of that showed now. Now they were warriors, soldiers, showmen, eyes tensed and narrowed behind the plastic goggles, bodies lean and tight and limber under the silks, their feet encased in supple, dainty boots. The helmets were in place beneath the cloth-eaten caps, the post-position number a cardboard garter on the arm. Some of them would have risen at dawn to work their partners themselves. Others would have slept late, their relationship with their horse purely business and unemotional. Fear of the scale would have kept most of them away from food, seduced them into another hour sweating in steam. Now they were weighed and ready. Reno watched them with grinding envy and despair. He should be the one listening, with the air of narrowed focus, to the trainer's final instructions. It should be him garnering the praise, admiration, and hopes of the owners. It should have been him flying down the track with the whip between his teeth. His worst fear was that it would never be him again. He forced himself forward, that quick, cocky smile fastened to his face. Miss Naomi! Reno! Automatically, Naomi reached out, clasping his good arm. You look great. I'd rather be wearing your colors. 
"'You will soon.' She glanced toward the woman he'd left entertaining some reporters. "'Pretty girl. She looks familiar.' "'You might have caught her in a couple of commercials. Shampoo and toothpaste, mostly. She's trying to break into movies.' He shrugged his date off and looked at the colt. "'He'll run for you, Miss Naomi.' "'Yes, I know he will.' "'Just the man I wanted to see.' Kelsey stepped forward. I was hoping you'd have some time in the next couple of weeks to look at my yearling again, Reno. Honor needs a writer who can coax the best out of her. His stomach churned once hard. Sure, sure, I'll do that. I've got nothing but time. I'm going to go give Joy a send-off. Did I say the wrong thing? Kelsey murmured when he hurried off. I don't know. Distracted, Naomi looked toward Moses. He's probably just strung out like everyone else. I'm sure you're right. I'm going to go wish Gabe good luck. Meet you in the box. Make history for me, Joey. Gabe shook hands with his jockey. Joey flexed his fingers, cracked his knuckles. I'm going to do that, Mr. Slater. You hold him back like I told you, Jameson added. I don't want him to drive until the head of the stretch. We're not looking for a record here. We're looking for a win. Me and Double here, we could get you both. He grinned and saluted when Reno joined them. Get yourself a front row seat, pal, and have some of that fancy champagne you like waiting. I'm going to do that. Reno kept his smile in place as he nodded to Gabe. Good luck today, Mr. Slater. You've got a horse in a million here. His hand grew sweaty in his pocket. I'd like a chance to go up on him myself one of these days. We'll talk about that when you're back to 100%. A man gets spoiled riding the kind of horse I've been riding the past year or two. His eyes locked on Jameson's. That's the way it is, isn't it, Jamie? We get spoiled. You could say that, Reno. Jameson kept a hand around Double's bridle. I won the Belmont for you two years back, remember? Everyone called it an upset, an apprentice jockey, and a long-shot colt, but the truth was it was my day, my horse, my race. Inside his pocket, his damp fingers opened and closed, opened and closed. People forget, though. They forget all the races, all the wins. It's the derby they remember. It's the derby that puts you on top. His hand trembled when he took it out of his pocket, when he laid it flat-palmed on the colt's neck. Well, you got yourself the derby and a lot more, he forced a laugh. Win or lose, they won't forget this Belmont. So you win it. You win it big. Riders up. At the call, Reno stepped back. His face was white, sheened with sweat. Turning quickly, he strode away. Kelsey snatched at his arm as he passed her. Reno? I'm sorry, was all he said before shaking her off and rushing away from the paddock. Jockeys! Jameson launched Joey into the saddle. Temperamental. He looked ill, Kelsey murmured, but there was no time to worry, barely any time to think. After the race, she promised herself, she'd try to find him and see if she could help. But now it was Gabe's moment. She wasn't about to have it spoiled. Even though you went off without me this morning, I'm going to wish you luck. It would have taken a crowbar to get you out of bed at dawn. And he'd wanted the morning to himself, to search for signs of his father. But he'd found none. More relaxed, Gabe tilted his head to study her. Her hair was scooped up under a white straw hat, its wide brim tipped flirtatiously over one eye. Her short, snug red dress was topped by a waist-length white jacket. His pin galloped over her breast. Now that I see what a few hours extra sleep did for you, I'm glad I didn't have a crowbar handy. A very clever way of sliding out of it, Slater. I thought so. He tucked her arm through his. You're wearing my colors. Today they're the only colors worth wearing. She pressed a hand to her heart as they walked to his box. Why aren't you nervous? Nerves won't change anything. Tell that to my stomach, she muttered, and dug in her bag for her binoculars. I'm beginning to think I want this more than you do. No, you don't. He kept a hand on hers as the horses were led to the gate. The odds were locked in, the betting windows closed. Overhead the sky was the clear, dreamy blue of summer. The oval, the mile and a half of meticulously tended turf, was fast today. The crowd that massed in the grandstands was on its feet, setting up a steady drone punctuated by shouts and cheers. It was easy to forget how huge it all was. For those who had seen the sport only on a television screen, it would seem small, intimate, rather than the world that it was. 
It had, through ambition, through luck, and through a steady inner drive, become Gabe's world. Now all the work, the disappointments, the triumphs, and the hopes came down to this single race, this single horse. He watched Double being loaded and remembered the night he had been born, the way the laboring mare had wheezed, the way the wind had blown, keening against the walls of the foaling barn, the snow and sleet hurling down, the endless wait while the mare strained and labored. Then the first sight, the terrifyingly fragile legs stabbing their way free in a gush of blood, and the mare's cry, eerily human, heralding that last pang of birth. That small wet life had lain on the soiled straw, taking the first breath that would lead double or nothing out of bold courage to the starting gate at Belmont Park, Long Island. And now, three years later, Gabe remembered the thrill that had passed through him, arrow bright, when he had looked into the foal's eyes. I love that horse. He didn't realize he'd spoken aloud until Kelsey's fingers tightened on his. I know you do. The gate opened with a scream of metal. Almost at once there was a gasp from the crowd as Double swerved to the right from his number six post position, nearly unseating his rider. Whatever had spooked him, the disastrous move had placed him behind a wall of horses with his jockey fighting for balance. All of Jameson's careful instructions on how to run the race became useless in the space of a heartbeat. Joey's only goal now was to get Double or Nothing back into the Belmont. There was a split-second decision whether to fight through the field or go around it. Rider and horse made it together, swinging wide in a move, depending on the outcome, that would be seen as either valiant or foolish. As if he knew what had to be done, the colt bore down. He charged down the field, eating up the distance with wild speed. When they passed the wire the first time, he was a length behind the leader and gaining. From his position in the box, Gabe kept his binoculars in place. He was focused on only one horse. The race itself was nearly forgotten, shattered under the bright flash of admiration. There was more than beauty there. There was courage. Win or lose, he wouldn't forget it. The half-mile went in 46 seconds flat, with Double and the leader pulling steadily away from the pack. The crowd roared, a frenzy of sound. But Gabe heard only Kelsey's voice beside him, quietly murmuring encouragement. It might have been only the two of them, standing hand in hand, watching a single horse. At the far turn, Double made his challenge, battling for advantage as they hit the top of the stretch. It was here, in its demanding, heartbreaking home stretch, that the Belmont tested valor. The Kentucky bred colt was rallying from behind, shooting toward the leaders like a spear. But it was too late. What had been born in the long-shot colt that windy night in late winter what Gabe had seen in his eyes during those first wonderful moments of life drove him faster than the whip laid across his back. With heart, with honor, he thundered across the wire two lengths in the lead to take the Belmont stakes and the triple crown. For a moment Gabe could only stare. The emotion swirling inside him came too fast, too hard to sift out only the thrill of victory. That was his horse, cantering easily now with its rider high in the irons, that was his dream, covered with sweat and dirt and glory. Whatever happened now, no one could ever take away from him or the spectacular colt this dazzling moment. That's a hell of a horse, Gabe murmured in a voice that felt rusty. Dazed, he looked down at Kelsey, saw her cheeks wet with tears. That's one hell of a horse. Yes, even as the tears rolled, a laugh bubbled up in her throat. She lifted her arms, circled Gabe's neck. Congratulations, Slater. You've done it. Christ. No amount of control could hold back the foolish grin that spread over his face. Jesus Christ, we did it. He swung her up and around, oblivious of the cameras. She was still laughing when he covered her mouth with his. In his room, a few hundred miles away... Rich stared at the television screen. He hadn't gone to New York. With what he'd expected to happen, it was smarter, safer for him to stay behind. He nodded as the cameras cut from the victorious colt to its owner. Enjoy it while you can, boy, he muttered, and toasted himself with twelve-year-old scotch. A smirk twisted his lips over the celebrational kiss, the announcer's breathless voice identifying Gabriel Slater and Kelsey Biden as very friendly rivals. Rich sat back and waited for the chaos. 
the colt would be led to the spit bucket, as he would be after any race. And then, Rich thought, and then Gabe wouldn't be smiling so big. Even better this way, he decided, even better to snatch away the prize after it had been granted. Things had worked out perfectly. Thanks to Naomi's pretty little girl, if she hadn't come out to the barn that night and interrupted what was planned for the colt, he'd never have raced. But he had raced, and he'd won. Now, moments from now, the shocking announcement would be made that Double or Nothing had an illegal drug in his system. Not only would Gabe lose, but he would face scandal, derision, and shame. Preparing for his own victory, Rich topped off his drink. Liquor slopped, spilled by a jerk of his hand as the official announcement was made. Nine, five, two. His shocked brain didn't take in the nattering about purses and payoffs. He gaped at the screen filled with a horse and rider, each blanketed with white carnations. He saw Gabe, his arm possessively around Kelsey's shoulders, congratulating his rider, then lean in, as sentimental as a movie cowboy, to kiss the sweaty colt. His glass struck the screen and both shattered. The air reeked of liquor as he lunged out of the chair. For a minute he lost his mind, kicking and beating the television until his knuckles ran red. Then he heaved it off the table. His only motive was to destroy it, to somehow destroy the machine that showed him such images. When he finally stopped, gasping and drained, the air stank of smoke and scotch and his own violent sweat. His knuckles were bleeding and his breath was coming in shuddering rasps. He tripped over a broken chair and righted the bottle of scotch. Most had pooled on the rug, but there was enough to clear the bile from his throat when he chugged from the bottle, enough to clear his mind again. Heads will roll, he promised himself, and since he apparently could trust no one to carry out a simple task, he'd have to take care of things himself. In the week that followed Double's Triple Crown win, there was barely time to think. The routine at Three Willows had to continue, despite the celebrity of their neighbor. The racing season didn't stop at Belmont, nor did the daily care and training of horses allow for sitting on laurels. And Kelsey had her own ambitions, not the least of which was to mold her own champion. She'd been given her opportunity with honor, and she was determined to make the most of it. She had not forgotten her goal of piecing together the puzzle of the past. Charles Rooney might have refused to take or return her calls, but she had every intention of running him to ground. He would talk to her again eventually. She would visit Captain Tipton again as well, and if necessary, she would go to her father and ask him to relive those months of his life day by day until a clear picture emerged. For the one that was taking shape now was of a woman who had loved her husband, one who had certainly made mistakes, mistakes of pride and vanity and stubbornness in trying to force his hand. But no matter how coolly, how calmly she tried, Kelsey had yet to find the peace that turned a willful, even reckless young woman into a murderer. Hey, sis! Channing! Kelsey turned, sponge in hand, to kiss him. I haven't had five minutes to tell you how glad I am you're here. Despite the ache in my back, I've only been here a couple of hours. His shirt was already streaked with sweat. Moses put me to work so fast it feels as if I never left. I didn't think you were coming back. With careful strokes, Kelsey sponged off her yearling's face. We're midway through June. It took me a while to work it out. Candace is still against your being here? We can safely say she's not too happy with me. We had a hell of a battle. I'm sorry. No, I was good. A lot came out that had been festering, in me anyway. She wanted me to carry on the family tradition. All my life that's been a given. I'd be a brilliant surgeon like my father, like his father, and so forth. She expected it. I let her expect it. It isn't what you want? I'm going into veterinary medicine. His eyes held steady, as if he expected a protest, or worse, a quick indulgent laugh. Instead, she stepped forward and kissed both cheeks. Good. That's it? I could give you the routine about how impossible and how frustrating it is to try to live up to other people's expectations, especially family. In the past few months, I've had first-hand experience with that. But I figure you already know. She'll come around, Channing. She loves you. And under it all, she only wants what you want. Maybe. He shuffled straw under his foot. I hated fighting with her. I guess I hate knowing I'd have backed down if the prof hadn't stood up for me. 
Dad, really? It was like having the Seventh Cavalry charge in, without the bugles and blazing guns. He grinned. He just talked, in that slow, patient way of his. I've never seen him go against her that way. I think it was the shock that he took my part instead of hers that turned the tide. He loved you, too. Nibbling her lip, she went back to her work. Are they having problems, Channing? Things are a little strained between them. But with me here, they'll have the time and the privacy to work it out. Anyway, she blames you more than the prof. Kelsey made a face. I guess I'd better patch things up there. Mom's not one to hold the grudge. Not for long, anyway. Her sense of order's been shaken, that's all. It's going to take her a while to get used to it. Excuse me. Reno stood at the opening of the box. Reno, hi! Kelsey shifted, her hands still busy brushing the yearling. You remember Channing, my brother? Sure. How's it going? Good. How's the shoulder? Instinctively, Reno rotated it. It's coming along. I'll be ready to get up in a couple of weeks. I've got some offers to ride the European circuit this season. I heard Moses mention it, Kelsey said. We're sending high water over in a few weeks. I hope you take him up on it. Might. That's honor, isn't it? Naomi's honor? It sure is. What do you think of her? I'll let you two talk horse, Channing cut in. If Moses catches me loitering, he'll dock my pay. Good seeing you, Reno. Yeah, see you around. He stepped into the box and crouched. A thoroughbred's legs always came first. He said nothing, circled the horse, ran his hands along the chest, the flanks, the withers, before coming around to examine the eyes and teeth. She's a pretty one, Reno said at last. Terrific form, lots of heart room. You've had her in the gate? Yeah, she doesn't have any trouble there. She spooks sometimes, but since we started using a shadow roll, she's settled. The colt nudged her arm, and obliging, Kelsey took a carrot out of her pocket. She's gentle, but there's fire in there. Moses thinks we should try her out in a couple of races next year. Are you interested? She's a pretty one, Reno said again, and felt twin tremors of hope and despair. Why do you want to put me up on her? I've seen you ride for one, and I like the fact that you don't just mount a horse for a race. You come to workouts, you come to the barn. You treat it like a partnership. She hesitated, nuzzling the horse. I know you loved pride, Reno. It showed the way you felt about him and how you thought about him. That's the kind of rider I want for honor. He looked away, fighting the urge to curl up in the straw and weep. Her words were like small, sharp knives slicing at him. I did love that horse. He couldn't steady his voice and gave up trying. He'd have done anything for me. He broke his heart for me. Reno, you can't blame yourself for what happened. I wouldn't have hurt him. How were we supposed to know the race would kill him? He stared blindly into Kelsey's face. How were we supposed to know? You couldn't, she said gently. Sooner or later, we'll find out who wanted to hurt him. He let out a trembling breath. Sooner or later, he took a step in retreat. That's a fine horse. Will you ride her? Reno gave her a look of such crushing despair that she moved toward him. But as she reached out, he made one low animal sound in his throat and fled. Chapter 25 I tell you, Gabe, it broke my heart. Kelsey cupped her wine glass in both hands and tucked her legs up under her on his long, comfortable sofa. It was a lovely evening, the doors and windows wide open to welcome the flower-drenched breeze. But she could still see Reno's face, the utter hopelessness of it washed in the striped sunlight of Honor's box. He needs to get up again. Gabe was stretched out on the same sofa, puffing smoke at the ceiling, his feet in Kelsey's lap. It wasn't that he didn't sympathize with Reno's plight, but he was, quite simply, exhausted. Who could have known that the rapid-fire round of publicity, meetings, phone calls, and requests would be more tiring than a week's ditch-digging? At the moment, he'd have preferred a shovel and a sweaty back to the mind-numbing figures and futures tallied by lawyers, accountants, and brokers. Just that afternoon, he'd had to turn down an offer for the rights to his life story, and doubles, for a TV movie of the week. I don't know, Kelsey continued, while Gabe's thoughts wandered. I thought that, too, that he just needed to get up for another race, until... She rested her head against a cushion. 
Gabe had put on Mozart for her. She knew he preferred basic rock or the wail of blues to the classic melding of piano and orchestra. It wasn't just an altruistic gesture, you know, my asking him to ride on her. I want the best, but I did think it would help him. Instead, I made things worse. You can't know that. You didn't see his face. When I think it through, I know what losing pride did to me, how much it hurt. And even though I loved that cold, I couldn't have been nearly as attached as Reno was. He's blaming himself, Gabe, because he was on the colt when they went down. She toyed with her wine. I'm thinking of asking Naomi if she could persuade him to find some therapy. Do you think... She glanced toward Gabe. His eyes were closed. Am I keeping you up? Sorry. He opened one eye. I was drifting. No, I'm sorry. She shifted, began to rub his feet. You're worn out. I saw that when I walked in the door. I should be asking you how your meetings went today instead of trying out my Psych 101 theories on you. If you keep rubbing my feet, you can try it anything you want on me. She chuckled, then set her glass aside so she could do a better job of it. So, how did the meetings go? Should we be celebrating a new record for syndication? No. It was fascinating, he thought, and rewarding, to discover just how many erogenous zones there were on the sole of a foot. I'm not syndicating double. You're not? Her hands paused. But Gabe, the last set of figures you mentioned were astronomical. I don't want to share him. His eyes opened again, fastened on hers. I listened to all the advice, the offers, the numbers, and I decided to do what I want. When something's mine, it's mine. That's a very impractical emotional decision. What's your point? She shook her head. Well, there goes my plan to scoop up some shares of a triple crown winner. That depends. He used all of his willpower to keep his muscles relaxed, to keep his voice light. You can have half of him. Half? Her brows rose as she pressed her fingers to Gabe's instep. I think that's a bit more than I can afford. A lot of people will tell you you're right. You can't afford the terms. That had her lips moving into a pout. I think I'm a better judge of what I can or can't afford. Okay, what are the terms? There's just one. His eyes flashed to hers. All you have to do is marry me. Reno went to the barn first, the barn that had once been Cunningham's. No one stopped him. The guards, the grooms, all knew Reno. He had a meeting with Jameson, he told them, and they accepted it. They accepted him. He had a need to see horses again, to smell them, to touch them. He did give some thought to going to Jameson, to pouring out body and soul. But what difference would it make? Nothing could be changed. Nothing could be fixed. He'd spent a great deal of time during the last weeks blasting out scatter shots of blame, but in the end he understood that they all ricocheted back to him. He'd been the one who had taken the syringe. He'd been the one to plunge that poison into a beautiful, courageous athlete. It didn't matter how the instrument had come into his hands. He understood that now. He accepted that now. He'd murdered something he'd loved, and in doing so he'd destroyed himself. Like father, like son, Reno leaned against a patient mare and wept. It came through the blood, he thought. It came through the breeding. The excuses he'd used were smoke and mirrors. Had he really believed he'd been trying to avenge the father he'd never known? That was the weapon used against him as surely as he'd used the needle on the horse. Weak. He was weak as his father had been weak, and damned as his father had been damned. So... There was only one thing left to do. He would end it as his father had ended it, complete the cycle begun by a man he'd known only through photographs and grainy news clips, the man whose ghost he had honored above even his own dignity. As if in a dream, Reno left the barn and the soothing scent of horses. He walked to the tack room, the tack room that had once been Cunningham's. It was a full ten seconds before Kelsey could find her voice, it was, she supposed, a typical enough proposal from a man like Gabe. Challenging, cool-blooded, and risky. Very deliberately, she shifted his foot out of her lap and picked up her wine. If I marry you, I get a half share of double? That's right. He'd been expecting, at least hoping for, a different kind of reaction. 
a half share of long shot and all that goes with it. She sipped, studying him. And a half share of youth later? That irritated him, the amused patience in her voice, in her eyes. He swung his legs off the couch and stood. I'm not Wade, Kelsey. We go into this, we take each other whole. This won't be a tidy, make-the-best-of-a-bad-hand deal with an option to fold. I see. Once I ante up, I'm stuck. That's it, exactly. Since I'm naming the stakes, I'll show you the cards I'm playing with. I want you. That's my high card. It's going to take a lot for you to beat that. Maybe you figure the odds are tilted. You got stung once before, and you don't want it to happen again. But this is a different game with different players, and from where I'm standing, the stakes are a lot higher. She kept her eyes on her wine, and he'd said she couldn't bluff, she thought with some pride. Still, she knew better than to let him get a good look at her face until she was ready to call. You think I'd back off from marriage, shy away from a full commitment because I lost once before? That's incredibly insulting, nearly as insulting as this half-assed proposal you're stumbling through. You want flowers and candlelight and ring in my pocket? He'd meant to give them to her. The fact that he'd rushed his fences only infuriated him more. I'm not giving you anything he gave you. Her eyes lifted then, with just enough temper in them to mask her heart. Oh, now who's hobbled by the past, Slater? She slapped her glass on the table and rose. Why don't you just drag me off to, to Vegas? That would be a perfect milieu, wouldn't it? We could say our I do's over a crepe table. He nodded stiffly. Fine, if that's what you want. What I want is a simple, straightforward question to which I can give a simple, straightforward answer. So you can either ask me or you can go to hell. Narrow-eyed, he studied her, but for once he couldn't read her face. How could he, he realized, when for the first time in his life someone else held all the cards. Will you marry me? Yes, she said. Absolutely. Gauging her, he let out some of the breath he hadn't been aware he'd been holding. That's it? That's it, she agreed. So, who gets to rake in the chips? His lips curved slowly. This seems like a good time to start splitting the pot. He stepped toward her, combing his hands through her hair, taking a firm hold. I love you, Kelsey. You must, or you'd never have flubbed that so badly. Flubbed hell. He kissed her hard. I've got you, don't I? Yeah. With a laugh, she threw her arms around him. Yeah, you do. He scooped her off her feet. About that trip to Vegas. No. You're not considering the possibilities. With only one goal in mind now, he headed for the stairs. It's quick, convenient, colorful. We could spend our wedding night in a big heart-shaped bed under a full-length mirror. As appealing as that sounds, I'm going to pass. Why don't we... The crash at the back of the house had Gabe dropping her to her feet. Stay here, he ordered, and he shoved her toward the stairs. Before he could get halfway toward the sound, one of his grooms stumbled in, white-faced and wide-eyed. Mr. Slater? Jesus, Mr. Slater, you gotta come. It's Reno. Oh, my God, I think he's dead. There was no doubt of that. Though someone had had the courage and compassion to cut him down from where he had swung from a rope tied to a beam, there was no mistaking the sight of death. Kelsey couldn't take her eyes from it, the limp body decked out in riding silks, the horrible angle of the head with its livid bruises around the neck. Call the police, Gabe ordered. He turned Kelsey around roughly. Get out of here. Go home. No, I'm staying. I'm all right. I'm staying with you. He didn't have time to argue. Wait outside, goddammit, he exploded when she remained stubbornly beside him. Wait outside! She only shook her head. She did look away from Reno and found her eyes locked on Jameson's. His were glazed. With devastation or shock, she couldn't be sure. But she walked to him, gently leading him to a chair. Sit down now, Jamie. I found him. Somebody told me he was around and looking for me. I don't know why I came in here. I don't know why, except I did. And I found him. Just like the last time. I found him. Last time? Benny. Just like Benny. Oh, God. He buried his face in his hands. Oh, God, when will it stop? There's a note, Mr. Slater. A young stable boy crept closer. 
he whispered as though deaf had ears. There's a note on the bench there. I didn't touch it, he added. They always say you're not supposed to touch anything. That's right. Go wait outside for the police, will you? Sure, Mr. Slater. He hesitated. We cut him down, he blurted out. Maybe we weren't supposed to, but we couldn't just leave him like that. We had to get him down. You did the right thing. Gabe put a hand on the boy's shoulder. Wait outside now. Already dreading what he would find, Gabe walked over to the bench to the single sheet of paper handwritten. I'm sorry. It's the coward's way, but the only way I know. I'll never ride a horse again. I killed the best horse I ever had under me. As God is my witness, I didn't know it was a lethal dose. It was supposed to disqualify him, that's all, and settle a score. I never believed my father was guilty, until now. What he did, I did. What he did, I'll do. Bad blood. There's no fighting bad blood. Gabe turned from the note and looked at his trainer. Did you know, Jamie? Tears dripped onto Jameson's hands as he nodded. I knew. I knew Reno was Benny Morales' son. God help him. The pieces fit perfectly once they were turned to the light. Benny Morales, disgraced, despairing, had hanged himself, leaving behind a young, pregnant widow. She'd fled Virginia and had settled in Kansas, secluding herself and the infant son she bore from the scandal. When Reno was five, she married again. Reno took his stepfather's name, but he never stopped dreaming of his real father. From Benny he inherited his small stature, his quick hands, and his love of horses. So he followed in his father's footsteps, working his way up from hot walker to exercise boy and to apprentice jockey. Obsessed with his father's memory, he moved to Virginia. He trusted only Jameson, his father's closest friend, with his secret, and Jameson kept it. He had scrapbooks on his father. Two days after the suicide, Rossi shared some of the details with Gabe. Almost a library of them. Several of them were dedicated to the accusations made against his father, the investigation and the suicide. His mother and stepfather are coming out today from Kansas to claim the body. I can tell you from my talk with her that she supports the fact that he had an unhealthy obsession with his father. Reno saw him as a hero and a scapegoat, and he was determined to right the old wrong. By drugging the Chadwick Colt, Gabe said softly, disqualifying it from the derby. Morales was writing for the Chadwicks when he took the fall that kept him out of racing for more than a year. Rossi didn't need his notes, but he flipped through his book out of habit. Then, when the horse, Sunspot, had to be put down at Keeneland, Matthew Chadwick was one of the most outspoken against Benny Morales. He had, after all, lost a valuable investment due to the tampering. Bad blood. Gabe set his teeth. There's still a matter of where Reno got the drug. I think we can figure he injected the horse sometime after weigh-in and before they were loaded in the gate. Most probably while they were in the tunnel. But how did he get it, and from whom? It doesn't seem it would be that difficult for a man in his position, Mr. Slater. Reno had been around track since he was a teenager. He'd have known the right people and the wrong ones. If he'd gotten the drug himself, he wouldn't have mistaken the dose. He didn't intend to kill the horse, Lieutenant. That's clear to me. He made a mistake. Or he was duped. Have you looked up my father? This is a real family affair, isn't it? No, he said when Gabe remained silent. He moved out of his rooms, no forwarding address. The only reason I have to pursue that particular threat is your instinct. I'm trusting that, Mr. Slater. If he shows up around the track, anywhere in the area, we'll bring him in for questioning. He'll show. He's too vain to know when to cut his losses. He hadn't believed in his father's guilt. Kelsey stood at her bedroom window, fresh from a late afternoon shower, and stared out over the hills. Reno hadn't believed in his father's guilt, and so had spent most of his life pursuing that ghost, wanting to vindicate it, to avenge it. In the end, he had discovered something about the man whose blood ran through him and about himself that he had not been able to live with. It was always a risk to pry open doors to the past. She was encouraging Gabe to shrug off his own yoke of inheritance and be who he was. Yet she couldn't. Wasn't she risking everything she'd built with Naomi over the past months by probing, poking, prodding at that door? And when she opened it, 
When she found what was lurking in the dust behind it, would she be able to live with it? Let it go, she ordered herself. Why pick at something everyone wants locked? She had her whole life ahead of her, a life with Gabe, fresh new beginnings everywhere. All she had to do was turn away from the shadows and accept what was. Miss Kelsey? Kelsey answered without looking around. Yes, Gertie? Mr. Lingstrom's office is on the phone. He wanted to speak with Miss Naomi, but since she's out, he'll talk to you. All right, Gertie, I'll take it downstairs. She took the call in her mother's office on the business line. She listened, managed to make the appropriate comments. When the call was complete, Kelsey replaced the receiver carefully. She was still sitting at the desk when Naomi walked in. God save me from those foolish, time wasting luncheons. I don't know what makes me think I'm obliged to go. The only bright spot was that I happened to go into this little boutique near the restaurant when it was over. There was the most incredible dress, absolutely perfect for a simple garden wedding. They'll hold it for twenty four hours if you. She trailed off, the impetus that had carried her straight through the house to her daughter fading. Kelsey was staring at her, her hands locked together tightly on the desk. What is it? Naomi asked. Is it about Reno? Is there something else? No, it's not about Reno. She watched the relief flutter over Naomi's face. Your lawyer just phoned. Oh? Fresh nerves had Naomi lifting a hand to toy with the star shaped pin at her lapel. He wanted you to know that the documents you requested he'd draft are ready for your signature, she paused. The ones transferring half of Three Willows into my name. Well, then, that's fine. Why would you do something like that? It's something your grandfather and I discussed before he died. It was always my intention, Kelsey, and his. I'm just making it legal. Without telling me? I didn't want it to have the tone of an obligation, Naomi said carefully, on either my part or yours. There hasn't been a lot I've been able to give you. This is something I can. My father left the when and how up to me. But basically, this comes down to you through him. I felt this was the right time and the right way. This isn't a rope to tie you here, Kelsey, or to tie you to me. You must know I'm already tied here and to you. You gambled that I would be when you asked me to come. Yes, I did. I couldn't guess or even hope that you'd feel anything for me, but I was sure you'd feel it for Three Willows. One's very much the same as the other. A ghost of a smile moved over Naomi's lips. So I've been told. It's very difficult to love and respect one without loving and respecting the other. She rose, holding out her hands across the desk. I haven't been able to do that. I don't see why I should. Not everyone would have given me the chance. Naomi took Kelsey's hands and gripped hard. Not everyone had, Kelsey thought. But she would take the risk and try to change that. It was nearly five when she pulled up in Tipton's driveway behind his dusty late model pickup. The neighbor's dog sent up a din, racing back and forth along the chain link fence that separated the lawns, as if to warn her his ground was sacrosanct. A woman leaned out of an upstairs window and shouted the dog down before eyeing Kelsey. Looking for Jim? Yes, I am. Is he home? In the shop, she pointed, shook her head. Can't you hear the racket? Indeed, she could, now that the dog had quieted to low, throaty snarls. She followed the high pitched whine of a power saw into the backyard. There was a small shed, one that could be put together from a kit bought at most lumber yards. Kelsey knocked on a door that hung crookedly on its jamb. At the slight tap, it swung wide and banged against the inner wall. Tipton stood at a bench, safety glasses and ear protectors in place. His Orioles cap turned into the catcher's position. Sawdust flew as he sheared off a two by four. Kelsey decided it was safer for both of them if she waited for the blade to stop whirling. Gotcha, you son of a bitch, Tipton muttered as a chunk of wood hit the ground. Captain Tipton? He whirled around, looking very much like something out of a bee horror movie, his eyes shaded by amber toned plastic, his ear protectors bulging and gray, and red splotches dotting his shirt. Oh, God, you've cut yourself! Where? What? Alarmed, Tipton checked to make sure all his fingers were in place as Kelsey dashed across the shed. Oh, this! Grinning, he patted his chest. 
Cranberry juice. The wife doesn't like me to work in good clothes. Kelsey leaned weakly against the bench and swore. Scared you, huh? Still chuckling, he pulled off his ear guards and pushed up his goggles. Want to sit down? No, I'm fine. I'm building some shelves. He picked up a wide, flat board, sighted down it for warping. The wife and I have this little game. I build shelves and she fills them up with doodads. Keeps us both happy. That's nice. I wonder if you could spare a few minutes. I might be able to squeeze you in. Lemonade? Without waiting for her assent, he hefted a big plastic jug and poured two paper cups. You had some more trouble out your way, I hear. Yes, it's an odd coincidence, isn't it? That Reno should so completely mirror his father's life and death? The world's full of odd coincidences, Miss Biden. But he wasn't happy about this one. He'd completed his background check on Benny Morales and had gathered all the details only hours before Reno's suicide. Another 24 hours, he thought, and events might have taken a different turn. Solves one of your problems, though. You know who did your horse. Reno didn't mean to kill him. I'm certain of that. She sipped the lemonade, found it tart and swimming with pulp. His wife, she thought, must squeeze her own. Someone used him, Captain. There's a lot of that in the world, too, people using people. Can't argue with you there. My mother was using Alec Bradley to make my father jealous, to prove her own independence, even to incite gossip. I wonder, though, how had Alec Bradley been using her? The girl had a nice, tidy mind, Tipton decided. He picked up a square of sandpaper and began to rub it over a curved slat of wood. She's a beautiful woman. This isn't about sex, Captain. Rape isn't about sex. He huffed out a breath. Maybe not. We only ever had her word about the attempted rape. I believe her. So did you. Did you ever ask yourself why, if she was telling the truth, why Alec Bradley chose that particular night to attack her? They'd been seeing each other for weeks. She's not the kind of woman who could continue to see a man who abused her or who threatened to abuse her. Tipton continued to sand the wood. It would be a rocking chair for his granddaughter on her birthday in September. If she was telling the truth, Miss Biden, if. He'd been drinking. They'd had a public scene. She'd given him his walking papers and a face full of French champagne. That kind of combination could push a certain kind of man in the wrong direction. He blew lightly at the wood dust. But like I said, there was no evidence to support it. Her nightgown was torn. She had bruises. Kelsey let out an impatient sound at his shrug. All right, as easily self-inflicted as not. But if we say not, if we believe not, how do you prove it? You checked his background, certainly. If there was another woman, someone else he'd abused or attacked, that would weigh on Naomi's side, wouldn't it? I never found one. A lot of rapes go unreported, especially the kind you're talking about, the date-rape kind. He didn't like that particular term, date-rape, acquaintance-rape. It made the vicious act seem much too friendly. And back twenty years ago, people had a different attitude. Bradley had a reputation, but violence wasn't part of it. He had some heavy debts, Tipton continued almost to himself. About the time he started seeing your mother, he paid off some of them. About twenty thousand dollars worth. But he needed at least that much again to pull himself out. So he needed money. My mother had money. He never asked her for more than a couple of grand. Tipton set the wood aside. That's her own statement. He never asked her for big money. And that's one of the things I found odd, because it was his pattern to sponge off women. He might have been biding his time, or he might have been expecting it from another source. That was a thought. Tipton pulled a baby Ruth bar from his back pocket, snapped it in half, and offered a share to Kelsey. I never tracked it down, though. I always wondered where he got that twenty grand. Could have won it at the track. But the word there was that he lost as much as he won, and most of it was Penny Annie. He talked big, Tipton added with a mouthful of chocolate. Let a lot of people know he had a deal in the works. Just talk as far as I could find. But if he did, if it had something to do with my mother, Kelsey began to pace the shop as she worked it out. She was through with him, told him it was over. So he panicked, tried to force her. If she cut him loose, the deal was dead. He needed money. A lot of people knew he needed money. 
but who would have used him to get to my mother? As the answer swam into her mind, she stopped. The hand holding the paper cup tightened, crushing it into a damp blob. That's the trouble when you turn over rocks, Tipton said kindly. You hardly ever like what you find under them. I never linked your father to Alec Bradley, and I tried. I subpoenaed your father's bank records, went over them with a fine-toothed comb looking for that $20,000 payment. He was clean. Phone records, too. No calls came from or to Alec Bradley's number from the house in Potomac or his office at the university. He would never have done such a thing. The way it looks, you're right. Of course, that puts the heat back on your mother. There's another answer, Kelsey whirled back. I know there's another answer. You want another answer, Tipton said gently. Maybe you'll find it. Maybe you won't like it. He sighed and reached out to take the squashed cup from her hand. I only had one thing linking Philip Biden with what happened that night at Three Willows. That was Charles Rooney. Chapter 26 It was obvious something was wrong. She'd come to him after dark, saying only that she wanted to be with him. Gabe wanted to believe it was as simple as that, as true as that. But her eyes were distant, her smile too bright, with strain at the edges. Her needs, always a delight to him, were frenzied. She'd torn into sex with a wild abandon that couldn't quite mask the desperation. As if she'd been purging herself, he thought now that she lay quiet beside him. His body had responded, and in that most elemental link they had met, clashed, and joined. But he thought now, as the silence stretched out between them, neither of them had been satisfied. "'Are you ready now?' he asked her. She turned her head, looking for a cooler place to rest her cheek on the warm sheets. "'Ready? To tell me what's eating you?' "'What should be eating me?' Her voice was dull, tired. "'A man I knew and liked killed himself a few days ago. "'This isn't about Reno. It's about you.' She turned on her back, staring up at the dark skylight. No moon tonight, she thought. The clouds masked it like smoke. It really took very little to hide so much. He loved his father, she began. He didn't even know him, but he loved him. Believed in him. Everything Reno did circled back to that love and belief. Blind, unquestioning love and belief. She sighed once. And when he realized it had been misplaced... At least the belief had been misplaced. He couldn't live with it. She shifted restlessly, the sound of her skin against the sheets a whisper in the darkness. It would have been better if he'd turned away from it, wouldn't it? Better for him, better for everyone, if he'd left what happened all those years ago alone? What's to be proved, Gabe? What's to be solved by insisting on looking back? Depends on how badly you need to look, and what you find. He touched her hair, let it sift through his fingers. This is about you, isn't it, Kelsey? About you and Naomi. She considers it over. Why can't I? There's no turning back the clock, giving her back those years we lost, that we both lost. She killed Alec Bradley. I should accept that. I shouldn't let it matter so much why. Kelsey moved again, pushing herself up, drawing in her knees, circling them with her arms in a move of such poignant defense it tore at his heart. Then let it go. Let it go, she repeated. It's the sensible thing. After all, whatever wrong she did, whatever mistake she made, she's paid for. I didn't know her then, or don't remember knowing her. What makes me think I can go back and sort it out, or that I should? She's happy, my father's happy. Neither of them would thank me for digging into it. I've no right to scrape open old wounds just to satisfy my own ridiculous need for truth. For justice. Squeezing her eyes tight, she pressed her face to her knees. They're not always the same, are they? Truth and justice. They should be. One of the most admirable things about you is that you want them to be. He brushed a hand over her shoulder, felt the knots of tension, and began to massage them out. What stirred this up, Kelsey? She took a long, steadying breath and told him about her visit to Tipton. He didn't interrupt and tried to deal with his own knee-jerk anger that she had gone without him. And now you're worried that your father was somehow involved. He couldn't have been. Her head shot up. 
In the dark, her eyes shone with defiance and a plea for understanding. He couldn't have been Gabe. You don't know him. No, I don't. Annoyed with himself, Gabe drew away and reached for a cigar on the night table. We've skipped that little amenity. She passed a weary hand through her hair. Somehow she'd managed to hurt him. This has all happened so fast. Everything between you and me has happened at double time. And the situation, my family situation, is on very rocky ground. It isn't that I've kept you from him. Forget it. He snapped on his lighter and scowled into the flame. Forget it, he said again, more quietly. It's hardly the point, and it's not what's annoying me. I would have gone with you today. I should have been with you. It was an impulse. That was the truth, she thought, but only half the truth. Maybe I wanted to go alone. Maybe I needed to. I don't want to be protected, Gabe. All my life I've been protected without even knowing it. I can't live the rest of it that way. There's a difference between being protected and being supported. I need you to lean on me, Kelsey, just like I need to know I can lean on you. After a moment, she took his hand. Do you have to be right? I prefer it that way. He lifted her fingers to his lips. What do you want to do? What I want is to forget it, to let it all alone and go from here. But I can't. I have to know, and when I do, I have to live with whatever I find out. She measured her palm against his, then laced fingers. I'm going to see Rooney tomorrow afternoon. Will you come with me? More lies, Kelsey thought, of the little white variety. You're going to love the dress. Naomi held out the pale lavender business card. The clerk's name's on the back. Ilsa. They do alterations right there. That's great. If it doesn't suit you, I'm sure you'll find something else. It's a wonderful shop. Oh, and I spoke to the caterer at the club. I know you want to keep the wedding simple, but you have to have food. He's going to work up a couple of menus for you to choose from. And... She snatched up another list. I know Gabe has a wonderful garden, and he's got an innate touch with flowers. But you'll want some patio plants and cut arrangements to fill things out. Once you decide on your colors, we can order what you like. That's fine. Listen to me. Laughing at herself, Naomi set the lists back on the desk. I've fallen headfirst into the mother of the bride trap. I'm annoying myself. Kelsey forced her lips to curve, tried to make the smile reflect in her eyes. No, I appreciate it, really. Even with a small, informal wedding at home, there are dozens of details. That you're perfectly capable of handling yourself, Naomi finished. I know you've had the big, splashy wedding, Kelsey, and that you want this to be different. I do, yes. Kelsey turned the business card over in her hand, then stuck it guiltily in her pocket. Candace orchestrated that. I barely had to do more than show up. Hearing herself, she hissed out of breath. That sounds ungrateful. I'm not. She was wonderful. But you'd like to handle this one yourself. Let's just say I'd like more of a hand in it. But I don't mind delegating. I never thought I'd have this chance. Planning my daughter's wedding. Determined, she pushed all her lists into a pile, topped them with a brass paperweight. Just yank me back when I threatened to go overboard. And she eased a hip onto the corner of the desk. About the dress. I promise I won't say a word if you don't love it, but you will. Now you'd better go before I nag you into letting me go along with you instead of Gabe. We'll shop for your dress together, Kelsey said as guilt piled over guilt. Maybe over the weekend. I'd like that. Breezily, Naomi linked her arm through Kelsey's as she walked Kelsey to the door. It'll give me a chance to harass you about photographers. Now go enjoy yourself. Kelsey mumbled something and walked outside just as Gabe pulled up in the drive. We have to make a stop first, Kelsey told him, pulling out the business card after she'd settled into the passenger seat. He lifted a brow. Shopping? Soothing my conscience. It didn't work, even when it turned out that Naomi had been completely right about the dress, or perhaps because of it. Under any other circumstances, the dress would have lifted her spirits. The pale rose color of the silk, the elegant tea length, the simple lines enhanced by raindrops of seed pearls. It was a wish of a dress that Ilsa assured her might have been made with Kelsey in mind. And didn't they have the sweetest hat to go with it, the clerk expounded. 
a little whimsy with a flirty fingertip veil so perfect for an intimate outdoor wedding. Shoes, of course, classic satin pumps that could be dyed to match. What flowers was she going to carry? She didn't know. White roses would be lovely, she was assured. A bride was entitled to white. Now, did she want to take the dress and had along with her or have them sent? She took them along, moving through the transaction as if in a dream. It was so strange and so simple. You didn't model it for me, Gabe commented as he walked with her back to the car. Bad luck, she said absently. Then she stopped, pressing her hands to her flushed cheeks. God, did I just buy a wedding dress? Apparently. He took her shoulders, turned her to face him. Second thoughts? No, no, not about you, us. This, it's just moving so quickly. I just bought my wedding dress and a hat. I actually bought a hat. I'm having shoes dyed, and I haven't even told my family. You can rectify that today, if it's what you want. He put the boxes in the trunk. Okay. She nodded and reached for the door handle. Gabe closed his hand over hers, then drew it back. Let's try this on for luck, then. He slipped a ring on her finger, a single square-cut diamond centered in a gold band crusted with tiny rubies. My colors. Our colors now. That's official. Tears pricked at her eyes. They may have been standing in a parking lot with the summer sun beating down, but to her, the moment was as romantic as a cruise down a moonlit stream. It's beautiful, Gabe. I didn't need it. I did. Across the lot, Rich huddled in his car and watched the exchange, the embrace. He took a nip from his flask. And what a handsome couple they make, he thought bitterly. His son and the slut's daughter. It was Gabe's fault he was on the run again, that he was going to have to fold his tent and slink off. There would be no triumphant drive to Vegas now. The cops were asking questions. Rich had dragged that much out of Cunningham when he'd squeezed the man for another two thousand. Let them ask, he thought, switching on his ignition when the jaguars roared to life. He wouldn't be around to answer. No, sir. Rich Slater was taking the high road all the way to Mexico, just as soon as he took care of a little business. He slipped out of the lot, keeping the jaguar in sight. We're going to have to be obnoxious. Kelsey told Gabe as they wove their way through Alexandria's traffic. Rooney refused to take any of my calls. So we'll be obnoxious. You think I'm wasting my time. What's important is what you think. You want to talk to him, we'll talk to him. She shifted in her seat, wishing they could hurry up, wishing they could take forever. I suppose I want to know how involved my father was in Rooney's investigation. If Dad knew Alec Bradley or just of him... I need to clear it in my mind. I don't suppose it changes anything that happened that night, but I need to know. You could ask your father. I'll have to, sooner or later. For now, I'd... Her voice trailed off. Abruptly, she straightened in her seat and leaned forward as Gabe turned into the parking garage beneath Rooney's building. What is it? That car, the one that just pulled out. Gabe flicked a glance at his rearview mirror in time to see the car turn left and join the flow of traffic. The black Lincoln? My grandmother. Kelsey rubbed at the chill on her arms. That was my grandmother's car. It was her driver at the wheel. I recognized him. There are a lot of offices in this building, Kelsey. And life's full of odd coincidences. No. She shook her head, staring straight ahead when Gabe pulled the car into an empty space. I don't believe it. She was here to see Rooney. I'm going to find out why. As they crossed the elevator, Gabe took her arm. She was all but vibrating with temper and nerves. If you go in guns blazing, you'll spook him. Whatever it takes. She stepped in, then jabbed the button for Rooney's floor. She might have been packing six guns, Gabe thought, the way she stalked the receptionist in Rooney's plush outer office. Kelsey Biden and Gabriel Slater to see Mr. Rooney. The woman's professional smile flashed. Do you have an appointment? No. I'm sorry, Miss Biden. Mr. Slate... Don't be, Kelsey interrupted and leaned on the desk in a manner that had the professional smile dimming considerably. Just tell him we're here and we're not leaving until we see him. Oh, and you might mention that I just saw my grandmother leaving, Millicent Biden. It turned the key. 
Within ten minutes they were being ushered into Rooney's office. He didn't rise from his desk this time, but greeted them both with a single terse nod. "'You've caught me at a bad time. I'm afraid I can't spare more than five minutes.' "'We might have managed a more convenient time, Mr. Rooney, if you'd taken any of my calls.' "'Miss Biden, trying to exude patience, Rooney folded his hands on the desk. "'He succeeded in looking like a man begging. "'I've tried to save both of us time and trouble. I can't help you. "'Why were you there that night, Mr. Rooney? "'You see, that's a question I keep returning to. "'Maybe it's because it all happened so long ago, "'and I see it from a different perspective from those who were involved in the heat of the moment.' "'But why that night, that particular night of all nights? "'I was on routine surveillance. "'It's just as viable to ask yourself "'why your mother chose that particular night to shoot Alec Bradley.' "'I know the answer to that,' Kelsey returned steadily. "'I'm wondering if you do. "'How much did you really see?' "'That's a matter of record,' he rose, dismissing them. "'I can't help you. "'How far did my father tell you to go?' Did he approve your decision to sneak onto my mother's property and spy through her windows? I'm paid to use my own judgment. You must have come to know my mother and Alec Bradley very well in those weeks that you followed them. Did you ever follow only him? See who he met, who he spoke with, who might have given him money? He could barely swallow, then realized it wasn't necessary. The saliva in his mouth had dried up. I was hired to investigate your mother. "'But he was part of your investigation. "'How well did my father know him?' "'Rooney's jaw tightened. "'To my knowledge, they were not acquainted. "'Outwardly cool, Kelsey merely lifted a brow. "'He had no interest in the man his wife "'was allegedly having an affair with? "'A strange wife. "'And no, at that point in time, "'Philip Biden was only interested in one thing, his child. "'But when you reported to him, "'I reported to his lawyers.' Whether or not he read the copies they sent him, I can't say. He didn't want to be involved. A small smile touched Rooney's mouth. He felt the idea of hiring an investigator was undignified. But he did hire you. Perhaps he felt the ends justified the means. I have another appointment. You'll have to excuse me. Why did my grandmother come here today? That's confidential. She's a client? I can't help you, he said, spacing his words but his eyes flicked to Gabe, then away. Alone, Rooney sat behind his desk, steadying his breathing. He reached into his pocket and thumbed out a Tums that would do little to ease the burning in his gut. How could it come back like this, after all these years? He'd gone by the book. He'd followed the book to the letter for twenty-three years. How could one night so long ago spring back at him like a tiger? He started at the sound of his buzzer, then cursed himself. He wouldn't help the situation if he let nerves rattle him. He answered the buzzer. Mr. Rooney, there's a gentleman to see you. He doesn't have an appointment, but he claims to be an old friend. I'm to tell you it's old rich. I don't know any... His mouth went dry again, his palms damp. For one frantic moment, Rooney looked around his office for a route of escape. There was none, he realized. He was as terminally hooked as the glass-eyed swordfish on his wall. Send him in and hold my calls, please. Yes, sir. Rich was beaming when he stepped into Rooney's office. Long time no see. What do you want? Rich sat, propped his feet on the desk. You put on a little weight, Charlie. Looks good on you, though. Used to look a little like a scarecrow. Why don't you buy an old pal a drink? "'What do you want?' Rooney repeated. "'Well, you can start by telling me what my boy and that pretty lady of his wanted with you.' Rich drew out a cigarette. "'We'll work from there.' "'I don't feel a whole lot better,' Kelsey said when they climbed back into the car. "'Am I supposed to be glad that my father hired that man "'but kept himself distant so he wouldn't soil his dignity? "'Or should I be relieved that he had nothing to do with Rooney or Alec Bradley?' Maybe you should spend some time wondering why Rooney was so nervous. Nervous? He seemed cold, remote, and annoyed, but not nervous. He had his hands locked together to keep them still. Gabe backed out of the parking space. The air conditioning was blasting in that office, but he was sweating. His jaw was locked so tight he had a tick at the corner of his mouth. He was bluffing his way through it. 
Gabe paid the attendant, then eased back into the street. But little things kept giving him away, and his eyes. He had the look of a man who's holding trash but keeps bumping the pot. Curious and fascinated, Kelsey studied him. You get all that from gambling? It's a gift. Something's got him spooked. All we have to do is find out what, she sighed. I need a phone booth, Gabe. I think it's time I rounded up the family. Millicent accepted the sherry her son poured her, and feeling magnanimous, patted his hand. She's finally come to her senses. Don't look so concerned, Philip. I'm quite willing to put these past few months behind us. She's a biden, after all. She sat back, sighed, sipped. Blood will tell. I certainly hope she's brought Channing with her. Candace paced to the window and flicked the lace curtain impatiently. I see no reason why he should stay at that place if Kelsey's coming home. Channing's doing what's right for him. Philip put a gentle hand on Candace's shoulder. Part of her wanted to shrug it off, but another, deeper part, couldn't bear the thought of any more harsh words between them. I want him to be happy, Philip. You know I do. Of course you do. The boy will come around, Millicent assured them. It's just youthful defiance, that's all, and sentiment. A vet. Really, now, that will pass. She flicked Channing's dream aside with one elegant hand. Why, there was a time, if you can imagine it, when Philip was a boy. Do you remember, dear? And he wanted to be a baseball player, of all things. I remember, he murmured. He'd been sixteen, eager, and despite his bookish appearance, he'd had an arm like a rocket. Of course, that dream had been aborted in its embryonic state. A Biden didn't play professional sports. A Biden was a professional. Channing will listen to reason, just as Philip did. Your mistake, Candace, dear, was in not asserting your authority. Channing's over twenty-one, Candace said stiffly. A mother is always a mother. Millicent's smile settled comfortably when the doorbell chimed. Ah, oh, that will be the prodigal daughter now. Let her apologize first, Philip. She'll feel better for it. Then we'll have Cook kill the fatted calf. But Gelsey didn't look apologetic when she entered the sitting room with Gabe at her side. She did smile at her father and go to him for a greeting kiss. Hoping to mend fences, she embraced Candace before turning to her grandmother. Thank you for seeing me. She leaned down and kissed Millicent's lightly powdered cheek. Grandmother? Dad? Candace? This is Gabriel Slater. Gabe? Millicent? Candace? And Philip Biden? It's nice to meet you. Philip offered a hand. I don't mean to be rude. Millicent's eyes were cold as they lingered on Gabe. But I had the impression there was family business to be discussed. Yes, there is. Old and new. I suppose I should start with the new. Gabe and I are going to be married. There was a moment of stunned silence before Philip recovered. Well, that's a surprise. A happy one. A bombshell, Candace corrected. And just like you, Kelsey. But she softened at the idea of orange blossoms. Now I suppose sherry won't do. We'll have to have champagne. I won't have it. Millicent spoke, her face bone white beneath her rouge. I won't have this insulting behavior in my home. Mother, Philip began tentatively. My home, she said again, thumping a fist on the arm of her chair. Is this a slap at me? she demanded of Kelsey. A subtle insult? You would bring this person into my home, threaten to bring him into this family? Even knowing Millicent, Kelsey was shocked at the reaction. It's not a slap, an insult, or a threat. It's a fact. We're getting married in a few weeks at Gabe's home in Virginia. I'd like it very much if all of you would be there. Of course we will. Eager to smooth over the rough edges, Candace stepped in. We're all just a little flustered by the suddenness of the announcement, but we wouldn't miss it for the world. I hope you'll let me help you with some of the details. Enough! Millicent slammed her sherry down with a force that snapped the fragile stem. The remaining drops of amber liquid dripped down to spot the rug. There is most certainly not going to be a wedding. Apparently, Kelsey, you've allowed yourself to be swayed by an attractive face. That's foolish, but not irrevocable. With an effort, she steadied her breathing and maintained her self-control. 
There has been no public announcement, so there will be nothing to tidy up. You, she pointed at Gabe, you can save yourself some embarrassment now by leaving. I don't think so, he said evenly. Embarrass me. We'll both go. Trembling with rage, Kelsey took his hand. This was a mistake. Whatever else I have to say to my grandmother, I can say it another time. I shouldn't have brought you here and subjected you to this. Stop it. Gabe brought their joined hands to his lips, kissed hers just above the ring. Let her finish. I'm going to ask you to let me apologize. Philip moved between his mother's chair and his daughter. Certainly this has come as a surprise. It might be best if we talk about it later. Don't shield the girl. Millicent rose and walked to a glossy Chippendale desk. You've done that long enough. It's time she learned to face facts. I have been, Kelsey murmured. For some time now. Then deal with these. She drew out a file from the desk. I've compiled quite a bit of information on you, Mr. Slater. Quite a bit. Professional gambler, ex-convict, the son of an itinerant drunkard with no visible means of support and a cleaning woman, a runaway who lived on the streets and spent time in jail for illegal gambling. She kept the file clutched in her hand as she studied Gabe with cold, condemning eyes. You may have developed a taste for the finer things and amassed some of them, but it doesn't change who you are. No, it doesn't, Gabe agreed. Just as being born with them doesn't change who you are. She slapped the file back on the desk. Get out of my house! Wait! Kelsey's hand closed convulsively around Gabe's arm. How dare you do this? How dare you pry into Gabe's personal life and mine? I'll do whatever is necessary to protect the Biden name. And you, despite this sudden attachment you've developed for that woman, are a Biden. That woman is my mother. Did you put a dossier together on her as well? she demanded. Did you search for nasty little secrets to throw in my father's face to try to keep him from marrying her? It was, to my regret, one of the few times in his life he didn't listen to me. The scene had been all too similar to this, Millicent remembered. Philip had actually shouted at her and given her the ultimatum of accepting that woman or losing her own son. No, he didn't listen, she repeated, and the results were disastrous. I'm one of the results, Kelsey tossed back. Is that what you were doing in Rooney's office this afternoon? Millicent used one arm to brace herself against the desk. I don't know what you're talking about. I saw you. You hired him again, didn't you? To spy on Gabe, to pry into his past. It was just a necessary evil to compile information that would bring you to your senses, Millicent defended. Well, you wasted your money. It doesn't make any difference to me. I already know all of it. Then you're more your mother than I wanted to believe. You deserve what becomes of you. You're right, Kelsey turned to her father. Did you fall out of love with her dad, or did you allow yourself to be shoved out of it? Kelsey, he said, his voice hoarse, because all at once he wasn't sure of the answer. What happened then happened. I apologize with all my heart for this. Rigid with shock and embarrassment, he looked at Gabe. To both of you. Apologize? Millicent spat out. I've told you the kind of man he is, the kind of man she's using to humiliate this family, and you apologize? Yes. With sorrow in his eyes, Philip looked at his mother. I apologize for you, for the fact that you've used the family name like a whip, a name that has always meant more to you than something as simple as happiness. Pale as death, Millicent gripped the edge of the desk. I will not be spoken to like that by my son in my own home. Her eyes flashed back to Kelsey. She's at the root of this. Naomi is the root of this. Kelsey nodded slowly. Perhaps she is. I'm sorry. I won't be back. Let's go home, Gabe. Kelsey, flushed pink, Candace dashed after them, stopping them at the door. Please, don't blame your father. I'm trying not to. He would never have allowed this to happen if he'd known. Surely you know what kind of man he is. Kelsey looked into Candace's worried eyes. 
Yes, I do. You know, I always thought how well you and Dad were suited, how you complimented each other, filled in the blanks. Leaning forward, she kissed Candace softly on the cheek. I didn't realize until right now how much you love him. I should have. Tell him I'll call him later, all right? Yes, yes, I will. And Kelsey, her smile was a little crooked, but it was there. Best wishes to both of you. Chapter 27 Quite a family you've got there, darling. Okay, Gabe. Once he'd parked in the drive at Three Willows, Kelsey got out of the car and closed her door with deliberate care. This isn't the time to get cute. No, I mean it. I let you rant half the way home and stew the other half. That ought to finish it. She wasn't nearly finished. It wasn't just about me. It wasn't really about me at all. It was about you. Hell, in an easy motion, he swung an arm around her shoulder. I've had a lot worse tossed at me. She didn't bring up the showgirl in Reno or the business in El Paso. That's hardly the point. She stopped dead on the first step. What showgirl? Got your attention. He gave her an almost brotherly squeeze. Anyway, I liked your father and your stepmother. That's two for three. Baffled, she could only stare up at him. You're not even angry. You're not even angry over what she did. Gabe, she hired a detective to pry into your life, to put together a file on you as though you were some kind of criminal. And what did she accomplish, Kelsey? You already knew the worst of me, and you defended even that. It makes my laying my cards out on the table up front the best gamble I ever took. It doesn't excuse what she did, but it makes what she did meaningless. Look, maybe I understand a little, because I never had a family name to defend. Now she stopped in her tracks. You're standing up for her? No, but I figure she made the wrong move, and it ended up costing her a lot more than it cost me. She blew at her bangs. Maybe I need a little more time to be open-minded. Get my dress out of the car, will you? At least we can make one person happy today when I show it to Naomi. Why don't I take you both out to dinner? He rubbed his thumb over the ring on her finger. He liked seeing it there. Celebrate? Why don't you? I'll go tell her. She hurried into the house, giving herself one quick shake, a gesture to toss off the worst of the day. She was halfway up the stairs when Naomi called her. Oh, there you are. One hand trailing along the banister, Kelsey rushed down again. You were absolutely right about the dress. Gabe's getting it out of the car. Then he's going to take us out to dinner. Should we see if we can drag Moses away from the barn? Naomi stood in the foyer, her hands clasped. We need to talk. It might be better if we sat down. What is it? Oh, God, not one of the horses. Justice was a little wheezy, but I dosed him the way Moses told me. It's not one of the horses, Kelsey. Please, come in and sit down. The stranger was back, that cool, controlled woman who had first invited her to tea. Baffled, Kelsey followed her through the doorway. You're angry with me about something. No, I don't think angry is the appropriate word. She glanced over when Gabe came through the door. It might be best if we discussed this privately. No, there's nothing you can't say to me in front of Gabe. All right, then. Naomi walked to the window, faced out. She needed all her control now, all the self-reliance she'd had to learn to survive in prison. You had a call while you were out. Gertie took the message. She left it on the desk in your room. I went in there a few minutes ago to take in a guest list I'd been putting together. Her face, expressionless, she turned around. I'll apologize for reading it. It wasn't intentional. It was simply there, and my eye fell on it. Why don't you just tell me who called? Charles Rooney. The message was marked urgent. He wants you to contact him as soon as possible. Then I'd better see what it's about. Please. Naomi held up a hand. After more than twenty years, I can't believe it could be so urgent. You've been to see him. Yes, twice. For what purpose, Kelsey? Haven't I answered your questions? Yes, you have. That's one of the reasons I went to see him. Because you've answered my questions. And you? She turned to Gabe, a flash of temper sneaking through the cracks. You encouraged her in this? It wasn't a matter of encouragement, but I understand. How could you understand? She demanded, bitter. How could either of you possibly understand? You can't imagine what went through me when I saw his name on the desk. 
I've spent more than a decade of my life trying to forget. I made myself dredge it up again, relive it again. A payment, I thought, I hoped, to bring my daughter back. But it's not enough? I didn't go to see him to hurt you. I'm sorry I have. I went because I wanted to help, because I hoped I would find something that would change things. They can't be changed. If he saw something that night, he didn't tell the police. If he held something back... Stunned, Naomi sank to the arm of the sofa. Did you think, really think, you could find something to clear my name? Is that what this is about, Kelsey? A belated bath for the dirty family linen? With a weak laugh, Naomi rubbed her eyes. God, what possible difference could it make now? You can't give me back one second of the time I lost. You can't take away one whisper, one sneer, one sidelong look. It's done, she said, dropping her hands. It's as dead and buried as Alec Bradley. Not to me. I did what I thought was right. And if Rooney called me, there's a reason. He didn't want to talk to me today. He was nervous, maybe even afraid. Just leave it alone. I can't do that. She stepped forward, gripping Naomi's cold hands in hers. There's more. What happened to Pride and Reno? It's so much like what happened all those years ago. Your horse, Benny Morales. It's like this terrible echo that's taken this long to catch up, and it hasn't stopped yet. Even the police wonder if there's a connection. The police. What color remained in Naomi's cheeks washed away. You've spoken with the police. Kelsey released her mother's hands and stepped back. I've been to see Captain Tipton. Tipton. The shudder came before she could stop it. Oh, God. He believed you. Kelsey watched Naomi lift her head. He told me he believed you. That's bull. Trembling, she sprang up. You weren't there, in that horrible room, with the questions pounding at you over and over and over. No one believed me, certainly not Tipton. If he had, why did I go to prison? He couldn't prove it. The photographs... Back to Rooney, Naomi interrupted. Do you really think you can turn this around? Discover some long-overlooked clue that proves I was defending my honor? The hurt throbbed in her heart, in her voice. Well, you can't. And even if you want to help, you won't be able to, because I can't survive going through it again. I just can't. She walked from the room and hurried up the stairs. Moments later, they heard the sound of a door slamming. What a mess! Kelsey dropped into a chair, closed her eyes. What a mess I've made of things! No, you haven't. You've stirred things up. Maybe they needed to be stirred up. We'd come a long way. She and I had come such a long way, Gabe. I've ruined that. Do you really believe that? I don't know. She lifted her hands, then let them fall. I started off telling myself I was asking questions for me, because I had a right to know. Somewhere along the line I twisted that, convinced myself I was doing it for her. But I think I was right in the first place. I wanted to tidy it all up, make it clean. If I believe her, everyone should believe her. That doesn't make you a villain, Kelsey. He crossed over and sat on the arm of her chair. Tell me what you want to do. She drew in a deep breath, expelled it. I'm going to call Charles Rooney. I have to finish it. They met him at a bar. Not a seedy, gin-soaked dive that might have added atmosphere to a clandestine meeting, but a plant-filled lounge that catered to white-collar professionals. Rooney had used every skill, every trick along his route to make certain he hadn't been followed. When he saw them come in, he finished off his first gin and tonic. He was done, and he knew it. He'd spent the hours since Rich Slater had left his office making plans to disappear. He had the knowledge, the contacts, and now he had the motive. Mr. Rooney? Sit down. I can recommend the house wine. Fine, Kelsey said, and nodded to the hovering waitress. Coffee, Gabe ordered. Black. You said urgent, he reminded Rooney. So I did. He tapped his glass to indicate another. One more for the road, he thought. By morning, he planned to be sipping a mimosa in Rio. I'm afraid I was a little rattled when I made that call. It was a day for unexpected visitors at my office. The last one was unpleasant. I've been an investigator for over 25 years. A long time. 
I've had a lot of interesting cases. I've never once discharged a weapon. He gave the table two brisk knocks. I enjoy my work, always have. It's difficult to build up the right clientele. A certain class of people, the right class of people, generally don't care to have an overt association with someone in my line of work. They hire us with the same kind of dismay and disgust that they hire someone to exterminate their roaches. They want the results, of course, but they really want to discuss the execution. There are some who prefer a more hands-on approach. He paused as their drinks were served. This is fascinating, Rooney, Gabe commented, but hardly urgent. Millicent Biden, he said, and watched Kelsey's mouth tighten. She's a woman accustomed to directing servants, giving orders, making certain they're carried out to her specification. We know she hired you to investigate Gabe. Kelsey washed the bad taste out of her mouth with wine. I hope you got a hefty retainer, Mr. Rooney. Believe me, she's far from satisfied with the result. Tossed them back in her face, did you? He found that amusing and chuckled into his drink. Maybe there's some justice in the world. She was satisfied with the results the first time she hired me. More than satisfied. The first time? It was your grandmother who hired me for the custody suit. My information is that you were hired by my father's lawyers. Her lawyers, Miss Biden. You should remember they were her lawyers, too. And that's the way she wanted it to shake down. He took the lime wedge from his drink and squeezed the juice into the glass. I'd done a job for an acquaintance of hers. Divorce. She must have figured I'd done a good one, a discreet one. And I fit the bill. Ambitious, still young enough to be impressed by who she was, who her husband was, and the size of her check. He shrugged that out and dipped into the bowl filled with pretzels shaped like Chinese characters. I don't see that it makes a large difference where your retainer came from, Kelsey commented. Oh, but it did. I never even met your father. I saw him at the trial, but we never had a one-on-one. -on -one. That's the way your grandmother wanted it, and she was good at getting things done her way. She wanted your mother out, all the way out of his life and yours, and she'd worked out a very simple plan to accomplish it. My job was to follow Naomi, take pictures, make reports. That's all Millicent Biden told me. But I'm a good investigator, Miss Biden. Even then I was good, and I found out more. More? Kelsey felt that door creak open a little wider and was afraid, very much afraid, of what she would see beyond it. It's easy enough to rub some elbows at the track. One of my sources had the goods on Bradley, knew he'd played deep and was in debt to the wrong people. Bradley wasn't good at keeping secrets, and he'd talked, talked about the big deal he was working on. All he had to do was make time with a beautiful woman, and he'd be set. Bradley and my source got chummy. They didn't run in the same circles, but they were cut pretty much from the same cloth. Bradley talked too much. My source put the arm on him for more, then passed the information on to me for a fee. You're taking a long time to circle round to the wire, Rooney, Gabe said. Then let me make it simple. He loosened his constricting tie. The custody suit was leaning toward Naomi. Courts don't like to take a kid from its mother. Maybe she liked a party, maybe she liked men, but she didn't fool with either when the kid was around. She had the money and the means, and there were plenty of people willing to testify that she was a good mother, a devoted one. So the Bidens needed something to tip the scales in their favor. Millicent found it in Alec Bradley. My, Kelsey took a moment to steady her voice, my grandmother knew Alec Bradley? Yes, she knew him, knew his parents knew his character. She hired Bradley to seduce your mother, to lure her into a compromising situation, the kind of situation that would make her appear anything but moral and maternal. Beneath the table, Kelsey gripped Gabe's hand. You're saying that my grandmother paid Alec Bradley? Paid him to... Why should I believe you? You believe what you want. Rooney didn't give a damn. He was just clearing his desk, so to speak, before he retired. You came after the answer, Miss Biden. Don't blame me if they don't suit you. She gave him twenty thousand dollars, up front. Kelsey made a small sound as the figure clicked. The trouble was, Naomi wasn't playing the game, not the way Bradley and your grandmother wanted. 
She was keeping him on a leash. The way the custody suit was heating up, your grandmother needed action. So she found another element to stir into the mix. There was some trouble at the track. A dead horse, a dead jockey. The publicity on that boomeranged in the Chadwick's favor. Gabe held up a hand. Are you saying that's connected? It's all connected. Bradley needed cash, but Millicent was keeping her wallet slammed shut until he produced results. So Bradley and his pal at the track worked out a little deal. When the horse went down, Bradley picked up some loose change, but he didn't get the bonus he'd hoped for when the sympathy went with Naomi. Millicent gave him a deadline. Rooney studied what was left of his drink, debated indulging in another. With less than two hours until his flight, he opted to keep a clear head. She told me to have my camera and plenty of film, to be outside the house. I went to the club first and watched Bradley stage the jealousy scene. Stage? Kelsey repeated. It's easier to see through an act when you're not involved. Plus, my source had alerted me. This was going to be the night. Bradley wanted to rile her. I don't think he expected her to cut him loose. He thought too much of himself when it came to the ladies. When your mother left, I was right behind her. There was nobody else in the house. Not until Bradley got there. My instructions were to take pictures, but only pictures that weighed in on the side of the Bidens. Your instructions, Kelsey said dully. From my grandmother. That's right. It looked promising at first, her opening the door in that nightgown, letting him in. They had another drink, and he was pouring on the charm. I got a good shot through the window of them kissing. I didn't bother to take one of her shoving him away. That wasn't my job. They started to argue. I could hear snatches through the window when she shouted loud enough. She was telling him to get out, that they were through. He grabbed her, pawed at her. Rooney lifted his eyes to Kelsey's. There was a minute there when I thought about going in, breaking it up. She was in trouble. There was no way to mistake what kind of trouble. But I didn't go in. I had my job to do. In any case, she fought him off. She was pissed, still more pissed than scared. She shouted at him, made a move for the phone, but he came after her again. I don't think she had any doubt about what was going to happen. She ran. Rooney paused, wiped a hand over his mouth. He knew I was there. The son of a bitch knew I was there. He looked right out the window and he pointed like this. Rooney jerked a finger at the ceiling. Upstairs, he was telling me. I'm going to take care of it upstairs. So I did what I'd been hired to do. I went up the tree. I couldn't hear anything, not the way my heart was pounding. I didn't let myself think. I had a job, a big one, one that was going to lead to a lot of others. And she'd asked for it, hadn't she? That's what I told myself. She'd asked for it, the way she'd been stringing him along. You knew he would rape her, Kelsey managed. You knew, and you did nothing. That's right. Rooney down the rest of his drink. She came into the bedroom, came running in. She was scared then, but she was mad, too. That filmy robe she'd been wearing was falling off her shoulder where it was torn. He came in after her, and he smiled. He looked friendly, even apologetic. The way they were framed in the window, facing each other, so completely focused on each other, with her clothes falling off and the shirt of his tux undone, it looked provocative, even sexy. I don't know what he was saying to her, but she was shaking her head and backing up. He reached down like he was going to unhook his pants. She slapped him. Rooney moistened his lips. I got that on film. He slapped her back. I didn't take that shot. He had to stop again. He hadn't realized how going through that night step by step would affect him. Then he'd felt small and scared. Now he simply felt small. She made a dive. She was out of my view for a minute. He put his hands up. He was still smiling, but it didn't look so friendly now. Then I could see her again, and I saw the gun. I started taking pictures fast then. I was scared. I kept taking them after she shot him, even when there was nothing to see. It was self-defense. Kelsey's fingers dug into Gabe's. Just as she said all along. Yeah, it was. Maybe, maybe she could have held him off once she had the gun, but she was scared. She was trapped. If all the facts had come out, I don't think they'd have charged her with so much as manslaughter. They sure as hell wouldn't have convicted her. But the facts didn't come out. No, I took them straight to Millicent and Biden. I wasn't thinking going to her house in the middle of the night, getting her out of bed. She poured me a brandy herself, told me to sit down. 
Then she listened to what I had to tell her, from beginning to end. She said it had worked out for the best. She instructed me to wait a day or two before going to the police. She knew, Kelsey whispered. So, she knew everything. She orchestrated it. If Naomi hadn't been arrested by then, I was to take the film to the cops and give my statement. I was to tell them what I saw, only what I saw, not what I assumed, not what I interpreted. Then she told me what I'd seen. A woman, provocatively dressed, welcoming her lover into an empty house. They shared a drink and embrace. Then they quarreled. The woman was jealous. That was obvious after the scene at the club. She went upstairs, her lover following to make apologies, amends, perhaps a seduction. And in a jealous rage, the woman took out a gun and killed him. She gave me another 5,000 cash that night and the promise of several references. White-faced, Kelsey slid from the booth. With one hand pressed to her heaving stomach, she dashed toward the restrooms. Gabe watched her go. He found that his fists were balled under the table. You're a revolting specimen, Rooney. A few thousand dollars and some fancy names on a client list. For that, you watch an attempted rape, then help see that the victim was locked away. There's more, Rooney said. We'll wait for Kelsey. Tell me this. Why did you decide to come out with all of this now? A few hours ago, you had nothing to say. It's getting complicated. I don't like being squeezed from two sides. Rooney shrugged. When this comes out, and I've decided it will, my reputation's shot. Looks to me like I'm about to retire a few years early. I might as well do it with a clean slate. I'm wondering, Gabe began, and his voice was cool, deceptively detached. If I should take you outside and beat you to a pulp, or if I should just let you live with this. Rooney picked up his glass and sipped the melted ice cube slowly. We all make our choices, Slater. You're a gambler. When you know the house has stacked the deck, are you going to bet against it? Some games you just don't play. He rose as Kelsey walked back to the booth. I'm all right. I'm sorry. She was still white around the lips, but her hand was steady when it gripped Gabe's. You hang on for a minute. He gave his attention back to Rooney. Let's have the rest. You're not going to like it. Millicent Biden didn't hire me just to compile your dossier, Mr. Slater. That came later. She put me on retainer months ago, right after Kelsey contacted Naomi Chadwick. Kelsey pressed her lips together, praying for her stomach to settle. I don't understand. But she thought she did. She was terrified that she did. Flat out, Rooney continued. She didn't want you there. Didn't want to take any chances that you and Naomi would click. How did she intend to prevent it? Well, since there wasn't anything to smear Naomi with since she'd been released from prison, Millicent made use of the past. After Alec Bradley was shot, I took her my files. All of my files. There was a lot of detail in them. Not just about Naomi. I'm thorough, you see. I had documentation on Bradley and his associate. The race fix. My suspicions on Cunningham's involvement. When she gave you a yank, Kelsey, and you didn't come to heel, she put that information to use. How? Kelsey braced herself. You'd better tell me how. She had me look up Bradley's old friend and lure him back to the area with the promise of a job. She didn't tell me what that job would be, but it didn't take long to figure it out, not with history repeating itself. A fixed race, a dead colt, Gossip and suspicion circled around Naomi and you. He jabbed a finger at Gabe. Millicent didn't want you anywhere near her blood kin. Kelsey was supposed to see just how unsavory racing was, how ruthless, and she was supposed to run back home. But I didn't. Kelsey could feel tears burning at her eyes, but she wouldn't free them. Not now. Not yet. You're telling me that she was behind it? Behind Pride's death? And God, Mix? Even a woman like Millicent can't control a man with no ethics. You could say that her hireling momentarily got away from her. She was steamed after the groom's murder, read me the riot act as if I'd stabbed the poor bastard myself. He shook his head, remembering. The horse, now, that's what she wanted. A recreation of crimes. A scandal to teach her granddaughter a lesson. 
because of me,' Kelsey murmured. Her hand lay limply under Gabe's. "'All of it because of me.' "'You're the last of the Biden line,' Rooney pointed out. "'She's set store by that, and she hates Naomi with a kind of cold-blooded passion that doesn't dilute with time. "'If she could ruin her again and keep control over you, it would all be worth it. "'She lent Cunningham enough money to buy that horse, Big Sheba, "'more than enough to keep him under her thumb and persuade him to work with her button man. "'Not that she liked it,' Rooney added, "'associating even from a distance with that type. "'But the ends justify.' "'I don't think I know the woman you're talking about,' Kelsey said slowly. "'I don't think I recognize her. "'How could she ruin so many lives?' "'Control them,' Rooney corrected. "'She never considered any of it more than necessary control. "'And I went along with it.' "'He rubbed a hand between his eyes. "'The first time I was young, eager, impressionable. "'This time I felt trapped. "'And hell, it was just a job.' My last visitor of the day changed things. He studied Gabe's face for a long moment. Maybe I'm getting old. Christ knows I'm tired. So when he showed up trying to make a new deal, I cut my losses. And maybe I like to think that I figured it was time for a little atonement. Rooney's eyes sharpened. Do you want to know how Benny Morales' son did the Chadwick Colt? How somebody nearly did one of yours, Slater? Look to your own organization. "'and look to your old man. "'That's right,' he said, smiling a little. "'Rich Slater wormed plenty of secrets out of Alec Bradley, "'and he was more than happy to use them "'and repeat the sequence when Millicent Biden sent for him. "'Revenge and control, revenge and money, "'her motives and his, makes a hell of a combination.'" Chapter 28 "'Pull over, will you?' A half mile from Longshot, Gabe swung to the shoulder of the road. Are you feeling sick again? No. She was, but not in the way he meant. I just need to walk for a minute. Can we walk? Without waiting for his answer, she pushed out of the car. The perfect night, she thought. The classic midsummer night in the country with a diamond-bright dome of sky, stars, and moon. Not even a wisp of a cloud to spoil it. The air smelled of the honeysuckle that was patiently bearing the fence along the rolling field to the right. The high grass that grew beyond it was alive with the chirp of crickets. As she walked, the soft shoulder gave under Kelsey's feet. "'It's too much,' she murmured. "'It's just too much to take in. "'How can I tell her, Gabe?' She spun around, her hands reaching for his, for a solution. "'How can I tell my mother that it was all planned?' that everything that happened was all part of some scheme to keep her away from me. First, he reached up to tuck her hair behind her ear. You stop blaming yourself. I'm not. She stopped, turning to lean on the fence, to look out over the shadowy hills. But I'm angry that I was used like a pawn. She wasn't even thinking of me as a child. I can see that. Not as a child. Certainly not as a person. Progeny. "'Kelsey said bitterly. "'That's all I was. "'All I am to her. "'Just the next Biden.' "'He started to speak, "'to offer some sort of comfort, "'then stopped. "'Sometimes it was kinder simply to listen. "'I think,' Kelsey continued, "'I really think she wanted to love me, "'that she tried, "'even succeeded for stretches of time. "'But the way she felt about my mother, "'and maybe, God, I hope, The guilt she lived with over what she'd done made it almost impossible. She wanted me to be a credit to the family name, educated at the best schools, knowledgeable about the arts, competent in music and other acceptable pastimes. My friends had to be from the right families. Maybe that's why I never made any who were really close to me. And every small rebellion, every flash of my own personality or needs was seen as a mirror of the woman she'd ruined. Kelsey plucked some honeysuckle from the vine and began slowly, systematically, to shred the fragile white blossoms. When I turned twelve, she wanted me to go to boarding school in England. My father refused. It was one of the few times I'd ever seen them quarrel. I needed discipline. I needed guidance. My father said I needed childhood. With a sigh, she rubbed the tattered petals between her fingers, stinging the air with scent. Did she realize that she was using him, too? 
another pawn. How responsible is she, Gabe, for destroying their marriage, whatever chance they had of making it work. That's the least of it, though, she murmured, and let the blossoms fall. Now I have to find a way to tell my mother why and how and who. And my father. I'll have to tell him, too, won't I? He has a right to know everything she did then, everything she's done now. She turned to him then, pressing her face to his chest, grateful that his arms were there to wrap around her. So much waste, so many lives lost or ruined, and it all trickles down to some horribly misplaced family pride. And a few more of the deadly sins, he said quietly, thinking of his own father. Envy, greed, lust. I've always believed more in luck than fate, but it's more than luck that brought this full circle. He drew her back so he could see her face. You and me, Kelsey. We've both been a part of it right from the beginning. And maybe we wouldn't be so close to ending it if we hadn't found each other. You'll want to find him now, won't you, your father? I'll have to find him. You could leave it to Rossi. Her grip tightened suddenly, urgently. Gabe, he wants to hurt you. If he went to Rooney's office so soon after we did, he was probably following us. He's looking for a way to get to you. So I'll find him first. That's my circle, Kelsey. I need to close it. But if we went to the police, why haven't we already called them? She looked away. He saw her heart, her needs too clearly. All right. I need to talk to Naomi first, and you need to find your father. Then we'll end it. I guess you'd better take me home. When they pulled up at Three Willows, she declined his offer to come in with her. She would do this alone. He waited until she went inside, until the front porch light went dark. Gabe had his own demons to face, and the first wasn't his father. Inside, Kelsey glanced up the stairs. It was late. Undoubtedly, Naomi was in bed. Wait until morning, she thought. It's waited so long already. Surely it could wait one more night. But that was cowardice. With a sigh, she headed toward the kitchen. She would brew a pot of tea first. That would give her a chance to sort out exactly how she would begin. Gertie? Kelsey was surprised to find the housekeeper up, loading the dishwasher. Oh, Miss Kelsey, you gave me such a start! The woman pressed a hand to the bodice of her pink chenille robe. It's after midnight. You shouldn't be working so late. Oh, I was just putting my dishes in. There was a Betty Davis movie on the TV tonight. Now, Voyager. I had me some lemon cake and a good cry. She sighed happily over the thought of it. They just don't make movies like that these days, Miss Kelsey. No, they don't. Struggling to hold the conversation, Kelsey moved to the range, her movements mechanical as she picked up the kettle and walked to the sink to fill it. Is everyone else in bed? You want some tea? Let me do that. Territorial, Gertie brushed her aside and set the kettle on to boil. Channing's out with Matt Gunner. That Tennessee walker of the Williamses got a case of the strangles. They don't know if he'll make it until morning. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's a shame that's the truth. Gertie busied herself warming a china pot while waiting for the kettle to boil. But I have to say Channing was mighty excited at the idea of sitting up half the night in a barn. I told him I'd leave the kitchen door unlatched for him, and there's a nice cold plate of chicken in the fridge. Then undoubtedly he'll be in heaven. It's a pleasure having him around here. For me, too. I need two cups, Gertie. I want to take a cup up to my mother. Oh, she's sleeping, honey. Gertie chose the chamomile and measured the leaves out by sight. Fact is, she looks so tired out and upset about something that I had her take a sleeping pill just an hour ago. A sleeping pill? She said I was fussing, but she didn't look well to me, all drawn out and pale. A good night's sleep is what she needed, and I told her so. I was going to check on her before I went to bed. I'll do it. Kelsey looked at the teapot with a mixture of resignation and relief. Just one cup then, Gertie, thanks. I'll talk to her in the morning. She'll be fine then, just overtired, I expect. Gertie put the pot on a tray, arranged the cup and saucer. She's looked better, happier these past few months than she has in a long, long time. That's your doing. It don't matter what else goes on, a mother pines for her child. I'm here now. I know it, honey. Don't you stay up too late? I won't. Good night, Gertie. Kelsey carried the tray upstairs, setting it in her room before going to look in on her mother. 
In the slant of moonlight through the window, she could see Naomi sleeping deeply. So it would be in the morning after all, she thought, and slipped into her own room to wait for the dawn. Gabe didn't bother to stop in at the house, but drove straight to the barn. He saw the light above the tack room and grimly circled around and climbed the stairs. He didn't knock. Jameson sat at his desk, paperwork in neat, organized piles, a single glass of brandy at his elbow. He looked up, blinking, owlishly. Gabe, what brings you up here so late? I could ask you the same. Oh, well, with a tired smile, Jameson gestured at the stacks of papers. There's always something needs dealing with. It's easier to concentrate at night when things are quiet. There's a jar of instant coffee over there, he added. You can heat up the pot on the hot plate. No. Gabe studied his trainer, his friend, in the yellow light of the desk lamp. The past months of strain and worry had taken their toll. The shadows under his eyes were like bruises, the lines bracketing his mouth so sharp and deep they might have been carved by a knife. Not the face of a man who had recently trained a horse to the triple crown. I used to hang around the barn a lot when I worked here, didn't I, Jamie? Tagged after you or Mick? That you did. Jameson relaxed the shoulders that had gone tense under Gabe's scrutiny. Or you'd hustle us into a poker game and hose us out of a week's pay. Cunningham never gave you much peace, as I remember. If you had one winner, he wanted two. Always a bigger race, a bigger purse. I remember he was always saying Moses over at Three Willows knew how to turn out champions, and if you didn't, he'd find someone who could. He was a hard man to work for. I trained good horses for him, won a lot of races. Had horse of the year back in the 80s with Try Again, but I never satisfied him. He wanted a derby winner. You never pulled that off, even after the Chadwicks lost that colt at Keeneland back in, uh, what was it, 73? And Cunningham's was the favorite. You didn't pull it off. Gabe's voice was quiet, cool. That colt came in third, as I remember. A disappointing third. That must have been hard to take after all you'd gone through to see him under the wire first. The memory had Jameson's mouth twitching. A show at the Derby's no shame. The colt didn't run his best that day. Lost it in the last furlong. And things were hard around here, mighty hard. He lifted his brandy, drank. After Benny hung himself. You and Benny were tired. We were good friends. Yeah, good friends. Gabe turned a chair around, straddled it. How much did you have to do with it, Jamie, then and now? What are you getting at? You and Benny were close. Did you talk him into fixing the race, or did you just go along with it? I'll tell you what I think. "'Gabe continued without waiting for an answer. "'I think you asked him to help you out. "'Give the colt a little edge. "'Cunningham was pushing you for that edge. "'Maybe he offered you a bigger cut of the purse. "'Maybe he just kept the pressure on until you broke. "'And when you broke, you took Benny Morales along with you.' "'His eyes never left Jameson's face. "'A derby win, Jamie. "'Something you've always wanted and up until now never quite pulled off. That's foolish talk, Gabe. You've known me too long. I have, Jamie. I've known you too long not to know that nothing goes on in that barn that you don't have a hand in. I didn't put you together with what happened to the Three Willows colt this time, or what nearly happened to mine. My mistake, he said, watching Jameson's eyes drop. Never figured you'd kill a horse just to win a race. Any race. Gabe took out a cigar, studying it from tip to tip while Jameson remained silent. That's what blinded me, Jamie, until Reno. He didn't know it was a lethal dose. Neither did you. You were just giving my colt the edge, weren't you, by seeing that pride was eliminated. Is that how my father put it to you, Jamie? Give yourself the edge? I wanted my own place, Jameson whispered. A man deserves his own after so many years of tending someone else's. Any other year that colt would have won the derby laughing. Why was it Moses should have one that could match him? Why was it? Bad luck. Gabe lit his cigar. He'd stopped feeling sorrow. He'd stopped feeling grief. You wanted that win, Gabe. Don't tell me you didn't. Yeah, I wanted it. I won't tell you I didn't. Are you going to tell me you wouldn't have looked the other way if you'd known? 
Gabe's eyes flashed up. No, it wasn't sorrow in them, and it was a long way from grief. If you thought that, why did you hide it from me? You were a wild card, that's how Rich put it. You were a wild card, and you couldn't be trusted. Look how that colt ran, Gabe, he said, desperate. Think about that. He took the three jewels, and nothing could stop him. At what cost? It's not just a dead horse, Jamie. It's Mick, and it's Reno. Jameson's eyes filled, swam with tears. That wasn't my doing. Jesus, God, Gabe, you can't believe that that was my doing. Lipsky went off on his own. I didn't even know about it until after. Then it was too late. His voice broke. For a moment there was only the sound of his labored breathing. With an effort, he pulled himself back. Rich wanted to give you something to think about, but he didn't tell me until after. I didn't know he was going to go after Double Gabe. God is my witness. It was to be the Three Willows Colt, a scandal, a disqualification. He shuddered, waiting for Gabe to speak, veering closer to the edge where there was only silence. You've got to figure that Rich and Cunningham worked it out, Gabe. You've got to figure it. That's right. I've got to figure it. The disqualification wasn't enough for Rich. The money he got for fixing it wasn't enough. He's greedy, you know that. He used us to kill that colt. I suffered when that horse went down, when I knew what he'd had us do. And Reno. He buried his face in his hands. I cared about that boy. Afterward, I told him it wasn't his fault, but he wouldn't listen. It's Rich who's responsible for all of it. Then he comes around here and he changes the rules. How? Jameson dropped his hands, wiped the back of one over his mouth. He picked up the brandy again, drank it like medicine. He didn't want you to win the triple crown, Gabe. It was eating him inside out to think you could. He told me it was a job, just a little side bet he had going, but it was money he wanted. He had me, don't you see? He had me and Reno both. But I wasn't going to hurt double. You have to believe that. I got the drug myself this time. It was only going to be enough to eliminate him. Gabe's eyes narrowed down into points of flame. The night Kelsey came into the barn. It was you, wasn't it? You're the one who hurt her. I didn't do her any real harm. I just had to get out before she saw me. I got Kip out of the way. Didn't do more than give him a headache. Then when she came in, I couldn't finish. I just... I could break you in half for that alone, Jamie. Quick as a snake, Gabe's hand shot out, closed around Jameson's throat. For that alone, he murmured, squeezing. I panicked, Gabe. Terrified, Jameson clawed at Gabe's iron grip. Jesus, I was half out of my mind, can't you see? I see a lot of things. Disgusted, Gabe released him. The ugly mottled red began to fade from Jameson's face as he gulped in air. He had me trapped, don't you see? I told Rich I wouldn't do it, but he said if it wasn't done, we were going to pay. So I tried, even though it was breaking my heart, I tried. But it didn't work. Reno was supposed to do it the day of the Belmont, but he couldn't. Jesus, Gabe, he hung himself. Horse isn't worth dying for. But it's worth killing for? I told you I didn't. Tell yourself, Gabe spat out. Tell yourself you were a victim, Jamie that you were used, that what happened to Benny Morales and Mick and Reno and even to Lipsky was just the luck of the draw. Then see if you can live with it. He rose, kicking the chair aside. I did what I had to do, and I stood up to him. Just tonight I stood up to him. Gabe's head jerked up. What are you talking about? Rich was here, not an hour ago, drunk, mean. He was talking wild about killing the horses, burning the barn. Christ knows what he'd have done if I hadn't held him off. Gabe whirled and was bounding down the steps with Jamie shouting after him. He hit the lights in the barn, choking back fear as he systematically checked every box. I told you I didn't let him in here, Jameson said. I told him to get out, to go sleep it off, that we were finished. I wasn't doing his dirty work anymore, not after Reno, no matter what. Gabe stood outside Double's box. The colt sidled forward, nuzzled lazily at his hand. You're finished, Jamie. Pack up and get out tonight. A man's entitled to a place of his own. You should know that. Yeah, I know that. But yours isn't here. Not any more. Within twenty minutes, Gabe had roused three grooms and posted them in the barn. Until he ran his father to ground, there would be a twenty-four-hour watch. He'd be back, Gabe thought as he strode toward the house. 
the combination of greed and hate would draw him back. Nothing would satisfy Rich Slater except his son's total misery. What was most important, most cherished, had to be destroyed. But this time it would be different. This time... The blood drained out of Gabe's face as his own thoughts circled back in his head. What was most important, most cherished, Kelsey. Gertie tried out a new night cream she'd ordered from one of the shop-at-home channels, a guilty pleasure she sometimes indulged in on the kitchen television. The young and perky saleswoman on the screen had touted the cream as something akin to rebirth. Gertie didn't expect miracles, only a temporary reprieve from the lines that seemed to bloom on her face with increasing regularity. Vanity, she clucked at her mirrored reflection, foolish vanity for a woman who had lived on this earth for more than half a century. But when she looked closely, she thought maybe, just maybe, she could spot a slight softening around the eyes where the crow had dug his feet in the deepest. Satisfied with the new nightly ritual, she stood to remove her robe, then smiled when she heard the sound of the kitchen door creaking open. That boy would raid the refrigerator for sure, she thought, and likely leave a mess. Boys Channing's age never chased down crumbs. She'd just go along and fix him a plate herself, see that he washed it down with milk instead of that soda pop he was always guzzling. "'I hear you out there,' she said as she swung into the kitchen from her adjoining room. "'No use sneaking around. You just sit yourself down and I'll—' She stopped, frowning. In the glow of the range light she'd left on for Channing, the kitchen was quiet, spotless, and empty. "'Ears playing tricks on me,' she muttered. "'Maybe they'll start selling something for that on the TV.' She started to turn, then pain burst in her head. She managed one tiny bird-like cry as she crumpled to the tile. Rich stood over her, grinning. "'Kosh, the skinny old bitch with her own rolling pin,' he thought." "'and tapped the smooth, heavy marble against his palm. "'He towed at her side, lightly catching himself "'when the one-footed stance had him weaving. "'Need a little balance,' he decided, "'and reached into his back pocket for his flask. "'When no more than a few miserly drops hit his tongue, he swore. "'Stuffing the empty flask back into his pocket, "'he stepped over the unconscious Gertie. "'They were bound to have some liquor around here,' he thought. "'Prime stuff, too.' Once he'd fueled himself up, he'd hunt up Gabe's pretty little pigeon. Upstairs, Kelsey drank another cup of tea while she paced her room. She wished Channing would get home. At least then she'd be able to talk to someone. And who would understand better than he this horrible conflict of family loyalties? Even Gabe, for all his support, didn't share the same memories, the same affections and frustrations. Channing, when the trouble was real, was a rock. In the morning, in a few short hours, she would tell Naomi everything she'd learned. Once the story was told, Kelsey knew she would be freeing one woman she loved and condemning another. For under all the bitterness, the anger, and the painful disappointment, she still loved her grandmother. The magnificent Millicent, she thought, shutting her eyes. How would she survive the scandal, let alone the legal consequences, and there were bound to be consequences? And how, Kelsey asked herself, Would she be able to live with the fact that what she'd done and what she would do could send her own grandmother to prison? A tinkling crash of glass from downstairs had her biting back a gasp. Channing, she thought, setting down her cup. She hadn't heard him drive up, but he was obviously down there, fumbling through the dark in a very poor attempt not to wake the rest of the house. Relieved, Kelsey hurried out of her room and down the stairs to find him. Channing, you idiot! What did you break? If that was one of Naomi's crystal horses, there will be hell to pay. At the base of the stairs, she stopped, listening. The house was quiet now, quiet enough to run a chill up her arms. Stop it, she ordered herself, and rubbed them warm. Come on, Channing. I'm not in the mood to play games. I really need to talk to you. She snapped on the light in the foyer. Look, I know you're down here. Your cat-like grace always gives you away. It's important, Channing. Annoyed now, she marched into the sitting room. In the glow of moonlight, she saw the glint of shattered glass on the rug. Damn it! It was one of the horses. Nice going, Ace! She hurried over, kneeling down to pick up shards. All the queen's horses, Rich said, and switched on the lights. All the queen's men. He grinned down at Kelsey. 
but can the queen's lovely daughter put any of them back together again? He threw back his head and laughed at the sheer poetry of it. Chapter 29 Kelsey gasped in surprise and pain as her hand contracted around a sliver of glass. Blood welled on her palm. Careful there, honey pie, Rich sauntered over. You could slice yourself to ribbons. He tut-tutted over the cut on her hand, then gallantly offered her a handkerchief. Didn't mean to give you such a start, but I thought it was time we had ourselves a chat, seeing as you're warming my boy's bed most nights. You're Gabe's father. Kelsey scrambled to her feet, but not quickly enough. Rich's hand shot out, locked around her arm. There's family resemblance, isn't there? The ladies always said we made a handsome pair, me and my boy. His eyes, bright with liquor and anticipation, skimmed over her face. Why, you're even prettier close up, doll face. It didn't hard to see why my boy's been sniffing around you. No, indeedy, in hard at all. Here now, he stuffed the handkerchief into her bleeding hand. You wrap that up. She obeyed automatically. If you're looking for Gabe, she broke off, reevaluated quickly. He's upstairs, she said. I'll go up and tell him you're here. The one thing I never tolerated from a woman was a lie. With one flick, he shoved her into a chair hard enough to snap her head back. You'd better get that straight right now. He leaned over the chair, trapping her between his arms. Gabe's not upstairs now, is he? I saw him drop you off out of his fancy car just a little while ago. Don't know why he'd go home to a cold bed when he has something like you, but I always had a hard time teaching the boy anything. He patted her cheek, pleased with the swell of power when she cringed back. But this works out real cozy. Just you and me getting acquainted. Oops, what's this here? Chuckling, he pinched his fingers at her wrist, forced her hand up. That's a whopper now, isn't it? He said, eyeing her ring. Is that what I think it is? He wagged his finger in front of her face. Is my boy going to make an honest woman out of you, honey pie? Well, you're a real step up for most of the sluts he's snuggled with before. No offense. No, she said, hoping to play the game out. No offense taken. Gabe and I are going to be married in August. I hope he'll be there. She cried out in shock when the back of his hand swiped across her face. His genial expression never altered. Now, what did I tell you about lying? What you and that boy of mine would like is for me to drop dead on the spot, wouldn't you? She blinked to clear her vision. I don't know you, she said carefully, but she knew enough to be afraid, and her trembling gave her away. You know me. I'll give you odds my loving sons told you all about me. Your mama, too. The thought of Naomi soured his grin. She'd have something to say about good old Rich later. Kelsey anchored her chin to keep it from trembling. I'm sorry, she's never mentioned you. His smile thinned. Bitch, always was a bitch. You take right after her. In some ways, you're hurting me, Mr. Slater. Rich, honey. Or better yet, you call me daddy, since we're going to be family. The idea of it had him hooting with laughter until tears filled his eyes. One big happy family. I'll bet that old icicle's fuming over that. Did I mention I know your grandma? I know her real well. She must be foaming at the mouth at the idea of her hoity-toity granddaughter playing house with a son of mine. She hated your mama, you know. Hated her right down to the ground. I know. You know what I think? He reached up, pinched Kelsey's throbbing cheek hard enough to make her gasp. I think you should fix us both a nice drink. Then we'll get to know each other. All right. When he stepped back, Kelsey eased out of the chair. Her eyes darted to the patio doors, to the doorway that led to the foyer. If she could get out of the room, she was sure she could outrun him. You don't want to try that, honey? He pinched her arm again, his fingers digging down to the bone. You don't want to. There's brandy in the cabinet there, Napoleon. Well, that's just fine and dandy. He kept his hand on her arm and dragged her to it. Pour us both a couple of healthy swallows. He was already drunk, she thought frantically. If she poured with a generous enough hand, she might slip past his guard. Gabe said you'd done a lot of traveling. 
I've been here and there. I like new places. She smiled and handed him a snifter. Cheers! She tapped her glass to his. You're a cool one. Rich tossed back the brandy, then let out a long, pleased sigh. That's one of the things that appealed to me most about your mother. She was one long, cool drink of water, that Naomi. She would never give me a sip, though. Let plenty of others drink great big gulps, but she never let good old Rich have one little sip. Maybe she will now. I bet I can make her change her mind. Is she upstairs? She's not home. Before the words were out, Kelsey was reeling back. The blow had stars bursting in front of her eyes as she fell. Lying bitch. With a thin smile, Rich drank more brandy. Cold eye, lying bitch, just like your ma. Maybe you'd rather had a taste of you instead. He laughed until his sides ached at the expression of animal terror on her face. No, 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 I wouldn't be proper poking in where my boy's already been. Besides, I prefer a more mature woman. And Naomi, she's been around the track a time or two now, hasn't she? Now, maybe if your grandma had hired me instead of the coke-snorting Bradley, things would be different. Why don't we go ask Naomi if she'd like to give Rich a try now? Stay away from her. Her head spun sickeningly as she lurched to her feet. Her vision was blurred where the blow had struck her eye. I'll kill you if you touch her. Yeah, just like your ma. Kill a man for doing what comes natural. We know all about you. Dizzy, she leaned against the cabinet. She just needed a minute, she told herself, to clear the pain from her head, to get some feeling back in her watery legs. Gabe's not here because he went for the police. They'll be here any minute. She teetered back, nearly falling when he lifted his hand again. You want to tell the truth to me, honey pie, or I'm going to spoil that pretty face of yours. It is the truth. We met Charles Rooney tonight. He called after you came to his office. He told us everything. Praying for time, she began to list the details. He believed her now. She could see it in his face. And what she saw there told her he could do worse, a great deal worse than slap her again. They'll find you here if you stay, she continued. They'll find you and they'll put you in prison, the way they put my mother in prison. You could probably still get away. They might not catch you if you ran. They've got nothing on me, nothing. He took her untouched brandy and drank it down. It's all air, and you're forgetting Grandma. No, I'm not. They put my mother away with lies. It'll be easy to put you away with the truth. He'd turn me in. Enraged, Rich tossed the snifter, shattering the glass on the hearth in a parody of celebration. My own flesh and blood would turn me in. We'll have to make him sorry for that real sorry. He lunged. Panic and youth had Kelsey spinning to the side so that he caught nothing more than the sleeve of her blouse. As the seam ripped, she tore away, making a dash for the doorway. He caught her, bringing her down in a lumbering tackle that radiated pain down to the bone. Panting out sobs, she kicked out blindly, landing a glancing blow off his shoulder, another off his chest as she clawed her way inch by desperate inch over the rug. He was going to kill her now, she was sure of it, beat her or choke her with those big, bruising hands, and when he was done, he'd go after Naomi. She screamed once when he yanked her head back by the hair. Light flashed in front of her eyes, wheeled like comets fired by hideous pain. If she had found her voice, she might have begged then, pleaded and begged, but the air was searing in and out of her throat. Gotcha, don't I? Gotcha. Thought you were such a smart little bitch. Her fingers dug into the carpet, reached, then closed over an inch-long shard of crystal. Mindless with terror and pain, she swung out. Then it was he who screamed, rearing back, the blood spurting out of his cheek where the delicate foreleg of the glass thoroughbred had pierced his flesh. Whimpering, she dragged herself up and raced from the room in a panicked, limping run while his curses chased after her. She fell on the stairs, fighting for breath, struggling to clear enough of the fear from her mind so she could think. When she called out, trying to warn her mother, only little mewling sounds escaped. With blood and fear stinging her mouth, she clawed her way up, gaining her feet and the top of the stairs, just as she heard Rich charging up behind her. No! She snatched a vase of lilies and hurled it down at him. 
The crash and a grunt of pain brought her a few precious seconds, wasted as she fumbled with bloody hands at the knob of her mother's bedroom door. Mom! Oh, God, Mom! With one blind burst of strength, she shoved through the door and slammed it behind her. Mom, get up! She was weeping as she fought the lock with fingers gone numb with terror. For God's sake, get up! In a lunge, she was at the bed, dragging Naomi up by the shoulders, shaking, pleading. What? Groggy from the sleeping pill, Naomi pushed her daughter's hand away, annoyed. What is it? He's coming! Wake up! We have to get out! Do you understand me? Who's coming? Naomi blinked open heavy eyes. Kelsey, what is it? He'll kill us! Get out of bed, goddammit! She screamed again when Rich hurled his weight against the door. Get out of bed! Breath coming in hot gasps, she turned terrified eyes to the door. It's not going to hold. Sweet Jesus, it won't hold! The gun! Do you still have the gun? She babbled out little prayers as she clawed open the nightstand drawer. It was there, the chrome glinting in the moonlight. What are you doing? Sleepy and dazed, Naomi managed to fight her way through the mists to kneel in bed. Good God, Kelsey, what are you doing? Who's at the door? But as the wood splintered, Kelsey stared straight ahead. She held the gun in both hands, struggling to keep it from slipping out of her shaking fingers. He burst in, blood glistening on his cheek, and saw only Naomi kneeling in the bed with a thin silk gown sliding from her shoulders. His teeth flashed as he leaped forward. Kelsey felt the gun buck like a live thing, sending vibrations singing up to her shoulders. She never heard the shot. Alec? The wooziness floated over Naomi's mind, sliding images of past and present. It's not Alec. Kelsey heard her own voice, small with distance. It's Gabe's father. I've killed Gabe's father. Slater? Half dreaming, Naomi crawled out of bed, and as she had done so many years ago, bent over a dead man. Mechanically, she checked his pulse before straightening again. Rich Slater? Confused, she rubbed her hands over her eyes. What in God's name is happening here? I killed him. Kelsey dropped her arm, the gun dangling from her fingers. Naomi looked up into her daughter's face. She recognized the shock, the disbelief, and the fear. She forced her trembling legs to move forward. Sit down, Kelsey. That's right, sit down. She eased her gently onto the side of the bed. Nothing mattered now, nothing but Kelsey. Let me have the gun. Okay. Naomi set it aside for the moment. It would take no time at all to deal with it. Put your head between your legs now and breathe. I can't. I can't breathe. Yes, you can. Slow and deep. That's it, honey. As Kelsey tried to obey, Naomi outlined her plan. Now, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do, and I want you to listen very carefully and do exactly, just exactly what I tell you. Understand? He was going to kill me. And you. He would have killed us both. But I killed him. I don't remember pulling the trigger, but I must have. Her teeth began to chatter. Because I shot him. No. I shot him. Look at me, Kelsey. Gently, Naomi lifted Kelsey's ravaged face. Oh, God. She shuddered dug her nails into her palms until the pain cleared some of the shock. Listen to me, baby. He broke in, and he... She brushed at a cut on Kelsey's cheek. And he hurt you. So I got the gun, and I shot him. No, that's wrong. I couldn't wake you up. No, no, honey. I woke up when you came in. You came in here to get away from him. Then he broke down the door, and I shot him. I'm going to call the police now... And that's exactly what we're going to tell them. I don't... Kelsey lifted a hand to her spinning head. I don't... She jerked around and screamed at the sound of feet pounding up the stairs. Jesus, God! Gabe took one look at his father, then stared at the two women huddled on the bed. Kelsey! In one leap, he was crouched in front of her, holding her wounded hands. He hurt you. Look at your face! He jumped up, his eyes hard, deadly. I'll kill him myself. I already have, Naomi said calmly. Gabe, get her out of here. Take her to her room. I'll call the police. I'm all right, Kelsey insisted, but the room faded out as she pushed herself to her feet. 
You just need to lie down. Gabe picked her up. I'll take care of you. He looked back at Naomi. I'll take care of her. Make her stay in there until I finish this. Naomi lifted the bedside phone. He was just there, Kelsey murmured, shivering as Gabe carried her to her room and laid her on the bed. He was just there. He broke the horse. Just lie still. He wanted to hold her. He wanted to crush something, someone into dust. Instead, he whipped the bedspread over her. She was shaking badly, her pupils contracted to pinpoints with shock, and her face. Gabe's hands balled helplessly at his sides. Her face was bruised and bleeding. He couldn't think. Just then, he couldn't allow himself to think that his own father had done that to her. He went quickly into the bathroom, dampened a washcloth, and filled a cup with water. Here, baby. Gently, he curved an arm under her and brought the cup to her lips. Drink some of this. He was downstairs. Her fingers fretted at the bedspread. It wasn't Channing. The little horse was shattered, and he was just there. He kept smiling. He kept hitting me and smiling. The hand on the wet cloth clenched until the knuckles went white. He won't hurt you any more. With fingers no more steady than hers, he washed away the blood. Hold on to me, Kelsey. No one's going to hurt you any more. I couldn't bluff. Shivering, she curled against him. She was cold, so cold, and he held the heat. I tried, but I was so scared and so angry. And he knew, and he'd hit me again. She turned her battered face into Gabe's throat. He has such big hands. And preferred to use them, Gabe thought grimly, on women. I'd have killed him for this, he murmured. Killed him with my own hands for touching you. It wasn't me. Suddenly she was so tired, so horribly, horribly tired. It was you. He wanted to hurt you. I know. He turned his head just enough to brush his lips over her brow. Then he eased her back on the pillows. It's over now. She let her eyes close for a moment. As the worst of the shock ebbed, the pain crept back. Her body felt trampled. You came. Blindly she groped for his hand, found it. Yeah. He looked down at their joined hands. A hunch. The trouble was, I moved on it too late. Her eyes opened again, fresh panic flashing. Naomi! She's fine. If you'd been alone. The thought of that had talons of fear clawing through his gut. Kelsey, I'm going to give you an out right now. An out? Though she wasn't sure she would like what she found, she lifted a hand to probe at her throbbing face. If I were fair, I'd do the walking. Walking? The heavy fog was lifting. She could see him clearly now, the strain that tightened his face, the swirl of emotion in his eyes. Gabe. She touched a hand to his cheek as if to brush some color and calm into it. Don't. I'm all right now. He battered your face. He tore your clothes. He terrified you. Deliberately, he pried her clutching hand from his and rose. He was my father. It doesn't matter that I've worked all my life to rid myself of any part of him. It's blood, and it'll always be there. I've got no place in your life, Kelsey. The biggest favor I could do for you is to walk out of it. With some effort, she pushed herself up. Pain was singing in every bone now. Did I ask you for a damn favor? She snapped out. She winced as the scream of sirens sliced through the night and into her throbbing head. If you want to do me one, then get me a bottle of aspirin and keep your ridiculous grand gestures to yourself. He nearly smiled. I'm trying to be noble. Well, you're no good at it, and I don't like noble. I like you. She brushed her hair back, eyed him narrowly. Do you think you can sneak out of this when I'm down? We had a deal, Slater, and you're not going to Welsh. I never Welsh. He sat on the edge of the bed again and placed his hands lightly on her shoulders. And that's my last shot at nobility. A hell of a hero I make anyway. It should have been me who killed him, Kelsey. She crossed a hand over her body to clasp his. Don't. You couldn't know that he would be here, that he would do this. And still you came. Her brow furrowed. Why did you come? It doesn't matter now. But it should have been me. It should have been me and not Naomi who killed him. Kelsey drew back, her face paling again. 
"'It wasn't you,' she said slowly. "'And it wasn't Naomi. "'I killed your father, Gabe.' "'Naomi sipped the brandy slowly. "'She was sitting in the kitchen. "'The lights were very bright and hurt her eyes. "'Her hands were trembling. "'But she could deal with it, would deal with it. "'All she could think was that her daughter was upstairs, "'hurt, terrorized. "'And Gertie, sweet Gertie, "'was in an ambulance on her way to the hospital. "'He must have come in this way,' she said. "'Hit Gertie. "'She'll be all right, won't she?' Control slipped a notch, and her lips trembled. She's so small, and she's so harmless. The paramedic said she was lucid, Ms. Chadwick. Rossi kept his voice low. The woman looked as though she would shatter into bits at any moment. We'll check on her once they've had time to get her to the hospital. Moses should have gone with her. I should have made him go. He's not going to leave you. We're having a hard enough time keeping him outside. Just tell me what happened. Naomi drew in a deep breath and began. He got in the house. I don't know how. I was upstairs in bed, sleeping. A noise woke me. Before I could get up, Kelsey ran into my room. She was terrified, hysterical. Her face. I could see where he'd hit her. She pressed a hand to her mouth. She'd slept through that. Slept while he'd beaten her child. Then there was a banging at the bedroom door as if someone were throwing himself against it. I got the gun out of the drawer beside the bed. When he broke in, I shot him. Rossi watched her as she lifted her glass, cupping her other hand over it to try to keep it steady as she drank. You were in bed when you shot him, Miss Jadwick? Yes. No. She set the glass down. She had to be careful. She had to be very careful. I was in front of the window. I'd gotten up. It happened very fast. You say a noise woke you, but your daughter ran in before you could get up and see what it was? Yes. Why did they always repeat what she said? They'd done that before, she remembered. It didn't matter what she said. It never mattered. Have you been into the sitting room, Ms. Chadwick, since you notified the police? No. She pressed her lips together. If it was a trick, she couldn't see it. I didn't come down. I stayed upstairs until you came. You've got a hell of a mess in there. Blood, broken furniture. I'd say that much damage took some time to accomplish. Time enough for anyone to get out of bed and check things out. I... I was frightened. Should she tell him she'd taken a sleeping pill? Yes? No? I stayed in my room because I was frightened. With a phone right beside you and a gun in the drawer? She looked up, met his eyes. He broke into my bedroom, she said evenly, and I shot him. No, she didn't. Kelsey stepped into the kitchen. Though she was grateful for the support of Gabe's arm, she made herself move away from it. She didn't kill anyone. You shouldn't be down here. Panicked, Naomi pushed away from the table. Take her back upstairs, Gabe. You can see she's hurt. She clamped a desperate hand on Rossi's arm. You can see she's hurt. Look what that bastard did to her. Look what he did to my child. She's in shock. She doesn't know what happened. Stop it. Kelsey stepped up to the table. In the strong light, her cuts and bruises stood out in stark relief against her pale skin. I'm not going to let you do this. It isn't necessary, and it isn't right. Why don't you sit down, Miss Biden, Rossi invited, and tell me what happened. No! In a lunge, Naomi rounded the table and gripped Kelsey's arms. Listen to me, Kelsey. You're hurt. You're confused. Gabe will take you to the hospital, and I'll handle this. No! She shook her head, moving in to draw Naomi close. Mom, no. I'm not going to let you go through this. I won't. Trembling now, she hugged Kelsey tight. You don't know what it's like. It won't matter what you say. It won't matter what happened. They'll take you away. Kelsey, please, please listen to me. It does matter, Kelsey murmured. It's not like before. But it was, Naomi thought. Of course it was. My fingerprints are on the gun. Stone-faced, Naomi turned back to Rossi. The gun was in my room. He was killed in my room. That should be enough for you. Naomi, Gabe said gently, sit down. You said you'd take care of her, she turned to him. You said you would. Now make her go upstairs. Ms. Chadwick, 
Rossi studied her eyes. There's a very simple test that will prove whether it was you or your daughter who discharged the weapon. I don't give a damn about your test. You're not putting my daughter in a cell. I think we can agree on that. Sit down, please, Rossi added. Come on. Kelsey draped an arm over Naomi's shoulders. There's nothing for you to worry about, I promise. Would you like some brandy, Miss Biden? Rossi asked when she was settled at the table. Kelsey looked down at the snifter and shuddered. No, I've lost my taste for it. She drew a deep breath. I heard glass breaking downstairs, she began. Chapter 30 There was dew sparkling on the grass. From her chair on the patio, Kelsey watched it gleam, knowing the sun would soon be strong enough to burn it away. Down at the barn, horses were being worked, stalls cleaned, troughs filled. Her body still ached enough to prevent her from resenting the fact that she'd been banned from the routine for a week. She glanced around as the door opened behind her, and she smiled at her mother. Gertie? She's feeling better. She's fussing. With a sigh, Naomi sat, stretched out her legs. She thought about pouring coffee from the pot Kelsey had on the table, but she felt entirely too lazy. I'm using guilt to keep her in bed for another day or two. If she gets up, I'll worry. Sneaky. Whatever works. Right now, she's buying out the shopping channels. How are you feeling? I'm fine until I look in the mirror, she grimaced. Over the last two days, some of the bruises had faded, but others had blossomed. Until I do, it all seems almost like a dream. I don't know if it's just a stage I'm stuck in. I know I killed a man, but I can't seem to feel the horror of it. Don't try. You did what you had to do to protect yourself and me. Naomi lifted her face to the sun. I don't even remember him, Kelsey. Not really. I suppose I saw him around the track now and then, maybe even spoke to him. But I don't really remember. I keep thinking I should, that it all should be vivid in my mind. How can I not remember a man who had so much to do with the way my life turned out? He never mattered to you, and he knew it. That was part of the anger that built up in him. He found a way to make you pay and to make a profit. She pushed the plate of croissants toward Naomi. Sunspot, Naomi murmured. God, I loved that horse. Yes, he certainly made me pay. She, grandmother, used Alec Bradley for that, for a lot of things. And Cunningham. Bill. On a long breath, Naomi shook her head. He's so much more of a fool than I guessed. And what good did it do him, Kelsey, then or now? He didn't pay before, but he'll pay now. The police, the racing commission, they'll see that Cunningham pays for what he did to Pride and to Sunspot. All those years ago, no one ever put it together. It might have ended there, with the lies and the misery, if Gabe hadn't come back. If he hadn't drawn an inside straight, she smiled as Naomi tore off a corner of a roll. If he hadn't made himself into the man he is. And if you hadn't fallen in love with him, that's something that smooths away the worst of it, Kelsey. When I think of what could have happened, it didn't. Rich Slater paid the price for his part in it, and the case is closed. Self-defense. I suppose it was foolish of me to lie to the police. She tossed the bite of roll aside. He didn't believe me. It's ironic, isn't it? Once I told the truth, once I lied. Neither worked. You were trying to protect me. It was time to say it, Kelsey told herself, and she hoped the full meaning would be understood. You tried to protect me before, when I was a child. You were wrong both times, and you were right both times. No easy answers. It's taken me a long time to realize there isn't always only one. She pressed her lips together before continuing. I'm grateful for what you're doing for Millicent. No, please don't stiffen up on me. I'm grateful even though I can't resolve it in my heart, even though it's a lie. I'm grateful. What difference would it make now, Kelsey, to have the whole story come out and destroy what's left of her life? The birds were singing and the sound was comforting. It wouldn't give me back those years. It wouldn't change what happened to Mick, to Pride, to Reno. She's responsible for that, for all of it. Shame and bitterness warred inside Kelsey. No matter that she couldn't have meant anyone to die, she's responsible. 
hiring other people to do what she considered necessary to protect the family name? What name does she have now? Kelsey demanded. What honor? And that's what she has to live with. I don't do this for her. I know. Naomi lifted a brow. It's not entirely unselfish, either. I don't want to go through it, to live through the press, the police. And I have the gift of knowing you believed me. You believed in me enough to stick. I wasn't the only one who believed you. And everyone would know what happened with Alec Bradley, what happened with Pride, and all the rest if the story came out. I don't care about everyone. Naomi decided she'd pour coffee after all. I talked it over with Moses last night, and we agreed. She smiled, adding cream to her coffee. When a woman has a man who will stand by her through the worst, the rest is easy. Naomi glanced over at the sound of a car pulling into the drive. That's probably Gabe. It better be. We were supposed to go over these menus for the reception over breakfast. Then I'd better leave you two alone to do it. No, why don't you stay? That way you can agree with what I've already decided and give me the edge. Kelsey leaned forward, took her mother's hand. I love you. Emotions swirled up, then settled beautifully. I know. Kelsey rose and started across the patio to greet him. Her eyes widened as they shifted from Gabe's to her father's, then back again. Dad? Oh, Kelsey. Instinctively, Philip framed her face with his hands. Nothing Gabe had told him had prepared him. Oh, sweetheart. I'm all right, really. It looks much worse than it is. I was going to come see you in a couple of days. When she looked more presentable, she thought, and shot Gabe a telling look. Your young man was right to tell me the whole story. The whole story, he repeated, staring into her eyes. You left out a great many details when you phoned me, Kelsey. Another kind of lie, she thought, the sin of omission. I thought it best. I only wanted you to know I was all right before the papers reported it, and I am all right. So I'm told. He looked back at Gabe, then his gaze shifted, locked over Kelsey's shoulder. She moved aside and stood between her parents. Dad wanted to see that I was all right, she began. Of course he did. Naomi nodded and kept her hands at her sides. Hello, Philip. Naomi, you look well. So do you. Ah, uh, Kelsey groped for some way to ease past the awkwardness. Channing's down at the barn. Why don't you walk down with me, Dad? You'll get a kick out of seeing him work, and he can show off for you. She looked helplessly at Gabe. I'm sure you'd like to talk with Kelsey, Naomi said. I was just on my way down to the barn myself. I'll tell Channing you're here. No, I... Philip began, then composed himself. Actually, I'd like to speak with you, if you have the time. All right. Let's take a walk, Gabe murmured and grasped Kelsey's hand. I don't know where to begin, Naomi. Gabe told me everything. Everything, Philip repeated, heartsick. He was kind enough to wait for me when I went to see her. I had to see her, he added, before I came here. I understand. Understand. Unbearably weary, he slipped his fingers under his glasses and pressed them to his eyes. I can't, I can't understand. All that she did, all the pain she caused. And when I confronted her, she was unbending. Unshakable, he said, and dropped his hands. She sees nothing that she did as anything but necessary. Men died, but she feels no responsibility. Not to them, not to you. And that surprises you. He winced. She remains my mother, Naomi, even knowing all I know. I've thought of hundreds of ways to try to apologize, and none of them begins to cover it. What she did, what I did. He took off his glasses, rubbed his eyes again, then replaced them. And the simple fact is, I don't know what to say to you. It's over, Philip. I let you down. All those years ago, I let you down. No, there was a time I thought that. It helped, but it wasn't really true. I wasn't what you wanted me to be. Whatever she's done, Millicent wasn't responsible for that, only for making sure you realized it. She could have prevented you from going to prison. Yes, and what she did now, to you, to Kelsey. His breath caught as the image of his daughter's bruised face swam into his mind. 
My God, Naomi, she might have been killed. She protected herself and me. She studied him, the pain in his eyes, the baffled disbelief behind it. I can't tell you not to feel what you're feeling now. Kelsey was hurt, was forced to defend herself by taking a life, and you and I will never forget it. We'll never forget who started the chain of events. Maybe, she said slowly, that's enough punishment for Millicent. There's nothing I can do. Philip's voice faltered, broke. Nothing I can do to make up for it. There's nothing you have to do. Despite everything, Kelsey has what she wants. And so do I. Her lips curved softly. I have everything I want. The farm, a man who loves me, my daughter. You did a wonderful job with her, Philip. I always knew you would. She's so like you. He studied the woman who had been his wife. So much had changed and so little. Good God, Naomi, if I could go back, do something, anything. You can't. He'd always been so fair, she thought, so honorable. Now he suffered because no amount of fairness, no amount of honor could wipe away the pain. We wanted things from each other that neither of us could give, and we made mistakes, mistakes we used against each other, and that other people used against us. We were both victims of someone else's needs, Philip. You paid dearly for it. I've gained, too. She loves me. It's just that simple. Just that marvelous. So let's leave the rest where it belongs. Closed. She drew a breath. You know, I always wondered how I'd feel if I saw you again. I wondered, too. How do you feel, Naomi? I'm glad to see you, Philip. Do you think we should leave them alone for so long? Yes, I do. To prove it, Gabe gave her a helpful nudge. They have old business to settle. But, Kelsey looked back over her shoulder. They were still standing, yards apart. He looked so sad. His world's been shaken badly. It'll settle again. Maybe not quite in the same way, but it'll settle. Candace won't let him brood for long. Still, she dragged her feet. Gabe, what made you bring him here? We're closing the circle, he said, before we start our own. I like the sound of that. She tipped her head toward his shoulder. You're awfully smart, Slater, and sneaky, too, going behind my back to bring him here. Going to see him was my idea. Coming here was his. He needs to make his peace with Naomi. He will, she smiled to herself. It was, after all, her personal fairy tale. I love it here, she murmured. I love everything about here. Think of the champions we'll make, Gabe. Are we talking horses? She shook her head and laughed up at him. Not only horses. Is that okay with you? That's just fine with me. He walked her away from the barn, from the crews, toward the rising hills where mares grazed with their foals and horses raced their shadows. Next spring a foal will be born. His dam from Three Willows, his sire from Longshot. He turned her into his arms. I'll remember the day he was conceived, how I looked at you and wanted you to belong to me. And I do. She linked her arms around his neck. So what's next? We got a fresh deck. He tapped his pocket. Anything can happen. Anything? Well, she drew his mouth down to hers. Deal them.